Uh, good morning, everyone. I am Councilmember Corey Johnson, Speaker of the New York City Council, and I'd start off by thanking my colleagues, uh, Council Members uh, Levine, the Chair of our Health Committee, Council Member Cornegie, who is on his way here, and Council Member, uh, and he's Chair of our Housing and Buildings Committee, Council Member Constantinides, the Chair of our Environmental Protection Committee, for agreeing to hold this very important joint hearing. Today, we'll hear from uh, key city agencies and advocates about the enforcement of the city's existing lead laws. We'll also be considering a package of 25 bills aimed at updating existing laws and protecting children from exposure to various sources of lead. Although New York City banned the use of lead-based paint in residential buildings almost 60 years ago, last year, 4,261 New York City children under the age of six years old, the vast majority of them whom live in privately owned housing, tested positive for elevated blood lead levels. And since 2012, 1,160 children in NYCHA apartments, New York City Housing Authority apartments, children whose families trusted the city to provide safe public housing have tested positive for lead poisoning. That is a lot of children, it's a lot of families impacted, and to me, these numbers are deeply, deeply disturbing. The science on the dangers of lead exposure is clear. Even small amounts of lead can cause serious health problems and can severely impact mental and physical development. Children under six years old are especially vulnerable to lead poisoning because they are growing rapidly and explore the world with hand-to-mouth activity. Any lead in a child's developing brain and nervous system may result in devastating learning and behavioral struggles that could last a lifetime. What's important to understand here is we're talking about a lifetime of struggling that is entirely preventable. This isn't like other childhood diseases that we have no control over. Lead poisoning doesn't have to happen, and yet it is by the thousands in our city. New York City has been a leader in the fight against childhood lead exposure, specifically the Childhood Lead Poisoning Prevention Act enacted in 2004 sought to reduce the likelihood of childhood lead exposure with a particular focus on identifying and remediating lead-based paint hazards in apartment and daycare facilities. This law set a goal of eliminating childhood lead poisoning by the year 2010. Obviously, that goal has not been met. But the city did reduce the number of children under six years old who tested positive for dangerous blood lead levels by 89%. That is great, but we cannot stop there. Over 4,000 kids have elevated levels of lead in their blood in 2017, seven years after we were supposed to be at zero. The vast majority of those children were children of color, and how have we let them down? Here is what we know. Agencies charged with ensuring the elimination of lead's hazards didn't finish the job. To our understanding, HPD didn't keep track of violations. NYCHA provided hazardous living conditions to residents in need, and the health department <clears throat> was not able to investigate thousands of children with dangerous blood lead levels in both public and private housing. I'm guessing today that we'll hear a lot about the 89% reduction in the number of children under six years old with dangerous blood lead levels. That is good, very good, but we haven't finished the job. Even one child whose potential is ruined is a tragedy. Even worse, this is a preventable tragedy. And all of us here today are the ones who can prevent it. This is a big package of bills, but it basically boils down to two things. One, we must ensure that our existing lead laws are adequately and forcefully enforced. That is why we'll hear testimony today from city agencies charged with enforcing the city's lead laws as well as members of the real estate industry, health and tenant advocates, and other interested members of the public regarding the city's enforcement of the current lead laws and regulations. 
Two, we must identify areas where additional legislation is necessary to ensure children are protected from exposure to lead. There are gaps in the existing laws and we must fill them. Our goal is to ensure that the city follows standards and practices in line with the most recent research on preventing, identifying, and treating childhood lead exposure. For example, introduction 865, which I'm proud to sponsor, would reduce the city's blood lead reference level to match the Center for Disease Control's reference level of five micrograms per deciliter, meaning that the city will intervene at what the CDC has determined to be the lowest level of lead in the body that could be harmful to a child. Moreover, should CDC research and recommendations result in a lower reference level in the future, this legislation would ensure that the city's reference level matches the CDC reference level. Another bill I'm sponsoring, the introduction 864, would require the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene to conduct a building-wide inspection for lead hazards when a children under six years old with elevated blood lead levels resides in an apartment supplied with drinking or cooking water found to have elevated lead levels or where a lead-based paint hazard exists. We've all been alarmed by recent reports of elevated lead levels in certain school drinking water taps or reports of elevated lead levels in soil in certain areas of the city. Because of this, and to meet our goal of eradicating lead poisoning that we set forth nearly 15 years ago, the package of bills we are hearing today addresses the elimination of all sources of lead. I want to thank many in the advocate community for being here today and for working with us uh, in preparation for this hearing. Your work has been instrumental in the passage of our current lead laws and your insight into the need to more aggressively enforce our existing lead laws has been invaluable. This problem did not happen overnight. It predates this administration, but I hope that every one of us will take responsibility to work together to ensure that all children in New York City grow up in an environment free from the hazards of lead exposure so that our young people can maximize their potential in life. Before I, uh, of course, hand it over, I, I, I want to um, just reiterate a few things. Uh, number one, um, I think uh, maybe all of the folks here were not uh, serving in their current positions uh, in 2004 or even in 2010. And I actually think all the folks here are deeply committed, dedicated public servants for our city. So I want to say that up front. But I just have to say, uh, I feel, I mean, I was elected to the city council in 2013. I, I feel like this is a failure of government. This is a tragedy. 4,200 tragedies last year. And I don't know what the potential cost would be to do all the things that we're proposing today. We will work on that over the coming months when we negotiate this package of bills. But the cost to these families, the cost to these children, the cost for the rest of their lives, we have to do a better job as a city. We need to be relentless in our enforcement. We need to ensure that any child that is potentially exposed to lead-based hazards that it gets remediated immediately, and that if a landlord or the city of New York through NYCHA is not doing its job, that we have a plan to fix it, come down swiftly, aggressively, and vigorously to ensure that no child is exposed. The more I learned about this in preparation for this hearing, the more that I dug into the specifics, even while seeing an 89% reduction over the years. I am heartbroken and in many ways to understand the number of lives that have potentially been gravely affected before they're six years old 
So I look forward to hearing from you today. I look forward to asking you a lot of questions about what we must be doing so that we're not sitting here 14 years from now asking the same questions. So thank you very much. And I want to turn it over uh, first to Councilmember Levine. Chair Levine, of our, the chair of our health committee. All right. Thank you, Speaker Johnson, for your leadership on this issue and making sure that council is focused on this crisis. I want to read language which uh, the speaker referenced, one line out of the legislation this body passed in 2004. Um, this was a bill passed and signed into law by the mayor at the time. It said, the council finds that these blood levels among New York City children constitute a severe health crisis and has established as its goal the elimination, elimination of childhood lead poisoning by 2010, by 2010. That is a goal enshrined in law. That is a goal we have failed to meet. That failure does not affect all children equally in the city. It predominantly affects low-income children, children of color, living in substandard housing. And this failure has serious and life-lasting health implications. There is no safe level of blood, of lead in the blood. There is no safe level of lead in the blood. Lead poisoning affects childhood development, it affects the brain, it can have impacts on academic performance, on job prospects, on emotional well-being, and these can be life-lasting and life-altering. And this failure is the result of a breakdown on systems on many fronts. We have failed to keep up with evolving national standards. We have failed to get every child in the city tested for blood poisoning. We have failed to adequately enforce existing laws with landlords rarely facing penalties for not performing legally mandated inspections. We have failed to adequately focus on pregnant women. We have failed to consistently invest, investigate sources of lead poisoning outside the home of affected children in parks and playgrounds and daycare centers where children spend time. So now, eight years after the date by which we had promised to solve this, we have to take dramatic action. And that is what we're doing today by proposing this sweeping package of legislation that will once again put New York City at the forefront nationally at combating this scourge. We'll be considering bills today that establish more rigorous standards for testing, that expand the scope of investigation when a child is determined to have poisoning, that require third-party testing beyond that done by landlords, that put more focus on the risk faced to pregnant women, bills that seek to get more young children checked for lead so no child falls through the cracks, and more. We'll be hearing today from a wide array of voices, the administration, health experts, building owners, tenant advocates, and others, all with the goal of finally eliminating, once and for all, the hazard of lead exposure for children in this city, the goal of finally living up to a promise we have made and broken. Thank you again, Mr. Speaker, and I'll pass it back to you. Thank you, uh, Chair Levine. I want to hand it over to uh, Chair Cornegie of our Housing and Buildings Committee. Thank you, Speaker Johnson. Uh, good morning. Uh, as mentioned, I'm the Council Member Robert Cornegie, Chair of the Committee on Housing and Buildings, and, uh, and uh, this is a very important hearing, obviously. I want to thank the Speaker for joining us today as well and for his support and attention to this critical issue. I want to thank Council Member Costa Contantanides, Chair of the Committee on Environmental Protection, and Council Member Mark Levine, Chair of the Committee on Health, for agreeing to hold this joint hearing. Today we'll hear testimony from the various city agencies charged with enforcing the city's laws and members of the real estate industry, tenant advocates, and other interested members of the public regarding the city's enforcement of current lead laws and regulations. We'll also hear testimony regarding 25 bills, which seek to, among other things, align the city's lead laws with best practices for testing, identify additional children and other vulnerable populations with elevated blood lead levels for treatment, and reduce circumstances under which children are exposed to lead in the city. 
For example, intro 877 is relation, in relation to agency referrals for blood lead screenings, which I sponsored, will require city agencies to provide services for or related to a child under seven years old to make reasonable efforts to obtain evidence from a parent or legal guardian that the child has received a blood level screening. If the agency is unable to attain any evidence of a screening, it would be required to request additional information from the parent or legal guardian to help the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene determine why the child hasn't received a blood level, blood lead screening. Two, it will provide information to the parent or legal guardian explaining the importance of blood level screening, blood lead level screening for children, and three, refer them to a physician or healthcare provider for blood lead screening. While I appreciate the progress we've made as a city in reducing the threat of lead to our children, I cannot help but think of those families whose children are, whose children are afflicted with lead poisoning. As the father of six children is not enough for me and for us and the rest of our, to rest on our laurels and be happy having minimized the threat of lead poisoning. We as a city, both the council and the administration must commit to a goal of ensuring that not even one New Yorker has to find out that their child has lead poisoning. Because one or more child suffering as a result of exposure to lead, be it, paint, be it in paint, in water, or in soil, is too many. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Cornegy. And I want to lastly hand it over to uh, Chair Costa Constantinides of our Environmental Protection Committee. Thank you, Speaker Johnson, and, and thank you for your strong leadership on this so important uh, public health issue for all New Yorkers, but particularly our most vulnerable children. And to my colleagues, uh, Chair Cornegy and Levine, for helping to convene this very important meeting. Uh, you know, lead, as we know, was ubiquitous in our environment, particularly in air, more than 45 years ago when lead was used as an additive to gasoline. The EPA commenced the phase out of all gas uh, lead and gasoline in 1973, um, but it, it remained in the soil, it didn't biodegrade. And uh, homes who had lead paint on their outdoors, that paint would be scattered off and could chip off into our soil. Today, lead can still be sound in soil, although lead levels in soils have generally declined over time as lead was phased out in gasolines. Based on 84 soil lead, lead studies across 62 U.S. cities, Evidence suggests that Lloyd soil, soil lead quali uh, quantities in city centers were highest and tend to decline towards suburbs and exurbs of the city. Uh, we are sponsoring two bills today, uh, 25 bills today. The ones I have sponsored, uh, intro 420, would require the Department of Parks and Recreation in conjunction with the Health Department and Mental Hygiene to test for lead in the soil of public parks, community gardens, and privately owned spaces accessible to children and post testing results on its website. Such soil with elevated lead levels would need to be replaced or otherwise remediated. And intro 422A would require property owners of non-owner occupied private dwellings to test lead levels in soil in certain areas to, where such stuffings once a year and provide a copy of test results to any lawful occupants. Uh, this, children play in the soil. They make mud pies. They, they dig in it. It's what children do. Uh, we just want to make sure that our parks are safe. Uh, lead can be found in drinking water as a result of the use of plumbing materials that were brass or bronze based. Although lead pipe was banned for the use in drinking water supply lines in most countries in the 1980s, it remains an additive in many plumbing materials due to its malleability. Unfortunately, brass and bronze based plumbing materials still release dangerous levels of lead. Uh, lead may also be present in privately owned water mains that service private property. Under those circumstances, in individuals with concerns about lead in their drinking water can receive results for, of, of, for free water testing at the tap from DEP. Where lead is found present in water, samples taken at the tap, reverse osmosis filters are available to remove lead from drinking water at the tap. As been said, uh, it, it bears saying again uh, this morning that there is no safe level for lead exposure particularly in children and pregnant women. Addressing lead in our soil and water is a step forward uh, for fighting uh, the, to make sure that our, our, fan, our city is safe and our residents are safe. I will also say that we do have a safe water supply. Uh, I don't want anyone to, at home to look at this hearing and think that I should not drink the water in New York City. Uh, we can always look to do things better, um, but our, our drinking water is mostly is, is, is the best in the world. And we need to make sure, as we're striving to do things better, 
um, the, that we are not throwing out our, our, our drinking water with that. Uh, so thank you, uh, uh, Speaker Johnson. Uh, thank you, Chair uh, Constantinides. So um, I'm going to uh, read the names of the folks that are going to be testifying here today or taking questions uh, from the council members. And uh, we have, of course, uh, four folks who are uh, sitting, but we also have other people who are in the audience who might be coming up at certain points to answer certain questions. So I'm going to read the names, and then I'm going to have the council to the committee uh, have you all take the oath to be sworn in before you provide testimony and before you answer our questions. So we have, of course, uh, Dr. Oxiris Barbeau, uh, the Acting Health Commissioner from the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, Corinne Schiff, the Deputy Commissioner for Environmental Health at DOHMH, uh, Maria Torres Springer, the Commissioner from HPD, <clears throat> Anne Marie Santiago, Deputy Commissioner at HPD, Stephen Schindler uh, at, from DEP, uh, Vinny Sapienza, the Commissioner at DEP, Vito Masachulo, the general manager from NYCHA. Uh, Shireen Riazi Kermani uh, from NYCHA. I apologize if I didn't pronounce it correctly. So uh, if the council could please swear these individuals in. Can you raise your right hand, please? Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and respond honestly to council member questions? Thank you. So either Dr. Barbeau or uh, Commissioner uh, Torres Springer, whoever wants to uh, begin, you may begin. Thank you, Council Member, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, good morning, Speaker Johnson, Chairs Levine, Cornegie, and Constantinides, and members of the Committee on Health, Housing and Buildings, and Environmental Protection. I am Dr. Oxidis Barbeau, Acting Commissioner for the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. I'm joined today by Corinne Schiff, Deputy Commissioner for Environmental Health, and Housing Preservation and Development Commissioner Maria Torres Springer and Deputy Commissioner Amory Santiago, as well as colleagues from the New York City Housing Authority, Departments of Buildings, Parks and Recreation, Environmental Protection, Education, Design and Construction, and the Administration for Children's Services. I want to thank the Council and specifically you, Speaker Johnson, who as the former Health Committee Chair understands the importance of this topic. I appreciate the opportunity to testify today on the package of legislation intended to prevent and reduce elevated blood lead levels in children. This administration is deeply committed to the safety and well-being of our children. I'm a pediatrician by training, and as acting health commissioner, I also have the honor of being the city's doctor. At this, my first hearing before you in this role, I want to reiterate my commitment to the health of all New Yorkers and advancing the health equity in our communities. We have long been at the vanguard of efforts nationally to reduce elevated blood lead levels, EBLLs, in children. Beginning in 1960, when the New York City Board of Health made us the first jurisdiction in the country to prohibit the use of lead paint in residential settings, 18 years before it was banned by the federal government in 1978. The City Council has also been a leader in its local laws, especially the Childhood, Childhood Lead Poisoning Prevention Act, known as Local Law 1 of 2004. Because of the city's multifaceted approach to preventing EBLLs in children, there has been a nearly 90% decline since 2005 in the number of children under the age of six with a blood lead level at five or above micrograms per deciliter. In 2017, there were 33,000 fewer children with EBLLs than in 2005. This decrease is a testament to the council's passage of a strong local law that helps prevent childhood exposure to lead-based paint and the dedicated work of the city agencies represented here today. Despite this progress, we recognize that is, it is deeply concerning for any parent to receive news that their child has an EBLL. When I was a practicing pediatrician in Washington, D.C., many of my patients had elevated lead levels. So I know as a doctor that there is no safe level of lead and that we must continue to work relentlessly to further reduce the number of children with EBLLs. Now is the time to finish the mission and reduce the cases of kids with EBLLs to zero. 
The city took an important step on July 1st of this year when the mayor announced that the health department would conduct home investigations for all children under 18 years of age with blood lead levels of five micrograms per deciliter and above. The speaker's bill would codify this change and the health department plans to bring this update before the Board of Health. The new policy sets a, strong, a single threshold for health department home investigations and expands by thousands the number of annual home ins investigations for children with EBLLs. To go the last mile, we will need new strategies. Let me start with our approach to testing children for blood lead levels, which is critical to early intervention in cases of lead exposure. Currently, 80% of children citywide are tested at least once before age three. That's a rate any other city or state would envy, but it is not good enough. Our goal is a vision zero approach, and so we are implementing new tools to drive the testing rate up. I can announce today that we're launching a 1.5 million citywide public awareness campaign to encourage parents and caregivers to, give their, to get their children tested before age three, especially in neighborhoods where we see lower rates of testing and higher rates of EBLLs. We are grateful for Council Member Drum's leadership on this issue and support his related legislation. We look forward to continuing to discuss opportunities to collaborate on this work with Council. We can also announce a new three-year, $1 million initiative to reach the 20% of kids who haven't been tested by their third birthday. On an ongoing monthly basis, the health department will match birth records to its blood lead database to determine which children up to age three have not yet gotten their blood tested for lead as required by law. We'll reach out to these families individually to remind them of the need to get tested and connect them to care. We estimate that this effort could boost New York City's testing rate to over 90% over the next few years. Before discussing the bills under consideration today, I want to put the legislation into context by providing some background about how EBLLs occur and by describing the city's current multi-pronged approach to preventing and responding to EBLLs. Lead paint remains the most common source of lead exposure for New York City children. The mechanism for lead exposure is typically ingestion, so it is very young children, especially those under the age of three who are at most risk, who are most at risk, sorry. These children explore the world by putting just about anything into their mouths. Peeling or chipped lead paint and lead dust can easily end up on a craw crawling toddler's hands and on their toys and then into their mouths. And because young children are at a critical stage of physical development and absorb lead at higher rates than older children and adults, nutritional deficits and developmentally appropriate hand-to-mouth activity can put them at risk. It's also important to understand how EBLLs are treated in children. Except at very high rates, rarely seen in New York City today, the body naturally excretes lead over, its, over time on its own. Typically, the only quote-unquote treatment is to remove the ongoing source of lead exposure so that the body can do its work. The city's robust approach to protecting children from EBLLs is twofold. First, prevent lead exposure, and second, when a child has an EBLL, respond quickly and comprehensively. Prevention is the focus of Local Law 1 and what sets the city apart from other jurisdictions. Because paint is the primary source of exposure for children in New York City, Local Law 1 requires owners of buildings built before 1960 to survey their tenants in order to identify apartments with children under six years of age and requires owners to then perform annual paint inspections in these apartments to identify and remediate peeling, chipped, or cracked paint. This approach protects all children by removing environmental risks without reference to any particular child's blood lead level. And because conditions can change over the year, Local Law 1 allows tenants with a child under six to alert landlords all or call 311 if the apartment's paint is not intact. And the paint must be restored to an intact condition. 
Commissioner Torres Springer will provide you with more informa information on these preventive measures in her testimony. Second, when a child does present with EBLL, the city responds quickly with a detailed and thoughtful intervention to ensure the safety of that child. The response begins when the health department receives notification of a child with an EBLL via a daily electronic download from New York State. Our team immediately contacts the family to set up a home investigation, which includes a detailed interview and inspection. The inspectors who are highly trained and EPA certified are often the first contact the family makes after they learn about their child's EBLL, and they work closely with the family during that first meeting. The investigation begins with a comprehensive interview with the family and the child in order to better understand the child's risk factors for lead exposure. They then inspect the apartment for lead paint hazards using a piece of equipment called an X-ray fluorescence or an XRF device. If the device detects lead in the paint, the health department issues the property owner a commissioner's order to abate and we will follow up to ensure compliance. The inspectors also take additional environmental samples based on the interview with the family and visit supplemental addresses where the, children, where the child spends five or more hours per week. Our focus, regardless of whether the child lives in public or private housing, is always on that child, and we work with the family and the provider to monitor the child's blood lead level to ensure it declines. Currently, the health department is legally required to conduct a home investigation when the child has a blood lead level of 15 micrograms per deciliter or higher. The department has historically gone beyond this mandate and has conducted these investigations for children under age six with a blood lead level at or above 10 and for those 16 months of age at a blood lead level of eight micrograms per deciliter or above. Again, with the city's July 1 announcement, all children under the age of 18 with a blood lead level of five will now receive a home investigation. We've made great progress and we are ready and eager to continue to drive down the number of children with EBLLs. The bills under review today propose important updates to Local Law 1 and to the city's overall strategy to protect these children. As we move forward, it's important to use evidence-based strategies that maximize the health benefits to children. Intro 865, the centerpiece of the, of the legislative package, would change the blood lead level at which the health department is mandated to conduct a home investigation, lowering that threshold from the current 15 to five micrograms per deciliter. I, as I noted earlier, the administration supports this proposal, and as of July 1, significant change is already underway. The administration also supports the proposed action levels for soil and water in intro 865, and we want to talk to the council further about the proposed thresholds for lead-based paint and lead-contaminated dust. The administration supports intro 881, which addresses outreach and education. The health department already conducts the activities required under this bill, and we are happy to have this work codified, while ensuring flexibility to maintain the most evidence-based best practices. The administration supports the reporting requirements set out in intro 918 and other bills, though we do request that these mandates be consolidated into a single report due annually on September 30th, which is the health department's current reporting deadline for local law one. And the administration supports intro 709, which requires the creation of an online lead service line map. Intro 877 requires all agencies that provide services for or relating to children to make reasonable efforts to determine whether a child has had a blood lead test and if the child has not been tested to determine the reason and provide a referral for testing. The administration supports the intent of this bill and would like to work with council to identify the best approach for increasing the number of children tested each year. 
The city uses a variety of strategies to promote blood lead testing, including a requirement that parents show proof of a blood lead test for entry into childcare and school. The department also sends guidance to over 30,000 healthcare providers annually, reminding them of the testing requirements, conducts outreach and education for families, and collaborates with Medicaid managed care programs to identify children due for testing and alert their health care providers about the need for testing. We are eager to work with Council on additional mechanisms to reach providers, parents, and caregivers to further increase lead testing. The administration also supports the intention of Intro 874 to strengthen tools to enforce safe work requirements. Construction and renovation work done improperly can create a risk of lead exposure for children, and we look forward to discussing this bill further with the Council. We recognize unsafe work practices as a source of possible lead exposure in the home and have ongoing media campaigns in neighborhoods where we believe unsafe practices are going unreported, most recently on Staten Island. Intros 464A, 864, and 904 address the Health Department's investigations in response to reports of EBLLs both in children under age 18 and in pregnant women. The proposals include requirements to inspect all units with a child under age six in buildings where the health department has identified a lead paint hazard, to conduct water samples and to inspect specific locations where the child is likely to spend time. In addition, the proposals would require the testing of bare soil from all areas accessible to children or adults. The Health Department agrees that a comprehensive investigation is critical to identifying and reducing lead exposure for children and pregnant women with EBLLs. We currently conduct a robust interview and investigation to identify and eliminate all potential sources of lead exposure. There is no one-size-fits-all approach. Instead, our investigators take a nuanced approach tailored to the specific family and its circumstances. The Health Department looks forward to working with Council to set out evidence-based requirements most likely to identify and eliminate lead exposure for children and pregnant women. Intros 873, 891, and 919 address abatement of lead paint on turnover of apartments, both in multiple dwellings and in private dwellings that are not owner-occupied. The administration would like to work with Council to craft requirements that reduce lead exposure risks while not also creating unintended consequences, such as contributing to the housing unaffordability crisis. Introduction 920 concerns lead paint in child care facilities and in schools. The administrative code and the health code already prohibit child care centers from having lead hazards. Because it is young children who are most at risk of EBLLs, it is appropriate to focus on these settings. Lead paint does not pose the same risk to older children because they are less likely to ingest lead-based paint. We would like to work with Council to ensure that the scope of this bill covers the right settings to protect children's health. This package of legislation also addresses the Council's concerns about lead in soil. Introductions 420A, 422A, 907, and 916 address testing and remediation of soil that is wholly or partially bare and accessible. The requirements would apply in parks, in multiple dwellings, private dwellings, public and non-public schools, and in child care programs. The Health Department's home investigation includes an assessment of soil exposure, as well as environmental sampling and remediation where indicated. However, soil is not, I repeat, not a significant source of lead exposure for children in New York City. 
In an analysis of 219 children who had a blood lead level at or above, above 15 micrograms per deciliter in 2017, there was only one child identified after our extensive interview and home investigation with an exposure to lead from soil. And it is important to note that this one child also had exposure to a lead-based paint hazard as well. We are concerned that the bills encompass activity that is disproportionate to the risk for children and may detract resources and capacity from evidence-based efforts. We also worry that these proposed mandates may have unintended consequences, such as reducing New Yorkers' access to green spaces. There are important public health and mental health benefits to having access to outdoor space, including backyards with patches of greenery. We look forward to working together to address the low risk proposed by lead contaminated soil. Next, Several bills, intros 3A, 91A, 868, 871, 892, and 902, address testing and remediation of drinking water in parks, multiple and private dwellings, public and non-public schools, and child care programs. New York City's water is of the highest quality and is the best beverage for our health. The, the Department of Environmental Protection's water quality monitoring program is far more extensive than required by federal law and demonstrates that New York City's drinking water is of the highest quality and meets all state and federal drinking water standards. The city's water already arrives virtually lead free from upstate reservoirs and is tested more than 600,000 times a year at different places across the city for various contaminants, including lead. It is also treated with corrosion control measures, decreasing the chance of lead leaching from aging building plumbing sy systems into the water. Because of these protections in our water system and existing state law and health code provisions related to testing of water, in schools and childcare settings, lead in water does not present a significant, meaningful risk to New Yorkers, and we do not consider water a significant source of exposure for children. In the same analysis of 219 children I just mentioned, only one child lived in a home where a water sample was detectable, with detectable lead, 15 parts per billion or higher was found. Again, that child also had an exposure to lead-based paint. There are some circumstances where that risk can be higher. For example, in a particular building, the faucets or other fixtures could have lead content or a building may had, have a lead service line. A simple solution is to run the water for 30 seconds in the morning to flush out stagnant water. If New Yorkers are concerned about their water, they can request a free testing kit from DEP via 311. The administration looks forward to working with the council to address any lead in water concerns appropriately so that New Yorkers can continue to have confidence in our water and make it their drink of choice. I cannot stress enough, water remains the best beverage for good health. The administration is also reviewing the recently introduced legislation, intros 1063 and intro 1117. Intro 1063 requires notice when contaminants are found in soil during a city development project. The administration supports transparency for New Yorkers and wants to make sure that notification of the public is used appropriately to ensure appropriate response. Intro 1117 would require city agencies to provide information to parents about DEP's free home water testing kits. The city supports increasing awareness about the home test kits and we look forward to working with council on this bill. Finally, I have spent my entire career as a pediatrician and a public health leader promoting the health and well-being of children. I can assure you that the safety of our children is my top priority. Our strong laws and policies designed to prevent and respond to elevated blood lead levels have made the city a national leader on this issue. 
I look forward to working with City Council and my colleagues to ensure that we remain at the forefront of efforts to protect our youngest New Yorkers. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on this package of legislation. I would be happy to address your questions after Commissioner Torres Springer's testimony. Thank you, Dr. Barbeau. Before we hear from Commissioner Torres Springer, I wanna uh, let folks know we've been joined by Majority Leader Cumbo, Councilmember Espinal, Councilmember Yeager, Councilmember Richards, Councilmember Drum, Councilmember Chin, Councilmember Powers, uh, Chair uh, Constantinides, Chair Carnegie, Chair Levine, Councilmember Perkins, who has been a leader on this issue for a very long time, uh, Councilmember Ampri Samuel, the Chair of our Public Housing Committee, and Councilmember Grudenchik. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Tori Springer. Good morning, Speaker Johnson, Chairs Levine, Carnegie, and Constantinides, and members of the Committees on Health, Housing, and Buildings, and Environmental Protection. My name is Maria Torres Springer. I'm the Commissioner of the New York City Department of Housing Preservation and Development. I'm joined today by Anne Marie Santiago, the Deputy Commissioner of Enforcement and Neighborhood Services for HPD. With more than 20 years of experience in code enforcement at HPD, Deputy Commissioner Santiago leads our agency's work to protect New York City residents and was intimately involved with the implementation of the Childhood-Led Poisoning Prevention Act, or Local Law 1, of 2004. Now in 2004, the city council, the city agencies, and advocates did something profoundly important. Local Law 1 represented a watershed moment in public health and public safety. Since the law's implementation in 2005, our aggressive enforcement, coupled with the health department's investigations and concerted interventions, have dramatically reduced the number of children with elevated blood lead levels by nearly 90% which means that in 2017, there were 33,000 fewer children with elevated blood lead levels than in 2005. HPD's lead paint prevention regime is the gold standard of addressing lead-based paint hazards in the nation, and we take our work very, very seriously. We are on the front lines every day identifying and resolving lead paint risks in housing. Every time an HPD inspector enters an apartment with a young child, it doesn't matter whether the reason is lack of hot water, mold, or pests, we inspect for lead paint risks. Since 2005, our agency issued approximately 314,000 violations for lead-based paint conditions, and we are working to ensure that landlords are addressing lead-based paint hazards to keep tenants and their children safe. We've made over $40 million in lead-based repairs ourselves, stepping in when landlords fail to fulfill their responsibilities. When we encounter cases, serious cases of noncompliance, we take landlords to court. We've initiated more than 2,300 cases involving lead paint since 2014, including comprehensive cases because usually the truly negligent owners aren't just failing to address lead paint conditions, they are systematically failing to maintain their buildings. At HPD, it is mission critical to ensure the quality and safety of our city's housing stock and protect tenants. That is why we are dedicated to a comprehensive multi-agency approach to prevent elevated blood lead levels in New York City's residents. Now, as the commissioner responsible for enforcing the city's housing regulations, I want to reiterate my personal commitment to ensuring New York City's residents living in safe and well-maintained housing. But I also want to assure you uh, that we across uh, HPD and across the city agencies, we do not rest on our laurels. We are looking at issues of lead exposure with fresh eyes, and we recognize that this is the time to finish the mission. This July, following Mayor de Blasio's announcement of a new Vision Zero approach to lead exposure, I ordered a top-to-bottom review of every HPD program to make sure we were compliant with local, state, and federal rules regarding lead paint. And where we found areas for improvement, we've been transparent with elected officials and residents. We fix what needs fixing and are constantly assessing our processes. I look forward to working with the City Council 
our city's health experts, and our sister agencies to advance health-based targeted strategies to educate tenants, hold owners accountable, keep workers safe, and continually strive to drive lead exposure in our city even lower. We must all indeed work together to get to zero. Now the standards outlined in Local Law 1 comprise a strong and aggressive prevention regime to address lead-based paint. They are proven to work. They have played a, a large part in, of course, reducing the cases of elevated blood lead levels among children year after year. Local Law 1 requires landlords to identify and remediate lead-based paint hazards in apartments of children under the six years of age using trained workers and safe work practices. Because New York City led the nation in banning the sale of lead-based paint in 1960, that paint is presumed um, to exist in non-owner occupied multiple dwelling units and in common areas of a building if, one, the building was built before 1960 or between 1960 and 1978 if the owner knows that there is lead-based paint and two, a child under the age of six lives in the apartment. If these two standards are met, property owners must investigate units where young children reside, as well as common areas, to find peeling paint, chewable surfaces, deteriorated subsurfaces, and friction and impact surfaces. This must be done on an annual basis upon turnover of the apartment, or more frequently, if the condition is known that if a condition is known that may cause a lead hazard, or the occupant complains about such a condition. Owners must give new tenants a form inquiring if a child under six will reside in the unit and send an annual notice asking the same. Owners are also required to provide all new occupants with information about owner and tenant responsibilities under the law and a pamphlet from the health department informing occupants about lead hazards and owner responsibilities. Any work done in apartments to eliminate exposure must adhere to safe work practices that significantly reduce dust dispersion. Work that disturbs lead-based paint or paint of unknown lead content must be done in a way that minimizes the penetration or dispersal of lead contaminants or lead contaminated materials from the work area to other areas of the dwelling unit and building. People performing work must have received specific training to ensure that they know how to undertake the work in a safe manner. And the property owner must maintain records about work performed and provide notification to tenants about the risks of lead exposure. Now our goal is always to keep homes safe by addressing lead paint hazards through the enforcement of Local Law 1 and by supporting, requiring, or doing the work ourselves to remediate lead-based paint hazards. We do far more than just react to complaints. We are proactive across the various agencies. We are out in apartments at HPD alone every day and actively look to identify problems, ensure conditions are fixed, and keep children safe. We go above and beyond Local Law 1 to not only ask all tenants who call 311 about maintenance conditions, whether or not they have a child under six in the apartment and conduct visual inspections, but also send a housing inspector with an XRF machine to those apartments proactively. We go out to the worst buildings through our special enforcement programs to check for maintenance conditions, including lead-based paint hazards. And we engage in education and outreach efforts to inform both tenants and owners about the respective rights and responsibilities, including bringing HDD staff to different council district offices through our new HPD in your district program and meeting New Yorkers where they live with our new mobile units. As a result of this aggressive prevention regime, HPD has issued approximately 314,000 violations for lead-based paint conditions, including nearly 60,000 violations issued within the past five years. These efforts to address the current conditions in apartments have gone a long way towards keeping New York City's children safe, but we are always looking for new and better tools to do even more. Since 2004, we have responded to millions of complaints and also issued millions of violations for the entire Housing Maintenance Code, and we always encourage New Yorkers to call 311 with any concerns that they might have. 
any time a housing inspector is in an apartment, the inspector asks if a child under six lives in that apartment, and if one does, or if they see evidence of a child under six, they conduct a room by room, surface by surface inspection. All housing inspectors have received HPD's lead training and spend some portion of their time conducting lead-based paint inspections. Code enforcement has approximately 170 staff members dedicated to working on Local Law 1 issues. That includes about 57 housing inspectors and 35 additional staff members dedicated to the lead-based paint unit, among others. In fiscal year 2018, HPD completed over 28,000 inspections related to potential lead-based paint hazards. We take aggressive actions to address hazards that have been identified by the Health Department during its investigation of a child with an elevated blood lead level. We work closely with our colleagues at the Health Department when their investigations reveal lead-based paint hazards in the unit where a, chi um, where the child with an, where an elevated blood lead level resides. At that time, they issue a commissioner's order to abate or a coda and monitor owner compliance or refer the orders, uh, the orders to HPD to conduct the abatement work if the owner is unable or unwilling to do so. If an owner fails to address lead-based paint conditions in response to a health department commissioner's order to abate or to our own violations, HPD steps in to protect children. Since Local Law 1 was implemented, we have spent more than $40 million conducting repairs in privately owned buildings. In fiscal year 18, we conducted 658 lead-based paint emergency repairs at a cost of approximately $1.1 million to keep families safe in their homes. And as we preserve units, more than 75,000 since launching uh, the launch of the Housing New York plan, we ensure owners address lead-based paint hazards and follow the required safe work practices during construction. As required by Local Law 1, we have presumed lead and are working to address lead-based paint hazards in uh, 1,282 apartments where we provided financing for re rehabilitation in fiscal year 18. Although we focus strongly on landlord compliance to keep renters safe, we also work to educate tenants about the hazards of deteriorated lead paint, the rights that they have, their own responsibilities, um, including letting owners have access to units for lead paint inspections. Now, if a tenant has any concerns with peeling paint or potential lead-based paint hazards, they should always call 311, HPD, or the health department. Making sure New Yorkers have access to safe, healthy homes is our highest priority. We are here today to work with all of you to finish the mission and eliminate lead exposure in New York City for good. We have the strongest prevention and response lead regime in the country to build on, and HPD is committed to rigorously enforcing those laws and regulations to ensure that residents have the protections that they need and deserve. We'll continue to examine all of our programs in conjunction with the City Council and take swift action to improve, where needed, our efforts to drive lead exposure in our city even lower. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Um, I think at this point we, um, we'd be uh, more than happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, we've also been joined by Councilmember Rivera and Councilmember Menchaca. I appreciate your testimony. Uh, Dr. Barbeau and uh, Commissioner Tori Springer. And of course, I uh, say this with uh, deep respect to both of you, but I am slightly confused and incredulous because what I didn't <clears throat> really hear, and I believe either one of the testimonies, was a real level of self appraisal and self-criticism on where we have failed and what that impact is on tens of thousands of children over the last many years since 2004, 14 years, and understanding those tragedies. And so, is there a recognition 
that we could be doing a much better job? Is there a recognition that this is a tragedy? Is there a recognition that it's not all um, rosy, but there is a real problem in gaps when you still have 4,200 children under the age of six years old who are now testing at the five uh, deciliter level. I didn't really hear that in the testimony. And I wanted to start off today by understanding if there is an acknowledgement of failures and tragedies that have occurred, not because of either one of you, but because of the system in place that for far too long has allowed this, conti this to continue to happen. Mr. Speaker, let me start by saying that as a pediatrician, as the city's doctor, um, I feel confident that New York City has the most aggressive approach to ensuring that we reduce the number of children that are exposed to lead. That being said, we recognize that we still have a way to go and we're at that last mile. And so we are open and excited to be here to talk about how we collaboratively work to ensure that we drive that vision zero approach in the city so that uh, we don't have any more children exposed. Because, you know, as you and I both said earlier, we don't want any children to be exposed to lead. Certainly, you know, as a pediatrician in DC, working on lead in Baltimore, and now here in New York City, and across the country, all pediatricians and, and elected leaders, we know that there are wide concerns and misperceptions about the true risks of lead, how we best approach it, but I think New York, having been a leader and with the changes that are being made currently, continuing to be a leader, I think we have an opportunity to not only drive that number down here, but across the country, because what, what we do here in New York is oftentimes replicated elsewhere. So is it a failure and a tragedy that 4,200 children under the age of six years old potentially have devastating lifelong impacts of elevated blood lead levels on things that have been entirely preventable for years. Is that a tragedy and a failure? So Mr. Speaker, again, as a pediatrician, and I'm, I'm speaking from the heart here, we never want to see a child exposed to lead. But I will say that our efforts uh, in moving forward and reducing the threshold for action continuing to strengthen the collaboration between our sister agencies who all have as our central mission the, the health and welfare of all New Yorkers, but especially our children. We are leaning forward into this and looking forward to working with council in order to continue to drive that number down. So I will say that I believe it's a failure and a tragedy that 4,200 children under the age of six years old. No, 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 no. We're not doing that here today. We're not doing that here today. I believe that it is a failure and a tragedy that that number of children are still affected in a devastating way, potentially, for the rest of their lives. And I would also say that by the time it reaches you, Dr. Barbeau, that failure has already occurred that when it's getting to the health department, when it ends up on your desk, we have already gone too far down the line. We haven't remediated it correctly. We haven't prevented it in the way we need to prevent it. And so when we start talking about the investigations that the health department does, the follow-up that you do with the family, all of that, that is important work and of course we want to ensure that those families and children who have been affected, that we're getting the information that we need, that we're connecting them with care, and we're understanding the source of exposure. But when that has happened, we have already failed. Mr. Speaker, I, I couldn't agree with you more that prevention is critical, and it takes all of us 
from city agencies to families to healthcare providers to ensure that we maximize the number of kids that get tested, to ensure that we use all the levers available to us currently, especially local law one, to continue driving that number down. So in the uh, preparation for this hearing, we have been preparing for this hearing um, all year. And we started to ask detailed questions to all the city agencies involved in May. And we wanted to have this hearing before the summer, but in uh, consultation with many of the advocates who are here today, who had further questions on the pieces of legislation that we were putting forth, uh, we decided to uh, give more time to advocates and to the administration before we had this hearing. And we didn't want to have the hearing in the middle of the summer because we thought it was important that this happened when New York City's paying attention and not away. We had a meeting yesterday which was a good meeting, a productive meeting, and I appreciated uh, your willingness to have frank uh, conversations in that uh, meeting about concerns uh, that you all have. We asked for a lot of data, a significant amount of data. Our job as a municipal legislature, our job as a city council, one of the core functions of this body is to do meaningful and real oversight and ask difficult questions to city agencies without fear or favor of who the commissioner is or who the mayor is. That is our job as a body. We had many, many questions. We were not getting answers to those questions in preparation for this hearing. The attorneys that are sitting up here today was working with staff for weeks or months on end and not getting answers to the questions that we needed. Not until I intervened with the other side of City Hall 72 hours for this hearing, did we begin to get a semblance of data necessary for us to be able to conduct our oversight responsibilities in preparation for this hearing. And by the time that happened, Chairs Levine, Constantinides, and Cornegie had already been briefed by their staff on their committees without the adequate data necessary that they needed in advance of this hearing. That is an unacceptable way to deal with an issue of this gravity. It will not happen in the future. We will not wait. The council has the potential authority to issue subpoenas. We have not done that, but we will do that in the future if HPD and DOHMH and other agencies do not give us the data we need to do our job. And so I appreciate that there were concerns around HIPAA laws. I appreciate there were concerns around anonymity related to families and children who needed to be protected, but that is not an appropriate reason since May to not provide us with the information that we need. And I wanna say that at the outset of the hearing, that it made it more difficult for us to prepare for this hearing today because of that, and I would love to hear a response on how we're gonna ensure that that does not happen in the future on issues of this importance to New Yorkers and to the New York City Council. So Mr. Speaker, I, I appreciate the importance of data and making smart decisions using data. And as you noted, um, there, were, there are privacy uh, concerns, but I think Beyond that, let me just first begin by saying that the health department has and will continue to be committed to transparency. And so while there are concerns about uh, protected medical uh, information, there are also what this process illuminated the, was the complexity of the um, children and family and their histories of how we go about teasing apart what are potential real risk factors and what are not. And so uh, we took a very deliberative approach to providing information and we will continue to remain uh, open and transparent about the data that we have 
On an annual basis, we have been posting uh, results of all of the lead tests that have been done uh, as a result of the local law one requirements. Uh, this uh, recently, because of all of the attention, we have actually gone from posting it annually to posting it quarterly, uh, and a, no a number of other different enhancements. But, Mr. Speaker, I want to assure you that we will uh, continue to be committed to transparency. There hasn't been transparency in the lead up to this hearing. So I hope that that changes, and we will ensure that it does change moving forward so that we have the information and data necessary to draw our own conclusions, to analyze that data in an appropriate way as we prepare for an oversight hearing of this nature and as we prepare to consider 25 pieces of legislation that we think will protect the well-being of children in New York City. <clears throat> I want to move on and um, talk about some of the testimony that was uh, prevented today, that was presented today. Uh, Dr. Barbeau, you said on uh, uh, page three of your testimony, uh, the city's robust approach to protecting children from elevated blood lead levels is twofold. First, prevent lead exposure. And then Commissioner Torres Springer, you went in and talked about the prevention techniques that the city is using moving forward, uh, that ha they have been using in the past. You cite that uh, as a result, this is what you said, Commissioner Torres Springer, as a result of this aggressive prevention regime, HPD has issued approximately 314,000 violations for lead-based paint conditions, including nearly 60,000 violations issued within the past five years. And then you go on to talk about uh, HPD conducted 658 lead-based paint emergency repairs citywide at a repair cost of $1.1 million to keep families safe in their homes. So I'm a little confused. I want to really dig into this data because I think the enforcement and the most, is the most important. The enforcement and the remediation is the most important part of this. 314,000 violations, 60,000 violations within the last five years, but only 658 emergency repairs that the city conducted. What happened with the rest? Um, speaker, I'd be more than happy to um, clarify how it works. The, um, the local law one implementation regime that we have um, is one that is designed to ensure coordination, the protection of children, and accountability. Um, there are um, many steps uh, that we take to make sure that we are aggressively enforcing um, the provisions of the law to hold landlords to account. The 300,000 violations since the inception of Local Law 1 um, re represents the, the main tool that we have in order to ensure that landlords are remediating um, lead-based lead paint hazards as they are being identified. We issue the violation. There follows a very <coughs> prescribed set of steps in order to ensure that they fix the problem. But because we are so um, uh, focused on making sure that we correct the condition for um, the family, if a landlord does not follow, um, the, uh, does not correct the violation, does not make the repair, we step in. And so the numbers that, that you mentioned, 600 or so emergency repairs and 1.1 million, that's when HPD comes in through our emergency repair program to fix that repair, to uh, remediate um, the unit for the family. And to be very clear, we charge that back to the landlords, plus a 50% fee, um, the, uh, plus a fee that's approximate to 50% of the repair cost. And if they don't pay that, we put a lien. So in all other cases, landlords made all the repairs necessary. So of the 300 um, violations, 300,000 violations since the inception 
of, um, of uh, Local Law 1. Um, it, approximately 96% have been closed because they made the repairs or we have inspected to make sure that those repairs are done. How many okay. current violations for lead are open and not corrected? Um, so we have, um, for which fiscal year? In aggregate, over multiple years. Um, so we, that, so 96% um, of, um, of the total violations approximately um, have, either, have either been closed or the, the lead hazard has been addressed. I mean, I have like cognitive dissonance sitting here. It's, it's hard for me to hear that and then hear what the advocates say and to see the numbers of children who are still testing positive for elevated blood lead levels. It's, it's hard for me to reconcile. It's hard for me to reconcile that. It's hard for me to understand how we are having a 96% rate of correction and this is still happening. I mean, the number of children who have these elevated blood lead levels, let's put NYCHA aside for a moment, and we will talk about NYCHA today, but let's put NYCHA aside for a moment. What number of them are happening of that 4,200, uh, uh, either Commissioner Brubbo or Commissioner Torres Springer, are happening in non-NYCHA? So, Mr. Speaker, um let me begin by saying that when the health department gets notified of children with elevated blood lead levels, we uh, initiate our investigations the same way, irrespective of whether a family lives in public housing or in private housing. I know, but I want to understand the breakdown. And generally, the vast majority of children with lead levels above the five micrograms per deciliter about 97% of them live in uh, private housing. So what's that number end up being out of that 4,200? Do we have that? Um, it is roughly, I would say, I do have it, if you would bear with me one moment. Um, I don't know what the current, oh, we can look behind us. <laughs> do we have the number? Sorry, uh, the number of this chart here looks at the number of children under age six, uh, and it breaks it down by uh, whether they're in pu public housing or not. And the number in uh, public, excuse me, private housing as compared for the last year for which we have complete data, so 2017, uh, is uh, roughly 4,100. So 4,100. So Commissioner Norris Springer, that means that 4,100 kids, not in NYCHA, NYCHA is supposed to take care of its own, HPD is doing non-NYCHA, 4,100 kids in buildings that HPD is supposed to be remediating, issuing violations, and then remediating 4,100 children. So let me so is say. That a is that a failure? Uh, we know that we have to finish the mission. While we have said in our testimony, and it is, I think, certainly something for all of the dedicated public servants who've been working on the implementation of Local Law 1, that there's been a 90% decline in elevated blood lead levels. Um, those numbers are obviously disturbing. And we know that our work is not done, which is why we come here to this hearing and, um, and we are reviewing uh, the proposed legislation with the spirit of trying to identify what it is going to take using the best data, um, using what we know um, to have worked in the implementation of Local Law 1 um, over the course of the last 15 years um, to uh, then make the right interventions to drive that to zero. So that's, that has been our approach. It is our commitment um, moving forward. And, and I think um, two things can be true at the same time, that there's a lot that this city can be proud of um, in the implementation of Local Law 1, um, while at the same time acknowledging that our work is not over, Mr. Speaker. And that's the, that's the part that we certainly all here look forward to uh, working with the council on. 
I, I respectfully say that I would use stronger language than that. I would say that we can be proud of what we've, as you just said, achieved in Local Law 1 with an 89% reduction going from 33,000, which was an enormous number, down to the number we're at today while acknowledging that there are still tragedies that are occurring. That's what I would say to accurately depict what I think is going on. So um, are these violations just complaint driven? No, so that this- How many are issued proactively? Um, and maybe Deputy Commissioner um, uh, Santiago can provide um, more, more details. But that's one of the strengths um, of our, um, of the local law one implementation system that we have. Um, it's certainly if someone calls 311 and says there is peeling paint and I have a child under six, um, that's, that we follow all of the right steps. But it's proactive in that um, if someone calls 311, does not, and talks about a building condition, we, the 311 operator, ask proactively if there's a child under six. If we are inspecting for other building conditions in the unit, we also look to see and ask if there's a child under six. And so all of the, the violations that are then issued are based not just on complaints, but because we have gone above and beyond um, Local Law 1 um, to ensure that we are catching wherever we can units with children under six. If we have that number, we'll share it. If not, we will certainly follow up. Mr. Speaker, excuse me, <clears throat> uh, we don't have the number of violations, but I can speak in terms of inspections. Um, so uh, we've completed about 19,000 proactive inspections looking for, that's inspections that did not involve a complaint specifically with a child under six and appealing paint condition. Um, so we are doing quite a number of proactive inspections once we find the child, and that includes the proactive ins inspections across the spectrum um, that Commissioner Torres Springer referenced. So both when we have proactive programs that are in buildings where no tenants filed a complaint and the agency is there, a, a specific complaint, and the agency is there for our underlying conditions program, for example, um, our, our alternative enforcement program, our proactive preservation program, um, and in cases where the tenant has filed a complaint for some other condition, um, not specifically related to peeling paint. We can look at our violations and get back to the council with information on the split um, in terms of the issuance of violations. What is the oldest open violation on the books? Um, How far does it stretch back? Um, we will we'll follow up mm -hmm. with you on that, but I think what's See, this is the data that we were seeking leading up to this hearing, asking for d data like this and other data, which we did not receive, so that what I didn't want to happen was to have a hearing where you would say, we'll get back to you with that data, that we could look at the data before the hearing and we could have this conversation in a meaningful way, and that it's not helpful entirely to give us the data after the fact. It's important to give us the data before the hearing so we can have a robust hearing based off the data, not we'll get back to you with the data. Mm -hmm. I understand, Mr. Speaker, and I'm sorry that um, um, the data wasn't available, um, but I, if, I, if I may, I think what's important to note about closing violations um, is that the local law one set out very specific steps, and it's important because we don't want to close a violation until we are sure that the issue has been fixed and that the proper documentation has come back to HPD. And what we have found is that, um, and as I mentioned, the vast majority of that certainly gets closed. Um, but what we have found is that once the repair has been made, um, there are times when um, it, it's difficult or the, the tenant does not provide access so that we can't, the, uh, the follow-up steps need to happen or documentation, it just, it takes certain landlords a long time to do that paperwork. And so um, part of this uh, part, and, and, uh, is part of this hearing, but also part of our overall education efforts is to make sure that both landlords and tenants are fully aware, not just of their rights, but of their responsibilities to make sure that we can um, implement local law one in a way 
that is um, most effective. So I, I'm going to finish now because there are a lot of members here who have a lot of questions and I will come back for another round when members have the opportunity to ask their questions. But I just want to uh, just uh, ask this. Children under the age of three are considered the most vulnerable, correct? Uh, yes. I mean, um, from a developmental perspective, whenever a child starts crawling <clears throat> and um, has hand-to-mouth behavior, that's when... Uh, the risk could be introduced. So it could be as early as six to nine months, but generally the next threshold would be three years of age. So state law requires testing at age one and two. What percentage of children in New York City are tested for lead by the age of two? Um, so council member, uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm gonna let Corinne answer that specific question, but let me just say that um, the health department makes um, extensive efforts to work with providers to ensure, because the responsibility is on the provider to do that testing. And we work with the managed care organizations, community organizations to drive that number up. Um, and I, you know, we just announced uh, an additional measure that we're gonna take to ensure that uh, we increase uh, beyond 80% uh, the number of children who have the required test before the age of three. Is, is 4,200, do you think, undercounting the number of children who actually are, are, are tested? Do you think that's an undercount? Do you think that's an accurate number? Do we think the number is significantly higher than that? So, Mr. Speaker, I think the challenge is that um, it's difficult to predict what number of children move out of the city, uh, what number of children may come in but not born here. So um, it is a, a data collection issue that we are continuing to tease out. But I think really the important point here is that uh, we don't take anything for granted. So you're not Our sure. Efforts. You're not sure if it's an undercount. We feel confident because of all of the blood lead levels that we get from the state. Uh, we look at every single one of them, and that number reflects the number of children above the age, excuse me, below the age of six in the year 2017 who had a blood lead level of five or higher. So that's not the, the that's the number less than six. That's not a, a three-year-old. What percentage which did, were tested? I asked that question and then I'll move on. But what percentage of children two and under were tested? Deputy Commissioner Schiff. Uh, so as Dr. Barbo mentioned, New York state law requires testing at age one and age two. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, in New York state, uh, New York City, we have a, a high testing rate when compared nationally and to the rest of the state. 80% of children are tested before the age of three. This, and um, as Dr. Barbeau mentioned, we have a number of outreach activities. No, but I asked about two. One and two, not three. Oh, uh, well, this well I, when I say up to age three, we, we mean at age one and age two. Okay. So up to age three. So 80%. Uh, under, under age three. So 80%. 80%. So one in five children under that age have not been tested. So there are 20% of children based on this, the data that we have, and that's why we have a number of uh, methods that we use to encourage testing. I'll say that our, the, the, um, the activities that we do to do outreach to encourage testing um, are targeted at higher risk uh, communities. So, for example, we work, we have a longstanding uh, relationship with Medicaid managed care uh, organizations. They do a um, match against their records, and there's an automated notice that goes out to providers when that test doesn't occur. Um, the test is required as part of entry to child care. Um, we do outreach uh, with WIC centers, Head Start. Um, we send a uh, notice uh, to 30,000 providers every spring reminding them of this. And as Dr. Barbeau announced um, in the testimony, um, we're going to try a, a new technique where we're going to match our uh, uh, birth records. As you know, we issue um, birth certificates. So we're going to match that data against our blood lead testing data and send a letter to parents where their child hasn't had that test to remind that parent. We, would, we, we want to get the word out. We want all children tested. Um, we would be, I, uh, I, we would appreciate your help 
Um, I know many of you have um, newsletters you send to your constituents. We'd be happy. We'd to be happy to work with you that on that. I mean, I think I'm, I'm going I'm to hand it over to to, to Chair Levine, but <laughs> I want to say that I I, I you know I, uh, this is unrelated to this topic, but you know I'm sober nine years from drugs and alcohol. And before I could get sober, I had to admit I had a problem. I had to admit I had a problem before I could try to fix that problem. And I think today we have to admit that we still have a very serious problem with this number of children. There needs to be acknowledgement of that in a very significant way, because until we have an acknowledgement, I think it's hard. And, and some of the testimony I've heard today, uh, again, I think you all are, are very fine, dedicated uh, public servants. And um, I appreciate the work that you do. But I, I feel like there was a lot of rosiness today on the testimony and, and, and what's been done, which is fine to talk about what we've achieved, but we still have to talk about how far we have to go so that no child ends up being exposed in this way and have their life altered for the rest of their lives. I want to turn it over to Chair Levine. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I want to follow up on your important questions about enforcement, um, Commissioner. Um, the Speaker and you have spoken about how we handle reports of peeling paint and other problems when there's a proactive complaint by a tenant. But you know, one of the most, maybe the most powerful provisions of Local Law 1 is a legal requirement that the landlord proactively perform an inspection, certainly upon turnover of the apartment, but actually I think yearly if there's a small child present. And that's actually, if the landlord doesn't do that, that's actually a misdemeanor. So it's a criminal act if the landlord does not proactively inspect under the conditions mandated by Local Law 1. It's a very, very serious matter. How many cases uh, of prosecution or other sanction has there been against landlords for failing to provide that proactive inspection? Mm -hmm. um, thank you, Council Member. First, I'll say that we share what is clearly also the City Council's goal of making sure that we're aggressively enforcing the provisions of Local Law 1. Um, I think what's helpful to understand where inspections lie in all of this is, one, we fully, of course, expect landlords to abide by those sections um, in that provision of the law. We have, since the implementation, since the start of implementation, have focused our resources and time and attention in making sure that we are identifying where there are hazards in the home, uh, making sure those are repaired or coming in ourselves. So that's been um, just by way of, kind of background for how thus far we have devoted our efforts. Um, and, and so the, the, what that has resulted in, and not just the 90% decline, but the 300,000 or so violations. Um, we do know, and we throw the book at landlords all the time, um, if they are not living up to their expectations, as it relates generally to lead, um, as I mentioned in my testimony, um, since 2014, we have brought approximately um, 2,300 cases that involve lead um, against landlords um, in housing court. And so... Um, right, but those were cases where you had a report of peeling paint, perhaps it wasn't repaired. That's right. right. But, how, do, but what about cases where a landlord just doesn't inspect? And maybe the tenant doesn't see the paint, or maybe doesn't see it till it's too late. And I understand that that number is not going to make up a large portion of the 23. But uh, do, do you because, know what that number is? Um, I don't have that number, but it's uh, uh, but um, but it's precisely because there, there was a press report this week that there have been zero cases of landlords sued for this. Um, I the the me more meaningful metric, in my opinion, um, is to look at the 2,300 number that represents the type of litigation that we have initiated to hold landlords to account. This is not to say that we don't think that there is more work to be done and in the implementation of Local Law 1, because to get to that, that group of children, that last mile, 
we have to identify where there are gaps. But the, the, the question um, and the, uh, the work that I think we need to do is ensure um, whether it's which cases we bring on or which piece of paper we ask for, that that work, that that, in, the, that intervention will actually drive the number um, as low as we all want. So uh, it has to be commensurate right. with the health Look, impact. Look, we, we, we all agree prevention is the goal here, right? We want to we act before pain peels and certainly before a child ingests the pain, right? And the, the intent of Local Law 1 is that landlords inspect automatically uh, if there's a small child in the home and if there's a turnover of the apartment. Do we even track uh, when those inspections are done? Do landlords follow a report with you? Do you know uh, apartment by apartment if those inspections have been completed? Um, I'll let um, Deputy Commissioner Santiago uh, talk generally about record keeping, but that too I think falls in the, um, uh, in the same category of we fully expect landlords to abide by all of these rules. We have focused our time, attention, and resources on protecting children and I making know, but sure that those repairs are made. An expectation not backed up by enforcement is not enough. There are going to be landlords who flout it, and they are flouting it. And, and we are open to identifying where those areas are, if it is this one or others, to make sure that we're driving it to zero. Well, one, one provision in the bills we're pushing forward today is to require a third party to do that inspection so that someone will report and will know it's done. Yeah. And I'm not sure if it was yourself, Commissioner, or Commissioner Barbeau, but uh, there was a brief line in one of your remarks that, that appear to indicate you don't support that approach of a third party coming in so that we know the inspection is done. Riley, if, if I move into a new apartment or any family, I don't know whether the inspection was done. There's no way for the, the tenant to report on that. Right? So the idea is a third party, an EPA certified and trained inspector could do that, and then we have the certainty that the inspection was completed. So do you have a position on that? as, a, as a, a response to this? Well, l I will start, and if Dr. Barbeau wants to, uh, um, uh, can also weigh in. For all of, the, uh, all of the bills, we come with a spirit of working towards closing the gap. Um, for that one, um, in particular, um, while we share um, the desire to make sure that all of um, the requirements of Local Law 1 are, are being followed, um, we have to and are open to discussing with the City Council. Um, we have to make sure that our efforts to, in some instances, I'm not saying, I'm not saying this one, but the, the efforts that, that might appear to be chasing paperwork don't divert from the resources and attention to identify where there are hazards, fix them, Ensure landlords fix them or come in where we um, where Okay, we I want to move on, but I think we have identified a major gap in the enforcement regime and, and one I think we need to work on. I, I do want to focus on water a little bit. Um, uh, we have a regime in place to check the water fountains and the taps used in cooking in schools. Now, we want to strengthen that regime. That's partly what we're seeking to legislate, but there is something in place in the schools. Now, if a child leaves their school building and walks across the street to a playground and drinks out of a tap, drinks out of a water fountain there, uh, that water fountain may never have been checked. And park infrastructure was largely put in place uh, long before we banned uh, lead pipes and lead paint, et cetera. So how can you explain this discrepancy between the regime in place in school for kids and the lack of any checking of, to, to my knowledge, any consistent plan to check water sources in parks and playgrounds. Um, so Council Member Levine, let me first start off by sort of reminding us that um, we have the best water in the country and that water comes to us virtually lead free. And, you know, we recognize, and especially, you know, as a pediatrician, I recognize that there have been <coughs> scary headlines uh, recently about what's happened in other jurisdictions that makes people naturally question the quality of our water. And I want to make sure that 
We reassure New Yorkers that uh, our water is tested uh, consistently, thoroughly, and again, comes to us virtually lead free. Beyond that, uh, when there have been, especially in the schools, um, testing regimes, the issue is not the water. The issue is, in many cases, and I'll have my DOE colleagues come up in case I miss anything, it, but generally it's that the, the fixtures, the solder that may have lead um, can leach into the water. We take many measures to protect the water, but the, the most important thing here to note is that um, by running the water, then that generally takes care of the issue. So what we're talking about is lead that has potentially sat overnight in a school building, or you know, DOE posts information about um, water fixtures in, in slop uh, sinks, right? And so I think it's a perfect example of matching the intervention to the risk. Okay. And so um, we, when we do our investigations for children who have been noted to have elevated levels of lead, we do a very thorough investigation that includes testing the water in their homes by having them call 311 and getting the testing kits. If we get significant information about them spending a significant amount of time in other uh, settings such as schools, we will also do that follow-up. But you know, in the, in the years that we have, um, through Local Law 1, been able to bend the curve by 90%, we have not identified water as a significant source. Look, I, I, uh, again, uh, we do want everyone to drink water. It's healthy, it's good for the environment, the water coming from the Catskills is probably the cleanest in the world. To give people confidence in the water supply, it is helpful for them to know, for the public to know that we're doing everything we can to keep the water clean, not just in the mains, but right up to the point where children drink. And I have to tell you honestly, Commissioner, no kid is gonna go to a park water fountain or any water fountain and run it for 60 seconds. It's just, that's just not a reasonable expectation if that is our solution. Um, the EPA has a standard uh, for water in bottles of five parts per billion. Uh, in Canada and the European Union, that standard is applied to all, to all drinking, drinkable water, all potable water, including, including water coming out of the tap. Um, here, w what is the standard here at which we determine that water is safe to drink? So I will begin and then I'll, I'll turn it to, over to my fellow commissioner. Um, and I've been working on this issue long enough to know more than I thought I ever would about this subject. Um, and I think the important thing here to note is that the 15 is a reference level that helps us understand the degree to which our protective measures are effective. Because first and foremost, it's always the health of New Yorkers that we are focused on. Um, and I'm gonna turn it over to Deputy Commissioner. Excuse me, Commissioner. <laughs> Good morning, uh, Commissioner Vinny Sapienza with New York City DEP. Um, so again, to reiterate, the, the water that's coming from uh, both our Catskill and Delaware and Croton system uh, is, is virtually lead free as it gets into homes and buildings. Um, the, 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 there, there are, and, and I think, you know, Council Member Constantinidis mentioned, um, and, and Dr. Barbeau, there can be lead fixtures, lead piping, that if water sits inside a, a lead pipe for overnight, a long period of time, um, some level of lead can potentially be absorbed. So what EPA did was set a standard, it's called an action level actually, of, of 15 parts per billion saying that take a test after water has sitting stagnant in a pipe for six to eight hours, mimicking overnight, and take a first draw of that sample and, and see what the level is. And they use 15 as an action level. Other Canada, other, other places, don't use that same sampling technique of letting water sit in a pipe for a long period of time and doing a first draw. What they'll do is they'll set the standard, and, and it's five in some cases, for typical use of water during the day after the water has been running um, for several hours. In fact, Canada, it says the water should be stagnant for no more than 30 minutes to get to that five. 
letting, again, as has been said several times here, letting the water just run until it's cold, where you're now drawing your water from the city's water main in the street significantly reduces those levels. Okay, I, I appreciate that. I just want to move on to one final topic before we pass it off. Um, Commissioner, I just want to clarify um, our plan for testing kids when they're young. Uh, my understanding is you're seeking to have them tested once, uh, to have every child ch tested once before they're six. Is that correct? New York State requires that children be tested at one year of age, two years of age, and be uh, screened for potential risk factors for elevated blood lead levels until the age of six. Okay. Um, you have, I think you clarified that we are at 50% now by age two, is that right? Uh, no, we're actually at 80%. By age three, we're at 80%. Below, so I'll re two years and 11 months is still two, so that's why we say less than three, just to kind of, you know, give that that, um, and the state expand. law extends up till two years and 11 months? <laughs> Typically, um, when pediatricians see families in their office, they've got some leeway, right? It, they may test at nine months. They may test at 15 months. It's the generally uh, recommended time frame. Okay. So within that time period. And, and your goal with the measures you've announced today is that by age two, what percent of children will be tested? So with the measures that we are uh, announcing, the, the match against the birth cohort, uh, we project currently that roughly uh, just above 90% of children below the age of three will be tested. Okay, well, we're going for 100%. Uh, one, one child untested is a risk we can't take. Um, we're, we're at 99% uh, vaccination rates. Uh, there's no reason we can't be uh, at 99% blood testing rates, uh, lead testing rates, particularly since generally this is part of a test that's already being done in doctor's offices. It's not an additional draw of blood. Uh, so we're, we're gonna push for uh, getting every child in the city tested during their vulnerable years. We would welcome a partnership with council because we have no regulatory authority on individual right. pediatricians to, you know, levy sanctions to say, you are not meeting that threshold. And as a pediatrician who practiced, I took it very seriously and I tested all of my patients. But unfortunately, you know, we still have pediatricians in this city that think, you know, this child that I'm seeing lives on Park Avenue and they're not at risk. But the reality is whether you live anywhere in the city, you need to be tested at one and two years of age and be screened up until the, year, the age of six. Okay. Um, thank you. I'm going to pass it on to my colleague and co-chair, uh, Councilmember Carnegie. Thank you, Chair Levine. Uh, thank you for your testimony here. This morning I had it intended to keep uh, my questions in the enforcement section, but uh, I may deviate just a tiny bit uh, because there's, I think, some important information that we need. Uh, one of the goals on Local Law 1 was to eliminate lead paint on certain high-risk areas in apartments by requiring the work, by requiring this work once apartments became vacant. What type of enforcement or audits has the city done to confirm that property owners are removing these hazards when an apartment becomes vacant. Now, I know that um, Chair Levine asked uh, this question, but I think he asked it in another way, and I didn't hear the answer to this question. So if, do, if we know that, could you please provide that? Absolutely. Um, so, Council Member, the, the turnover requirements for under Local Law 1 um, are um, are pretty extensive, um, and that, of course, is has met and was meant to um, con uh, add to um, the preventative um, spirit of, of Local Law One. Um, what we have, and we fully expect um, uh, landlords to comply uh, with those provisions. Um, what, uh, uh, similar to the annual inspections, um, we have devoted, um, and when we go in to uh, and identify peeling paint or lead paint conditions and issue violations, those include for, those include um, uh, violations that, um, for, for paint, uh, for uh, conditions that should have been repaired 
um, as part of turnover. Um, what we have, um, as I mentioned, however, that are the time, the resources, and our energies in the implementation thus far of Local Law 1, we've concentrated um, on those efforts to make sure we're identifying where there's a lead hazard, making sure the landlord repairs it, and then, um, and if they don't, we step in. Um, and so what we are uh, completely open to doing is identifying where there might be other parts of enforcement um, that have to be um, that have to be improved, um, but whether it is with turnover um, or other issues, um, but it has to be commensurate, we believe, um, with the positive health impact that it can provide. So that what we're doing at HPD or across different agencies is, isn't diverting resource to chasing paperwork, but really making sure the resources that we're providing and the time that we're spending are about ensuring those units get repaired and children's lives um, are not in danger. So while I appreciate that, I think, I think <clears throat> what I was trying to get to, and my question is, is there a way that on HPD's roles, you know apartment, uh, an apartment now has become vacant and before it's reoccupied, there's an, you know, d are you doing an audit to say, okay, these apartments were vacant, we did an audit to make sure that, you know, there's no lead paint, and then somebody, re you know, uh, reoccupies the apartment. Um, as you can imagine, tracking the turnover of apartments in our housing stock um, is, uh, would be a gargantuan undertaking as people come in and uh, move in and out of apartments. Um, we do, while the audit um, function or the audit provision um, in Local Law 1, it, it is there at the discretion of, of the agency um, versus um, our requirement. We have used audits um, in a number of instances, um, including where CODAs have been ordered by the Department of Health um, uh, in certain um, uh, certifications of corrected work, um, sample exemptions, for instance. And so we use it, but we use it in a very concentrated way, in a very targeted way. I think the overall point that I want to make sure is clear is that the, the time and the energy and the resources um, that we have um, uh, dedicated to the implementation of Local Law 1 has been, and we believe it's the right thing, concentrated on fixing the condition for the children in the units. And so as we move forward, if that is an area, whether it's audits or, or some of the others that have been mentioned, where we think there's an opportunity for better enforcement, we'd be more than happy to work with the council on that. Do we know how many audits have taken place? I don't have that specific count, but we'd be more than happy to follow up. Okay, and so my next question is, um, in relate, it relates to the term high-risk areas. Yeah. So anecdotally, I think that all of the uh, council members present uh, would say that there's a disproportionate impact on minority communities of high-risk lead paint. Um, do we have the statistics to either substantiate that anecdotal idea or to, dis to dissuade that idea? Do we have the stats to... to uh, I'll defer so to our top health professional in the city. So, Council Member, I, I think what we can say is that typically um, the, the housing that is most at risk is older housing with poor maintenance um, because older housing is more likely to have had uh, lead paint um, and then lead paint in and of itself is doesn't prevent present a risk as long as that surface is intact and that's where um, maintenance comes into effect because whenever there is a disruption of that surface that's what creates the the potential risk. So I was just flagged that according to the testimony in writing that 79% of the cases are in uh, black and Latino children. According to the annual report from DOHMH. Um, so I, I don't have that um, data with me and I'm not disputing. I, we take great care in, in the accuracy of our data and if that's health rep department no, that's, data, I stand by it. No, but that's, I don't mean to be rude, but that's actually your report. Is your annual, the DOHMH annual report uh, designates the 
So the point I'm trying to make, though, is the, the housing stock that's at risk and the conditions under which the risk can be increased. And so, um, yes, that we are confirming that right now on this report. So we already know that if that's the case, then there's, there's a targeted enforcement that has to take place. Is that where we're, gen is that where we're concentrating the resources um, that are necessary? Is it there? So our, our role at the health department is to follow the child. And when we conduct our investigations, um, if there <coughs> is peeling paint that is demonstrated to have uh, elevated lead as based on our XRF testing, then we will issue a commissioner's order to abate. And so we will also then continue to follow that child and uh, do ongoing uh, tracking to ensure that, that it doesn't stop there, that uh, regular routine follow-up testing is done to ensure that that blood lead level continues to decline because um, if it doesn't decline, then we will go back, re-interview the family, which is a very in-depth process that can take uh, several hours to do comprehensively, and then determine if there may be additional sources of potential lead exposure. It, it seems like <clears throat> we could be best served if uh, DOHMH would share that information with HPD and then create a targeted enforcement. We could probably get to 100 if, if we were willing to do that. Is that something you'd be willing to do? So I'm going to turn over to uh, Deputy Commissioner uh, Schiff because we notify landlords uh, of when there is a commissioner's order to abate. Otherwise, if, for example, a child has an elevated blood lead level but we don't find uh, non-intact paint that has lead, it's protected medical information and, and we generally, or not generally, we can't share that information. How many orders have there been to abate? Um, <clears throat> excuse me, in 2017, uh, we issued 415 orders to abate, but I do wanna add that when we issue an order to abate, we have regular communication with HPD. We are sharing that information so that HPD can use that for its additional additional enforcement. It's, it's an important um, part of the coordination uh, set out in the local law and that the agencies have implemented. Um, so I'm going to ask my last question, which is how many of them have been corrected? But uh, to, to kind of piggyback off what the speaker said, like trying to, to navigate these numbers here at the hearing um, is taking up an incredible <laughs> amount of time. And we could have done this prior to the hearing and be having a dialogue about how to remedy it, remedy it instead of having them presented here. So this is very, it's very difficult for me as the chair of housing and buildings to try to do this here in a hearing in front of everybody when I should have had these numbers before and what we would be talking about now is a remedy for it. So, but if you could just answer the question, uh, uh, how many of those abatements have been corrected? Uh, so our, when we issue a commissioner's order to abate, uh, which is after we are, we are conducting our investigation for a child with an elevated blood lead level, we conduct that at home home visit, we do environmental sampling if we find a lead paint hazard, and we issue that order to the landlord. Um, we're tracking the compliance with our order very carefully, regularly. If the work isn't done in a timely and safe way, then we will refer that work to, to HPD. And I wanted to, to take a moment to talk about that because it's actually one of the very important pieces of Local Law 1 that other jurisdictions don't all have in other places. If the landlord's not complying, then the, the government has to take that landlord to court. It can be a lengthy process, and meanwhile, that child is sitting in that, is living in that apartment with the hazardous condition. Um, local Law 1 doesn't allow for that, and so we, uh, either that landlord completes the work under our supervision, or we send it to, um, to HPD to do that work, and as the commissioner described, that work gets done, and then the landlord is billed. So, I just gave you the number for 2017. I think given the timelines, unless there's some very unusual circumstance that I'm not aware of, all of those should be complied with. So I'll, we'll just confirm that there's nothing open in our record for 2017. Um, but the, in general, you know, uh, uh, that's our process. So we, we are monitoring that compliance. There are tight timelines. And if it's not done, we refer it over. 
So I'm not sure if I understood you correctly that all 400 have been corrected? So um, I, I would want to just be 100% sure, but for our process, for the orders that we issue, we are monitor monitoring for timely and safe compliance, and we're, when we're not getting that, we refer it to HPD, and they do, uh, uh, they do the remedy, and they do it on time. So unlikely that for 2017 orders we have any open, but I want to just make sure that I'm getting you the right information, so we're going to just confirm and get back to you. Thank you. Um, in the interest of time, I, I'm going to pass it to uh, Chair Constantinides. Uh, Mr. Chair, before you go, I just have one question. Does the health department, has the leadership of the health department, has the leadership of HPD met with advocates on a regular basis to the folks that are doing this work who see gaps in the system to understand what HPD and DOHMH could be doing better? Have, have, have you met with any advocates during your tenure in your current positions in the, let's just say, in the last uh, two to three years, have you all met with advocates? So I'm going to defer to Deputy Commissioner Schiff because this is my week three as well, advocate. Well, no, but you've been first Deputy Commissioner, <laughs> uh, the number two person at the Health Department under Dr. Bassett. Yes, and so um, Dr. Uh, Deputy Commissioner Schiff, as overseeing our Healthy Homes Project, um, has been, you know, part of the work that we do is whether it's with um, advocates around lead or whether it's around HIV or infant mortality, we pride ourselves in being a department that is very open to collaboration with advocates. And because I think that makes us all stronger and it makes our city healthier. So has that happened? Um, so the, the, um, the leaders of our Healthy Homes program, which is where this work sits, are very much uh, engaged with the lead poisoning prevention community in New York City. Um, they <coughs> sit on advisory boards, they meet with people, um, there are uh, regular meetings and they, it's, a, it's a community that knows each other. Um, I uh, did have a meeting yesterday with advocates that I think was um, very useful and productive and we discussed um, areas of, of agreement and places where we think that, that more work could be done. Who, who, who did you meet with yesterday from the advocate community? Uh, you know, I don't remember everybody's name off the top of my head. I wouldn't want to uh, leave off names, but we can get that, uh, that meeting list to you. And HPD? Um, uh, Speaker Johnson, we have in all of our work, first generally, work with community-based organizations, um, tenant advocates, um, because a lot of the issues um, that we see as it relates to building conditions, it can include lead, but it's often about um, building wide conditions and making sure that landlords are held to account. Um, I personally um, look forward to um, uh, meeting more with advocates specifically on lead. Um, the, the teams at HPD um, are, are constantly um, working with different um, and listening to and getting feedback um, from different organizations to the extent, of course, that that is something that um, should be done more, especially as we negotiate and think through um, uh, the best implementation of different aspects of the 24 bills. We'd be happy to do that, and I personally would be happy to do that. Uh, Nigel? Have you met with advocates? Vito Masachulo, General Manager of NYCHA. Thank you, sir. So um, I have not personally met with advocates, but I do meet with our resident leaders and residents on an ongoing basis. So is there a commitment from the leadership at this table, which is considered the most senior leadership of these respective agencies and authorities that uh, we're looking at? Uh, to uh, meet with advocates and leaders who um, see gaps in the system and see where things can be done better. Is there an acknowledgement and a commitment to do that? Yes, yes on my part. Okay, great. Uh, Chair Constantinides. Thank you, Speaker Johnson and, and Chair Levine and Carnegie. Um, I'm going to ask a number of questions relating to soil and water as the purview of the uh, uh, Environmental Protection Committee. But I do have one question on your uh, testimony, uh, Commissioner Bodbot. You talked about how you're going to compare uh, the, the data that you have to birth, birth records in the city of New York. 
What are we going to do for those that are born outside the city or outside the state of New York, and especially in our immigrant communities? How are we going to make sure that they're getting tested in the same way that we, a, someone who's born in New York City is? So, Council Member, I, I appreciate that question because um, we have been um, trying to ensure that all of our efforts are also encompassing members of the immigrant community. And so, you know, as we detailed earlier in terms of all of the outreach that we're doing and, and the new things that we're going to be doing, we would be happy uh, with any other ideas of how we could continue uh, to reach members of our community, especially the immigrant community, uh, because we don't want anybody to fall through the cracks. We take this very seriously, and you know, as we talked about earlier, we're trying to uh, touch all of our bases in terms of really completing the mission that was started in 2005 under Local Law 1. So what are we doing in relation to uh, uh, language appropriate materials, speaking at various houses of worship, places where people will uh, bring their, their young children and they can get that information um, readily available to them in a, in a language that they speak. We're a city of immigrants. How do we make sure that we are doing these communications in a very thoughtful and, and meaningful way? Absolutely. So we do a lot, and I'm going to let Deputy Commissioner Schiff um, give you more details about the ways in which um, we try to blanket uh, ling English limited proficiency communities and then also work with other communities that may have um, higher levels due to other practices. So I'll let her talk about that. Thank you. So we do have uh, a public education uh, unit in our program. We do a lot of outreach and education. I know in, in conversations with uh, some council members, um, we've talked about when you have events that we are happy to, to provide materials or even to be there. We do, we're out at health fairs. And you're absolutely right that our materials, uh, it's, it's critically important that they be in, um, in, in the language that people know uh, are most comfortable in. And so we do have uh, language access uh, program, make sure that our materials are in appropriate languages. We also have um, very targeted outreach for certain communities um, where we see uh, additional risk. I think that's what Dr. Barbeau was alluding to. So for example, we know that in um, South Asian communities we, we see um, disproportionately high rates um, and that's uh, due to um, uh, things in addition to, to uh, lead paint hazards, that's because of product use and um, traditional remedies and cosmetics. And so we design, we also design targeted campaigns for particular communities and we work with community-based organizations um, who, who are uh, uh, trusted leaders in those communities. We train them, we provide them materials because they can be the, the best messengers. And so those are some of the things that we do to reach um, people uh, who, with uh, who are who, for whom English is not their first language. And how big is the budget to do this sort of outreach? I mean, we have uh, 190 languages, I think, spoken in Queens alone, if if not more. Um, so how how are we uh, allocating resources to get this done effectively? I don't think I have uh, budget numbers specifically on on uh, language access for our materials, but we can provide that. Okay. All right. So moving on to um, soil and water. Um, how have we done soil sampling in parks, playgrounds, public spaces, uh, community gardens uh, that are adjacent near to highways or heavily trafficked traffic roads? So, Council Member, let me just begin by saying uh, and going back to the process that we have whenever we identify a child with an elevated blood lead level. Um, as in clinical medicine, whenever a patient comes into my office, I take a history and that drives what the intervention I will prescribe for that patient. Similarly, in this situation related to public health efforts, we do extensive and in-depth interviews with every child that we identify with an elevated blood lead level. And then depending on what that history tells us, that then drives what additional testing we do. We know from that, uh, from years of those examinations, that lead, lead in paint is the usual source. 
but if there are situations where a child, because of their age or because of their developmental status, has a behavior in which they eat soil, then we will go to where that uh, location is to test that soil. The other thing I want to just note is that this is a perfect opportunity to sort of remind us about matching the intervention to the level of risk. Yeah, yeah Commissioner, I, I, I've heard this already, so I do appreciate it, the, this answer, but uh, I think we've heard this morning, I can't think of how many times I've lost count, uh, no level of lead is safe. Right, so we're not talking about only elevated levels, we're talking about levels of lead and you know, looking at soil. Um, so that's my question, and I'm trying to get an answer to that question. That's the question I asked, I'd like an answer to it. I understand, Council Member, and, and what I would um, want to sort of frame is I can understand. I would like the answer to the question that I asked, please. I, I'm, you keep I'm, framing the question, I, I, I'm an attorney as well, we can frame all day. Let's get the answer, please. So I understand the inclination <laughs> to want to test every single possible source, but this is an opportunity C for Commissioner, us. Commissioner, please, 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 just answer the question. Please. Would you restate the question, please? <laughs> the question was, are we, have we done soil testing in, in, in public places, parks, and you know, areas around highways and other highly trafficked areas? Yes, no. We have done soil testing when indicated by a patient history. Okay. Have we done that? Have we consulted with other cities for uh, testing that they've done, uh, such as the Urban Soils Institute, uh, the, Norwegian, the Norlean, New Orleans soil study? Have we done, have followed up with any other cities in relation to what they're doing around soil? I am not familiar with uh, consulting with other cities because it's pretty standard practice to follow what the history tells you in terms of how to match your resources and match the intervention to the risk. Right. So we test soil uh, when and if indicated by a patient's history. Mm -hmm. All right, so I, I appreciate that. I, I, you know, we can all talk a lot this morning. I'm just trying to get the answers to the questions that I have. Sure. Um, you know, as for, have you taken a look at the CUNY soil study from 2015? I have not, but I'm going to defer it to any of my agency colleagues who may have. Does uh, uh, DEP want to comment on that? Commissioner <laughs> Sapienza? Yeah, Mr. Speaker, um, soil contaminants is under uh, the jurisdiction of the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation not New York City DEP. No, no, the question is, the, the, uh, the chair, who I know you work with on a regular yeah. basis, given the jurisdiction of his committee, is asking about uh, different studies that were done looking at risks related to soil and lead and asking if the appropriate city agencies have taken a look at those studies to understand the risk factors involved. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. That is correct. That's correct. Now, so, yes, yeah, so New York City DEP has not taken a look at mm -hmm. soil uh, lead testing, uh, given that it's not in our jurisdiction, it's a New York State jurisdiction. Okay. All right. So I, I will continue to um, follow up with you uh, in relation to that. And, and so I guess asking about photo remediation is probably not a something that we're doing or looking at since we're not testing. Correct? I'm sorry. I missed the first part. Photo remediation um, for soil, planting things like sunflowers and, and other uh, plants in order to soak up lead and then, you know, removing those plants and, and, and in order to get it down to a more reasonable level. So I would defer to my colleagues from Parks and Recreation if they want to talk about their new. If the council could uh, please swear uh, Commissioner Kavanaugh in. He, you were sworn in? No, I was not. He was not sworn in. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and respond honestly to council member questions? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Kavanaugh. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Liam Kavanaugh, Deputy Commissioner with the mm -hmm. Parks and Recreation. How are you? I, I first want to say- How are you, Deputy Commissioner? How are you? Good, thank you. How are you? Good. I first want to say that public safety is at the heart of everything that we do in mm -hmm. the Parks Department. Absolutely. Whether it's designing, uh, building, planning parks, 
operating, maintaining, or inspecting parks. It's mm -hmm. really at the heart of what we do. Uh, absolutely. I, I, don't, I don't dispute I, that. I, I'm not familiar with the CUNY study that you referenced. Uh, there was a Cornell study done a few years ago that did test soil in community gardens throughout the city. Uh, they did found elevated levels of lead in some of those, uh, some of those samples that they took. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have a longstanding practice of working with our community gardeners uh, to make them aware of the potential for right. lead and other contaminants in urban soils. Uh, we have a number of best practices that that we share and enforce in some cases with our community gardeners so that they don't plant in soil itself. They plant in raised beds that have a barrier between the soil and the planting medium in which the plants are growing, uh, that they wear gloves, they wash their hands, they take other precautions uh, you know, just to be safe for themselves and their families when they are working in their gardens. And if there is exposed soil in the gardens, uh, they cover it with, with wood chips or other plant material that prevents a direct contact with the soil. I definitely I appreciate that, Commissioner, and uh, I, I will continue to, to ask some additional questions about the needs um, to, to continue to look at soil. Um, I just want to ask about water very quickly, if, if uh, Commissioner Sapienza can quickly, I don't want to monopolize the hearing, and by, by Commissioner Barbara, I'm, I'm in no way trying to disparage the work that you're doing, and I, 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 as the Speaker said, I believe that you're all great public servants. I'm just trying to get answers to the questions that I ask, um, and that's really you know, trying to be concise as possible. Um, so when it comes to water, I know there was a, a 15 parts per billion that was, was uh, you know, talked about, as the, that's a 1991 standard. Uh, you know, other jurisdictions have gone down as, as, as you know, five, and that's not really working out very well. So uh, how do you, uh, what is your sort of response to what our, uh, well, how we're measuring how we're doing when it comes to water in the city of New York. Mm -hmm. So, Mr. Chair, you know, as mentioned previously, the, the water that's delivered from our upstate reservoirs through the water mm -hmm. main in the city is virtually lead free. EPA had established its action level of 15 parts per billion of lead, but the sample that to determine that level is based upon uh, stagnant water first draw, meaning mm -hmm. water sitting in a lead pipe overnight, six to eight hours, and then a sample is taken of that water immediately. In, in many other uh, locales around the world that have lower standards, uh, Canada, we, we mentioned earlier, for example, the water is taken not at a first draw after stagnant water has been sitting in a lead pipe overnight, but during the day when it's more typical of water that's, that's being generally used. So it's kind of apples and oranges the way the, the, the limits are. So, are so what are we doing on that last that last mile, right? We're talking about, you know, it's very often it's the, uh, this is still for the EP. Don't take his microphone away. <laughs> Actually, I just want to interject. I think um, <laughs> this is a, an example of where going the last mile, in my opinion, as the city's doctor and as a pediatrician, mm -hmm. is focusing where the highest risk is. And that we know is in lead paint. And so I think focusing on the preventive efforts related around local law one and how it is that we can continue to bend the curve uh, and focusing on lead paint as the most likely primary source of lead exposure, I think is the, probably the best way to target resources at, at that last mile. Okay, so I'll ask uh, again. Um, so how do we, on that last mile when it comes to water, uh, I know it's many often it's, it's that little, it, it's from the main to the home that may have lead contamination, it's, it's the faucet in a school, it's as my colleague uh, Mark, uh, Councilman Ravine talked about, it's, it's the, the, the uh, playground faucet. What are we doing to deal with those last uh, you know, challenges? I know the water's clean, like I'm not here to dispute that we don't have the best water in the world. And, by no way or is anyone here saying that we should not be drinking New York City tap water. We should be drinking New York City tap water. But how do we uh, get rid of those last bits of contaminants that are in those various uh, places? Mm -hmm. uh, so, Mr. Chair, um, we, we all talked about the um, lead that can be in plumbing, whether it's in fixtures and pipes, and <laughs> before lead was prohibited uh, through, the, through the plumbing code, um, that, that was a practice. Uh, there was a recent report uh, by the IBO about um, private homes, one and two family homes primarily built in the 1920s and 30s that have these lead pipes that connect their home to the city's water main. Those are called lead service lines. Mm -hmm. um, th those are, are, you know, 
again, grandfathered in, they're private infrastructure. Um, it's not something that the city on its own with, with city capital funding um, can just say, you know, we're, we're gonna go in and replace. Again, it's, it's owned by the homeowner and the homeowner really at this point, knowing that just by simply running the water until it's cold is yep. really reducing any, any likelihood of getting uh, lead exposure, that's, that's their option. So the IBO report, they talked about found that 2% of the homes found an elevated level of lead. Um, do these homeowners even know that they own that's those service lines? So they, they know that they have to deal with it? I mean, I wouldn't know unless someone told me. So how would I know that that's something that I have to deal with and I have to solve? And it's yeah, so, so a couple of things. Uh, um, first is that um, w whenever there, there is a test uh, that's done, um, the result is given to the property owner, so they have that. Um, just re related to if you may have a lead service line, so um, by the end of this calendar year, DEP will be publishing an online map uh, of all 900,000 properties in the city and, um, and list the, as based upon our records, what type of service line they have. Um, the other thing is too, uh, the, the, there's a box there um, on, on the table uh, in, in in, in front of uh, uh, Chair Carnegie, I guess that is, I can't see exactly who's in front of, um, which is a, a free lead testing kit, and by calling 311, DEP will provide you with a, a kit. Uh, you can take a sample, there's, there's a, a mail response in there that goes directly to our laboratory in Kingston, it's a New York State certified lab, and you can get your water tested uh, to just know for sure if you may have any lead in it. All right, thank you, Commissioner, and thank you uh, all for your testimony. So we're going to uh, provide a, a five to seven minute break so folks can use the restroom and we will come back and when we're back, we're going to have Councilmember Ampri Samuel ask questions followed by Councilmember Chin and then we'll come back for a second round as needed.
Good afternoon, everyone. Please find a seat. We're going to start shortly. Everyone, please find a seat. We are going to start shortly. Okay, we're going to restart this hearing. Shh. We're going to restart the hearing. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna uh, resume the hearing. Uh, just uh, quickly before I uh, turn it over to uh, Chair Amprey Samuel of the Public Housing Committee. Have any of you seen this report called Lead Loopholes? Have you read I it? Have. I have, yes. I mean, they make some very significant points of failures and gaps in enforcement and I'd love to, I would love to hear a response at some point to, to what's identified in here and if you agree with what advocates have pointed out as serious gaps. So uh, that's a conversation I would like to have. I want to turn it over to uh, Chair Amprey Samuel. Good afternoon, everyone, and, and thank you for um, this important hearing to all of the chairs. I, just for the record, I do have a bill as part of the package, and it's um, Bill A68 that's um, related to the remediation of um, lead in um, water within the multi-dwelling. And so, um, but I'm actually, I have a few questions related to NYCHA. Um, but I first want to point out that to Commissioner Barbeau, I had a little bit of concern with your testimony um, and just the language of it. I just have to state that right now. On page seven, you state, if New Yorkers are concerned about their water, then they can request a free testing kit via 311. And I just want to point out that in that statement, you're saying if New Yorkers are concerned, then this is what they can do. And we as a body, we as members of the New York City Council, and just public servants, and, and I would think in, in your position as well, it's not whether New Yorkers are concerned. I'm concerned, and we should all be concerned. And we should start to get away from um, being reactionary all the time and figure out ways to prevent a child from becoming sick and figure out ways to really protect our children. And so I just wanted to highlight that we should all be concerned and our focus should be on how do we prevent this so that we don't have to hold five and six hour hearings to figure out a way to cure, right? And so um, I just wanted to highlight that because it disturbed me a bit when you were going through your testimony. Okay. Councilwoman, I think your points are very well taken and um, I wanna assure you that we take this seriously and we take every measure to protect the water um, and perhaps a better choice of words if they wanna be reassured um, might be a, a different way, but certainly in no way intending to minimize the anxiety that there is around these issues and the fact that we are and will remain committed to ensuring that we are transparent and that we address issues and that we look for ways to push ourselves. So I appreciate those comments and I agree. Thank you. Okay, and in your comments again, you talked about transparency. Yeah. You talked about ensuring New Yorkers, right, about safety of our children. And so that brings me to my questions um, for NYCHA. Because of the ongoing um, concerns related to transparency, related to tracking, related to account accountability. NYCHA residents are just, and New Yorkers and the council body, we're just not um, comfortable in what has been reported in the past. 
And so um, just to, to put on the records today, um, I would like to know what is, can you provide us with an update um, related to your lead abatement and testing and, and, um, and what's happening um, since we've last had conversations related to lead. So the first question, your inspectors are required to have certain certifications to remove lead. Where are you in that process to make sure that all of NYCHA inspectors are certified and if the work is being done in a timely manner? So Councilwoman, actually before um, our, our veto begins, let me just sort of uh, reiterate that from the Health Demar Department's perspective, in the vein of transparency, we have been posting data on our website. Previously, we had not been posting data based on whether uh, these were results from public housing or private housing because we treat all landlords the same. Recognizing that there are concerns, we've now started issue, uh, reporting that data broken down. So I want to just sort of um, assure the, the, the committee, the, the chairs, um, all of us that um, irrespective of a landlord, we were treating all children the same. Okay. Okay. And I'm, sh I'm, and I'm aware of the 97% number. I'm aware of that. But again, those are numbers that have been reported, and there's been some questions about the reporting. Okay. So, and um, again, my name is Vito Mustachillo, General Manager for the Housing Authority. Um, and I agree with you. There is absolutely no question that our residents are, are confused, um, and they're, they're afraid. And that we need to be much more transparent, um, not just when dealing with issues regarding lead-based paint hazards, but about everything that we do, uh, about what the future plans are for for uh, for their buildings, uh, about repairs that we're being um, uh, that we'll, will be undertaken. Um, so we are looking at, at wholesale at, at how we should be more transparent as an agency. Um, there was a, a major announcement um, as part of the mayor's Vision Zero. Um, regarding lead-based paint hazards, and this is where the authority is going. Right? Uh, we feel strongly that we need to, to be lead-free. Right? Um, the mayor announced that we will be proactively XRF testing um, approximately 135,000 units in the upcoming years, um, starting hopefully within the next six months. I'll have questions about the but number it's about of transparency, units though. Okay. We, we plan on making that, that information publicly available. Right? It's important that people know what the results of those tests are. Right. You asked about, um, I believe, uh, about our, the qualifications the for staff, certifications. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, any staff that work for the authority that perform abatement work or oversee ab abatement work, they have the, the proper EPA certifications. Right? We ensure that they do. Right? That is a requirement. Right? For the visual inspections, which I think is a little bit different, and I'm not sure if you're asking about the visual inspections mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. So for visual inspections, primarily, we use outside vendors, outside contractors. Right? They are required to provide us with the um, HUD certification, the training certification, for all of the staff that perform the visual inspections. We've also undertaken a major campaign to get a lot of our staff um, provided with the same training. So we also have in-house staff who are HUD trained right, to perform the visual inspections as well. Do you have the number of how many of your staffers who are doing this work are, the, the number of them that are actually certified? Like, uh, just give me visual, the number of the, the number of employees who are going out I, I, and doing inspections, and the number of outside contractors that are doing it as well. Right, how many? Avita, who's joining you? I'm sorry, this is uh, Shireen. What, what's her position? Oh, sorry, um, <laughs> Shireen is the uh, director for our lead program. Of what program? Lead. Lead. Oh, thank you. Right. Would it be helpful for you to speak directly? To answer sure. I, 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 is Were you sworn in? I yes, was she was. Warning. Thank I you. Was warning. Is the microphone picking me up enough? No, you can okay. video if you can Thank move you. back. So. Thank you. Um, so we do use a vendor um, to do the visual assessments, the annual visual assessments that are required. That is being done um, by a vendor. Um, and um, I believe the GM was speaking to additional staff that we are looking to, and we are um, having them trained to receive the HUD certification as well for just ongoing activities to make sure that they're aware of um, what deteriorated paint should um, look like as well. Okay, so how many people were hired through this outside contractor, and how many of them will are looking to be certified or 
through the HUD certifications or whatever is required. I'm just trying to get some numbers sure. here. So we can provide you with the number of staff that our vendor is using mm -hmm. uh, to perform the visual inspections. Okay. It varies based on, on um, uh, how many inspections we've asked them to conduct. So they may bring on additional staff. Okay, so right, let's step back the, then. The so let's, can you describe to me the actual process? So how many units are you looking to, I know the number sure. of, that you are looking to, um, to inspect. So, so, the, the, so let's, so explain to us how many units have already been inspected and where are you within that process? Sure. And what's your timeline? So for this year's cycle of, mm -hmm. of visual inspections, um, we are estimating that approximately 48,000 departments okay. require visual inspection. Right. Presently, about 8,000 of those have been inspected. Okay, so for this year, you have 40,000 more. About, we have about 40,000 to, to go, correct. Okay, and so how many people will be conducting these inspections? So currently, the vendor, I believe, is using about 30 staff members okay. to conduct those. And that's 30 NYCHA staffers? No, that, that would be 30 contracted staff. Okay, right. and so how many NYCHA workers will be involved in doing the inspections? <clears throat> Do, is there a number of NYCHA workers that will be at all so, so partaking in? We have development staff that are available to assist the contractor, the vendor, um, with the inspections. So again, depending on how many inspections they plan on performing in a given day, we will allocate an appropriate number of NYCHA staff to assist the vendor. Okay, and when did you, st so the goal for the year is 48,000 and you've done 8,000, and when did you start? August 31st. Yes, thank uh, August 31st. Mm -hmm. So the goal is 48,000 for the year? Mm -hmm. For the calendar year. For the, okay, and are you tracking? I mean, are you on track with this? Yes, with we are. Inspections? Okay. Okay. And the next question is for um, the relationship between DOHMH and um, NYCHA. DOHMA issues the commissioner order to abate. How do you follow up to make sure that NYCHA is doing what they're supposed to be doing? Um, and as part of our investigation, uh, after we uh, look every day to identify children with elevated blood lead levels, and we contact the family and we go to their, make a, an appointment with the family to go to their home and do um, an investigation. The first part of that investigation is a risk assessment and the second part is environmental sampling. In that environmental sampling, we use our XRF machine, the X-ray fluorescence, the handheld X-ray machine. If we identify lead paint, then we issue a commissioner's order to abate. That's our process for any landlord. So we issue that order um, to the landlord, whether it's NYCHA or in the private housing sector. And then we do follow up to make sure that that commissioner's order is followed. We always have um, compliance with our order um, in NYCHA. And as I noted before, in the private setting, if we don't get compliance, then we refer that to HPD um, which uh, does the work and bills the owner. And the relationship with HPD and um, NYCHA, are you working together as an agency at all? Like, uh, because there are so many, it's just, well, there's 97% that are outside of NYCHA. And so um, there's a level of expertise, it seems, um, or should be within your agency. So are you working at all with NYCHA on um, like best practices or, or reporting back to the city because of our ongoing issues with reporting and tracking? Um, it's been important to us at HPD, of course, to um, be in partnership with NYCHA um, as much as possible. That happens across um, um, many, many different um, uh, programs. Um, probably, however, um, and not to embarrass um, the new general manager, um, but the um, having um, Vito as a new general manager as part of the new leadership um, at NYCHA, um, uh, the three decades worth of experience in the implementation of Local Law 1, and all that has worked in identifying maybe things that may not have, that is the type of expertise and commitment that he is bringing as um, a, a leader at HPD now to NYCHA. 
um, but in addition to the um, that happening on the highest levels, um, I know that um, our teams sit all the time. In fact, I think more recently there was a meeting of our respective technology teams um, about um, uh, uh, ways um, sharing information and certainly sharing best practices. So um, that is happening and is something that we'll continue to do to make sure that we are um, working in partnership as much as is feasible. Okay. And whenever I am in a meeting with NYCHA, my constant um, concern is um, making sure that we have residents at the table that um, can serve as like a checks and balances. I've said this over and over again at nauseam because um, it, it seems as though when we get to a point where um, there's follow-up or um, again accountability, we only know what's really happening when a NYCHA resident is telling us what's happening or what's not happening. And so um, what is the um, direct um, conversation and communication with the residents as it relates to all of the work that's happening? Certainly, and, and look, this is another area where we need to improve on um, our communication with our residents. Um, and and look, they are our most valuable resource, and I feel deeply about that. And they're still confused, right? and we need to, to be clear about the steps that we're taking. Um, we have implemented, and earlier when the speaker asked about uh, collaboration or meetings with um, advocacy groups. Um, what I failed to mention is that what we started a few months ago was a roundtable, a committee of, of experts um, specifically fo focused on lead-based paint hazards. Uh, the health department has a member um, on the committee, um, as well as we have a resident leader. Right? We need to expand that. There is no question. We need to be more involved with our residents and be more informative. Okay. And um, one last question, and it's related to the 30 staffers that were hired with the outside contractors. Um, how many of them are NYCHA residents? That I don't know, but we can certainly um, get that information back to you. And again, that number varies. It may be 30 today, but if our <laughs> need changes tomorrow, they may either bring on additional resources or scale back. Okay. Um, I would like that number because that goes back to making sure that we have residents that are um, involved in the process at Agreed. the table as well as employment opportunities. So, thank you. Uh, thank you, <clears throat> Councilmember Ambry Samuel. I just want to clarify before I throw it to Councilmember Chin. Who, so HPD has a level of enforcement oversight on NYCHA or not? Um, so as it relates to Local Law 1, and it's the same um, for the housing maintenance code because our, um, historically our mission is with private, um, privately owned housing, so we do not um, enforce local law one or the housing maintenance code at NYCHA. So Vito, so who polices NYCHA? NYCHA polices itself? I'm, I'm, I'm asking not in an aggressive, I'm trying to figure sure. out who has oversight over NYCHA when it comes to this. HPE doesn't do it. DOHMH gets involved and does an investigation if there's a child who tests positive in a certain way and conducts that investigation. But, but HPD talked about earlier in the hearing issuing violations, uh, uh, doing remediation, uh, doing all of that work, which I think there are significant gaps to fill in that work, but they talked about that. Who does that for NYCHA? NYCHA does it for itself. So we, we do our um, in inspections, we do perform our repair work, um, whether it be remediation or abatement uh, internally, but we do um, have to answer to um, and inform uh, both local as well as state and federal um, oversight authorities, uh, which would include EPA, um, HUD, um, the State Department of Health, the City Department of Health, um, and, and HPD. Do, do you think that given um, your experience in your previous role before you, God bless you, went over to take the role that you're in now, do you, in your time doing the work you had done for decades at HPD, do you think it would be appropriate, separate and apart from a federal monitor, which is a separate conversation, uh, do you think it would be appropriate to actually have um, some other entity besides HUD and the EPA, which are 
you know, federal agencies of a huge scale who are dealing with lots of different issues. Do you think it would be appropriate to have some other agency have a level of oversight over NYCHA just for good practices, long, long after you're gone, long after I'm gone, good government oversight, do you think it would be appropriate for there to be another entity having oversight on NYCHA when it comes to this? So specifically with respect to lead-based paint issues, um, there is oversight. Um, the Department of Health, um, they respond to, um, uh, to uh, cases of elevated blood load levels. No, but that's after we failed. That, that's what I said earlier. That's when, that's when things have already gone you know, wrong. I'm talking about in the lead up to that. So what I would say is that our plan moving forward right, is an aggressive plan. Right? And I think it does address any concerns that anyone should have um, with respect to independent or outside oversight. Right? Again, the vision that we have is to be lead free. Right? We are moving aggressively towards that. Um, we are implementing new policies. Right. Um, in addition to what I mentioned earlier about the, the um, XRF testing of approximately 135,000 units, which goes above and beyond any city, state, or, or federal requirement, right. um, we are um, being much more transparent about what we're doing. Right. We have just recently embarked on a, a new tra a training program for our staff. You, you're not answering the question. Do you think that there should be an outside entity that has oversight in this way that HPD has oversight on private residences? Should there be an entity that has similar oversight over NYCHA when it comes to these um, issues? And, and I think that exists today. Um, By who? Well, the, we, we do get violations from agencies. We are not exempt from receiving violations. Agencies do inspect our buildings. Right? So it's not as if we are exempt under any statute. Um, so there is oversight. And more importantly, our residents police us. Our residents are the best check and balance for us. Right? And they're strong. And trust me, they are vocal um, when we are not in compliance. So uh, I know that you and uh, Stan yesterday spent time listening to NYCHA residents who came to speak uh, to Judge Pauly about conditions in their apartments. I know that you uh, went and spent time at a town hall in Queensbridge houses uh, on New York One the other night. You and Stan listened to different resident leaders about some of the concerns that they had. And um, the, the thing that I would say is I do think that NYCHA residents have done a great job at pointing out where there have been major deficiencies in the past. I'll tell you that, you know, when I've gone out, um, I have two NYCHA developments, the Robert Fulton houses and the Elliott Chelsea houses in, in my district. And when I visited with uh, Chair Amprey Samuel to Van Dyke, two houses, and I visited with Councilmember Traeger to Gravesend houses, when we walked through, there was in many, many apartments, I mean, just visually, uh, with children in the apartments, small children, there was visually lots of paint that was flaking, cracking, falling off of walls and ceilings. Um, and so that is why I say in an institutional way, moving forward, um, even if residents are uh, reporting these things, even if residents are complaining, um, given the enormity of the challenges that NYCHA faces when it comes to funding, when it comes to mold remediation, when it comes to lead paint, when it comes to all the things that you guys are simultaneously trying to fix, institutionally would it be helpful if, if there was an entity that was overseeing this in some way so we're not relying upon residents and you all are dealing with an enormous set of challenges. And I guess what you're saying is, you, you know, you don't feel comfortable saying that at this time, and you think that there is an appropriate level of outside oversight currently on NYCHA when it comes to lead paint. I, I do feel that way, sir, and, and I think we also need to kind of see what happens with respect to the consent decree and with the appointment of a federal monitor. Okay, a few very quick questions. How many XRF machines do we have, does the city own and use? Go ahead. HPD 
Has 100 XRF machines at this time. Has 100? Yes. Okay, and DOHMH? I'm checking. Sir, well, they're checking. We have two. You have two? Yes. We have about 25. You have 25. So uh, it, it sounds like you probably need more than two. And, right? We, we believe that two is sufficient for, um, for what you, we need them for. We are contracting a lot of these um, functions out. So do, can agencies share XRF machines with each other if there's a need, if HPD's not using all 100 of them and DOHMH and NYCHA need those XRF machines? Is there a willingness to collaborate in that way if it's legally possible? Or you don't think We're it's necessary? You have what you need. Well, we're using our XRF machines, and I'll say that we're also acquiring more as we ramp up in our new program, and we're hiring, um, we've hired uh, 35 additional inspectors to, to do our new intervention work. We'll be buying new XRF machines. So I don't think I'll be able to help because we need them. How, uh, uh, Deputy Commissioner, how many investigators do you have right now doing investigations when a child does have elevated blood levels? So right now we have um, 10 uh, staff who are doing the investigations for children with an elevated blood lead level. Three are finishing up their training, and we have, uh, following the July 1st announcement where we're expanding our program, uh, we have hired 35 more, and we're going to begin uh, training our first class of those new inspectors uh, so, the week after next. So I think that's a big deal, that you're hiring 35 additional people uh, to do this work. I think that's important, and I'm happy to hear that today. How many HPD inspectors uh, are specifically doing this type of work on inspections on uh, lead paint? So we have 57 inspectors dedicated in our uh, lead-based paint inspection unit. We also have uh, probably four or five in our, our alternative enforcement program. Um, and we also have within our emergency repair program staff who are qualified to use the XRF machine. And I can get you the exact number from that. Uh, Does program. the staff that's conducting those lead paint inspections do any other type of tasks, or they only focus on lead? They conduct lead inspections, but they can write any other violation of the housing maintenance code. So they are specifically responding to lead complaints or lead referrals after we've seen peeling paint in a child under six, but that is not the enormity of their task. Do you, believe, do you believe you require additional staff to do the work that you need to do, or you're fine with the staff level you have? As with the health department, uh, we are hiring new staff related to the change in the elevated blood lead level. In addition, we have quite a number of vacancies at this time. How many um, new staff are you hiring? Uh, we are currently bringing on a class of 30 inspectors who are in our training program right now. And we have, I believe, an additional 30 to 40 vacancies. I feel like you all buried, buried one of the leads today, which is 35 new in investigators from DOHMH. 30 more people at HPD doing this work. I think that's a big deal in combating some of the issues we've been talking about today. And let me, let me clarify that those new inspectors, some will be assigned to the lead unit, but some will be assigned to just our regular, either proactive enforcement or borough office inspections. Okay, Councilmember Chin. Thank you, Speaker, and uh, thank you to Chair Levine. Uh, Carnegie and Constantini for holding this important oversight hearing on an issue that so many of the residents in my district and across the city are forced to endure every day. I want to start with one number, 2,750. That number is the number of time of levels of lead dust exceeded the safe limit in a building in my district. And that was due to negligence of an unscrupulous landlord, and that was back in 2014. I still have buildings in my district that has over a hundred times um, the limit of lead. And this is the construction dust that spreads lead throughout the building, apartments, and I've been working with, you know, groups like Cooper Square Committee um, to really advocate for this tenant and make sure they're protected. So there's two bills that I have introduced, um, 873 and 874, particularly with intro 874. Um, it talks about interagency coordination. Uh, when construction work is happening and lead dust is being blown into residential units in common area, and 
It also allows the city to issue a stop work order. In the building that I talk about with the 2,750, the landlord racked up a lot of violation and it was very hard to get an inspector, inspection. We had to get NYPD involved. Um, but this cannot happen. But in my district and maybe, maybe in the other district, we have a lot of old buildings. They are being renovated because of gentrification. Um, and according to local law one that was <coughs> passed, that landlord is supposed to give pre-notification to the Department of Health if they're doing any kind of construction work that's more than so-called 100 square feet or the removal of two or more window in a pre-1960 building. So they must file some notice with the Department of Health. Um, and this rule applied to any and all construction work that disturbed the paint. So do you have any statistics of how many landlord have filed um, the pre-notification with Department of Health? every year. So Councilwoman, uh, thank you for bringing up this issue. Uh, in addition to all of the work that we do and that we've talked about in terms of uh, protecting children in their homes, we are also concerned about safe work practices. And uh, we want New Yorkers to know that if they have concerns about uh, work practices that may not be safe, they can always call 311. I'm going to let Deputy Commissioner Schiff talk about the details of uh, how we go about that work and the degree to which we collaborate with our sister agencies. But I want to assure you that uh, in each and every one of these situations, we take it very seriously. In addition to the work that we've uh, had an opportunity to talk about where we investigate children with an elevated blood lead level, we also have a program um, to investigate uh, unsafe work practices. And as, as you know, Council Member, it can, be, uh, uh, can create a risk of exposure for children when there is work being done in an apartment when it's not, it could be construction or renovation, when it's not being done safely in accordance with safe work practices, which is essentially to contain uh, dust, to put up barriers, to, and to clean up. And so we do a lot of work um, responding to complaints. Um, when, we, when we receive a complaint, we go out and we do an investigation. If we see that the work is not being done safely in accordance with those requirements, we direct that that work be stopped, uh, that, that it be cleaned up, and it, that it can resume only if it's done safely. And in the meantime, we take, at, during that inspection, we take a sample of the dust and, and send that to a lab so that we can determine whether there is there is lead, and if we find that it is leaded, then we will issue a stop work order and require that the work be done in accordance with safe work practices and that dust wipe samples um, be submitted to us. We monitor that work, we post notices in the building so that uh, tenants, uh, the, com the complainant and other um, tenants serve as our, our eyes and ears. Uh, in between inspections, they will call us and we'll go back um, and we will issue violations. Um, we are, uh, we've, we have recently um, launched, we're, we're interested in, in uh, drumming up work, um, so we would um, appreciate the, in your district if there is construction and people don't know where to turn, we want, we want to get the word out that we take 311 complaints and we will act on those. We've recently uh, launched a, a media campaign, we'd be happy to get you some of our materials. Um, targeting areas of the city where we know that there is construction and, and renovation work happening and we're not getting as many complaints um, as we think we should be. Um, so this is an important part of our work and we, have, we are supporting the intent of your bill to make sure that the agencies are coordinating and using all of the city's resources. Well, how are you coordinating this say, with the Department of Buildings? Um, and when work is, renovation work is being done, um, usually the land will have to get a permit. Um, and, and goes back to my first question, part of Local Law 1 is this pre-notification um, that the landlord have to do to Department of Health uh, when they're doing renovation that would disturb the paint. Well, how many of these uh, notification, pre-notification have Department of Health ever gotten every year? So I don't, I don't have those, those numbers. Um, 
with me. Um, but we know that those are underreported, and it's a tool that um, I, that local law, law one um, designed. But I think we could work together to figure out how to strengthen it. It's difficult for us to take a, a mailing from from someone doing development and and use that to tr to target where our enforcement should be. I think there's probably some strategies that we can update since 2004. Um, and in the meantime, we are really urging New Yorkers. Um, to use 311, and we, we want to hear those complaints, and we will go out. But I, I want a more proactive um, way of doing it, because um, Department of Building have to get the permits. So if they are getting these permit requests, isn't there a way to, if, DO, uh, if Department of Health is not getting what you're supposed to be getting, uh, these pre-notification that landlords are doing renovation especially in these old buildings that would kind of disturb the lead. At the same time, Department of Building is supposedly getting permit requests. So that's what we're talking about, interagency coordination. That could be a proactive approach that Department of Building could inform Department of Health if Department of Health is not getting direct information from landlords who are doing renovations. Good afternoon, Councilman. Let me just start by saying I have not yet been sworn in. The council will swear you in. Can you raise your right hand? Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and respond on honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Patrick Whaley. I'm the Assistant Commissioner for External Affairs at the New York City Department of Buildings. At the outset, I just want to stress that the regulation of construction work in an effort to protect the safety of the public is of paramount importance to the Department of Buildings. And along with that is our serving as a resource to our partner agencies as it relates to public health. Now specific to your question, council member, the bill that you sponsored, along with some of the proposals that have been outlined in the report that the speaker just recently referenced, uh, many of those things speak to greater collaboration across agencies. Um, as a general matter, the department and the administration recognizes that there's room for growth in that regard. And we support the idea of working together to find greater means to improve the collaboration across agencies. One of the recommendations outlined in the report would require these pre-filings with the Department of Health to be shared with the buildings department upon this, the seeking of a building permit. That's not a bad idea. And we're now in the process of reviewing that, along with the legislation that you sponsored. And again, we think they're well-intentioned. Um, they're certainly worth further consideration. The Billings Department is discussing the, that bill, along with our partner agencies. We'll be doing the same with these other pro proposals. We look forward to doing the same with, with the Council, all in an effort to identify a path forward that you know, improves collaboration and recognizes that there's a means in which we can do a better job recognizing these issues. <coughs> But we know, and you know, that this is really rampant. I mean, landlords are using construction as harassment, trying to get rid of tenants. Uh, and, you know, we've been working with advocates and community-based organizations and organizing tenants. But the frustration, a lot of time, it, it just takes so long. So Finally, when the coordination happens, it's good. But it takes a while. Understood. And we want to speed up that process. There is, I want to interject. What, what how many landlords have faced consequences for doing what Councilmember Chin just said? I want, to, I want to understand how many building owners and landlords have faced consequences for what Councilmember Chin just said. Can I get a number? Um, I, can, uh, I can tell you about our unsafe work uh, investigations. We, we, in uh, 2017, received, uh, or annually receive about 775. Um, and in 2017, we issued uh, 389 violations and 24 stop work orders. So as I said, we are anxious to do more of this work. Um, we appreciate your, your, the ideas in your bill um, to be able to, to address these issues. And, um, and we are uh, looking t for your help and in, in our launching this media campaign to let New Yorkers know that we are a resource for them and we want to be following up um, where there is uh, work that's being done in people's apartments that's not being done in compliance with safe work rules. As it relates to the building department, broadly speaking, we perform inspections on close to 100,000 complaints and about close to 200,000 inspections as it relates to the development. The buildings department does not issue violations specifically related to lead. 
when we, as part of our work, when we uncover or realize that there might be lead-related issues, we make referrals to the Department of Health and HPD to perform their investigations and inspections. How can we get Department of Health to issue the stop work? If you have that authority to issue a stop work order, how do we get you to do that as quickly as possible? Because by the time, usually when the tenant notify us or notify the Department of Health, it's been happening for a while. And if the Department of Health comes in there, can you do an immediate um, examination to kind of like stop the work? Because what happened is the work continue until you get the, your report back. And then all of a sudden, wow, it's 100 times more, 2,000 times more. And people already kept breathing in the same toxic air for days and weeks. Uh, do we have an answer to that question for Council Member Chen? So when we go out and we do an investigation where there's been a complaint of a stop of a unsafe work practices, we do direct that the work be stopped uh, immediately, that it be cleaned up, and that it can resume um, only if those safe work practices are resumed. And, that, and so we take immediate action while we wait for the results of the dust wipe sample. Now, what happened if the, the landlord did not follow? I mean, the, the tenant calls you or calls us and we let you know, hey, the work continues again. Um, so once we have the results of the dust wipe sample, then we'll know really what, what's, uh, what is in that dust, and then we will issue the order. And then if it's not complied with, um, we will issue violations, um, and we'll, we will continue to monitor that. I think what's in your bill is to strengthen the coordination so that we can harness all of the resources that the city has, and we're, we're anxious to work together um, and to work with you because we, we agree that there's, there's more, more that we can do here. Yeah, we want to be proactive. And that's what I'm saying with the Department of Buildings, right? When you get a request for permit and it happens, do you, in the request for the, the permit, do you know if a building is an older building? So with the request for a permit, there's information obviously we receive. Age of the building is part of the information we have. But regarding the pre-filing that may occur with the Department of Health, that is not disclosed on the permit application that's filed with the buildings department. So again, that's in keeping with one of the suggestions that was made in the report in an effort to improve that collaboration across agencies, and it's something certainly that we're considering. Well, that, that is something that is really important. If it is required by law, and local law, uh, for landlord to really do this pre-notification to the Department of Health in these older building, and they don't do it, that we really need to find a way to get that information and to make sure that yeah. tenants are protected. And we've passed law about having tenant, you know, landlord provide tenant protection plan, and oftentimes they don't follow the rules to do that. So we just got to make sure that these protections are out there, and we have to really be proactive about it. So I guess we'll we'll continue to talk and and make sure that we get these bill passed and and we move forward with stronger you know effort to protect tenants. I mean, it's my belief that if a landlord is a, and I don't want to generalize about all landlords, there are some very bad actors. Uh, you saw in the case of a gentleman by the name of Steve Croman, who was systematically harassing his tenants and doing all sorts of horrible things, that he, there were criminal charges brought against him. He's one of the few really bad actors that have faced criminal penalties. And if you are exposing families and children to toxic dust, and not complying with government regulations, there should be criminal uh, referrals involved to district attorneys and to other folks for continuing to put people at risk. So I would hope in the future there is a conversation not just about writing violations and interagency coordination, that's all well and fine, but if you have someone that continues to put people at significant risk in a systematic way with disregard to the health and well-being of New Yorkers and especially children, I would hope that there's more than just the bureaucratic processes that we follow, but more let's have serious consequences for these individuals that are doing this. Yeah, and also I think that part of Department of Building is that you have the authority to issue permits. And so I think you need to also, we need to really make sure that landlords and whoever's applying for these permit, if they have um, violate, lead violation, that you scrutinize them. 
and also after our permits. That don't just, you know, just uh, approve it, approve it, approve it, but really scrutinize uh, these applicants, whether they have violations and especially lead violation. So as, as part of our process, you, um, I imagine you're aware, to the extent that there's paint removal work that includes other scopes of work that require a building's permit, before the department issues that permit, the owner needs to have their design professional, licensed architect or engineer, submit what's called a tenant protection plan. That plan needs to provide the means and methods, as the name implies, for protecting tenants from that construction. Is there self-certification on that plan or not? Depending on the scope of work, yes, there can be. Well, there should not be self-certification. Yep. People lie. Yep. Understood. I, I, I understand. And it's, I want to also note that uh, you know, a percentage of those self-certificated plans are audited by the department to ensure compliance. Furthermore, for bad actors, folks who have worked without a permit, folks who have been convicted by a harassment through the courts, folks like that are not entitled to use self-certification. Um, self the New York Times just did an in-depth series four months ago showing how landlords lie constantly and how they get away with it, and how all levels of government, municipal and state government, have failed in holding them accountable as they exploit tenants and push people out of buildings by doing things like filing false documents. So I, I'm not gonna rely upon random audits to figure out if people are being put at risk or not. This needs to be totally strengthened. Yes, I agree. I mean, we passed law to, and that was a compromise, to do a certain percentage of audit. But I think that we really have to get rid of self-certification. You done, Councilmember Chen? Yes. Okay, Thank great. Uh, I just want to, before I throw it to Councilmember Cumbo, uh, uh, Commissioner Torres Springer, this report that I pointed out, lead loopholes, uh, states in it, that HPD enforcement data shows that New York City has never taken any enforcement action. I think Councilmember Levine brought this up earlier never taken any enforcement action against a single landlord for failing to conduct annual inspections in the 14 years since the law went into effect. As reported last November by Reuters, a review of the past 12 years of HPD violation records found the agency hasn't cited a single landlord for failure to conduct the annual inspections. We know landlords aren't regularly inspecting for lead paint hazards because tenants continue to complain about peeling paint and HPD continues to find and use violations for lead paint hazards that landlords haven't identified or remediated. <coughs> HPD has the power to ask for records of past inspections when it finds lead paint hazards and landlords are obligated to maintain records of inspections for 10 years. Yet the lack of violations indicate that HPD is not asking to see records of inspections. Without enforcement, negligent landlords will continue to violate the central primary prevention obligation with complete impunity, resulting in the continued exposure of vulnerable children to lead-based paint hazards. Do you disagree with anything that uh, I just read that's in this report? First, uh, Speaker, I'd like to thank the advocacy organizations um, who not just worked on the report, um, but really have been part of um, ensuring that as we have implemented um, Local Law 1, um, that we're doing that with an eye towards continuing to do better. And so we at HPD, and I think I can speak for um, colleagues um, across different agencies, share the goals um, of the um, organizations um, who drafted the report um, to drive uh, 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 lead blood level um, exposure down even more. Um, that while there are areas um, in what you read in, in, in the report um, that are um, areas that we would like to work together with advocacy organizations and with the City Council to identify where there are um, specific opportunities to better our enforcements, um, I do enforcement regime. Um, I do want to um, be very clear um, that the, um, the work that we have done thus far in implementation, um, I don't want us to forget um, uh, the, the statistics um, that show how seriously we take um, enforcement. So for instance. Not a single landlord, not one. But we not have. Not one landlord. Um, 
But let me, as I mentioned earlier, 300,000 violations over the course of the, since the inception of Local Law 1. 60,000 just in the past five years. And I think what's, what is important to know, speaking If someone that, gets caught drunk driving 10 times in a row, at some point you realize they're a hazard to the road and you do something criminally against them for exposing people to danger. If you're writing 300,000 violations, I assume that not every one of those violations is cleared up in an appropriate way. There needs to be more punitive measures as a deterrent against landlords that are bad actors mm -hmm. and exposing children to toxic dust and, and in a preventable way mm -hmm. that is poisoning them for the rest of their lives. I think it is shocking, and I don't know how it's defensible, mm -hmm. that not a single landlord in 14 years not one. I don't understand it. Well, let me, 300,000 violations. It's not just about other, violations. But there are also, um, yeah, Speaker, if I may, <clears throat> 2,200 cases that we have initiated in housing court since 2014 against landlords um, related to lead issues. So we are more than willing when it is necessary to throw the book at landlords who are not have you made any criminal referral have you made any referrals to district attorneys um, we have um, as it relates I will check specifically to lead but as you mentioned earlier um, the war, uh, we are part of um, uh, a number of very aggressive task forces together with city agencies and with state agencies so that if, if there is a track record of the types of behaviors that none of us want to see with our landlords, that we're not just pursuing civil penalties, but we are pursuing criminal ones. And that work that we've done with task forces has led to certain landlords going to jail. It doesn't feel like this is what I would characterize as throwing the book at landlords. I want to turn it to Majority Leader Cumbo. Thank you, Speaker Johnson. And as I'm hearing the testimony, as a, as a new parent, I feel like angry um, at what I'm hearing. This is really, so my son went for his one-year-old appointment and at the one-year-old appointment, from what I understand, it is the law that they would have to get tested for lead. Is that correct? Yes, New York State law requires that any child, uh, irrespective of where they live, must be tested for lead at one and two years of age, and then beyond that, that they should be screened for any potential risk factors that might expose them to lead. And if that screen is positive, then be tested again. So there was a number that came up earlier in terms of the fact that a certain percentage of New York City's children are not tested for lead. I believe that number was about 20% are not tested. How would that happen? Because that would seem like a very vulnerable population that's not being tested. Why does that occur? So um, as I mentioned earlier, the, the health department takes a number of different measures to try and drive down the number of children that don't get tested. We work collaboratively with community-based organizations that um, are, are serving families with young children. We work with provider, uh, medical provider organizations, and we work with the managed care organizations. Um, but the reality is that in spite of that, we still have children that are not tested. Why are they not tested? What happens? Are they not going to the doctor? I mean, from what I'm seeing, which is an alarming number to me, the number of immunizations that a child needs just to enter daycare is so pervasive that I can't imagine that a parent could go all the way up to kindergarten without ever having seen a doctor. Yeah, no, your point is well taken. And, and there are, uh, and I don't have the exact number, but a subset of those children would be children who are not connected to care. And so through our outreach efforts, we do work to connect them to medical services because really these tests should be done within a medical setting. Um, then there are those situations, and your point about immunizations is well taken because we have, as a city, 
fairly high rates of immunization for these young children. And so it stands to reason that they would also be lead tested. And I think so are these children also not receiving their immunization shots? Would you say 20% are also not receiving their immunization shots? So no, that I'm we not have saying that at all. I'm saying that. So some are getting immunizations and not lead. Exactly. And so that, that doesn't make then, sense. Well, it's. Because if you allow the immunizations, you're of the school that you're going to let your child get a lead test. It, it speaks to um, work still needing to be done to remind medical providers that irrespective of where someone lives and what perceived risk factors the provider thinks that child may or may not, there's no decision algorithm here. One-year-old, you just do it. And so I think it's important for us. Um, we're very interested in working with council to find even additional ways to um, get these kids tested. I'm not gonna get clarity quite on that answer, and so I, I, I'm gonna move on to other questions because I, I have many and I hope to get more clarity on those. So if a child tests positive for lead, does a five alarm go off in terms of notifying, let's say in my district, they live in Ingersoll houses, and they go to X, Y, and Z daycare center. So that child tests positive for lead. Is there then any notification for that child in that daycare center that either that daycare center needs to be tested or the children at that daycare need to be tested or the children in that particular development need to be tested because a child that lives there has tested positive? Does that happen? So on a daily basis, we get an electronic download from New York State of all of the lead tests that are done on any child living in New York City. That automatically excludes children who live in New York City but may have gotten their blood tested in New Jersey, for example. So that's a subset that we may not get but still have had their test. We then go through that and any child with a lead level of five micrograms per deciliter or higher, we then take action. For the five and higher, we issue guidance letters that go home to the family to educate them about the risks of lead, to have a risk assessment done, and we urge them to go to their doctor to have ongoing follow-up. That letter also goes to the provider. Who's any, the provider in this instance? The medical provider, sorry. Uh -huh. Any other of those um, situations, I'm gonna hand over to Deputy Commissioner Schiff to take you through an even more detailed uh, explanation of what that process then entails. Okay, this is very important to me. Sure, uh -huh. and for us too. This is the, the heart of what we do. Yeah. Um, so as Dr. Barbeau said. Can you speak more into the microphone, I'm sorry. Sure, yes. Uh, as Dr. Barbeau said, every day we get reports of uh, blood lead test results for children in New York City. We look at those every day. When there's a child with an elevated blood lead level, we very quickly are in touch with that family to make an appointment for a So my question was beyond the family because yes. you answered that question. The family is notified. Yes. Is, is NYCHA then informed in Ingersoll houses, you have a child that has tested for lead. We need you to do, we're coming out, everyone's coming out. This is a five alarm fire. We're gonna address this issue. What daycare are they at? This is an emergency. I, or is I, it just focused on the family and it's up to the family to remedy this issue? So, let, so And I just I, need I you to be succinct because I have more I, questions I will, to ask. I will do it succinctly. Dr. Barbeau described one piece of our intervention. There's more that I wanna make sure that, that we have a chance to tell you about. So we do that home inspection. It starts with a, a risk assessment. That's a very detailed interview. And with environmental sampling, which I think you know we go around the apartment with uh, XRF to, to determine whether there's lead paint on the wall. You're asking about other settings. So as part of that home investigation, we ask where else does that child spend time? If the child spends five hours a week or more, we do an inspection in that other setting. So if that child is in childcare, we will go to that daycare to do an inspection there as well. If we have found lead paint hazards in that apartment, you're asking what about the other apartments in that building? Correct. There are two things that I want you to know. One is that at the health department, we then do a match against our birth records to see if there's any babies in the building because we want to do preventive work. We'll do inspections um, in, the, in apartments to see whether there's peeling paint. That's regardless, that's without information about an elevated blood lead level. We're doing that as preventive work. If we're in a private 
setting, we're alerting uh, HPD that we, if we have found lead paint hazards, so we've issued an order, we're alerting HPD so that they can take action with respect to the rest of, their bil of the building. If it's in NYCHA, um, we're providing information to NYCHA. And I want to just be really careful about what I'm saying. We're, yes. We're providing information. You know, as you know, um, this is um, personal medical information about a child, and we take the, our responsibilities, our legal and ethical responsibilities, to protect that medical information um, very seriously. And so it's challenging to figure out how to transmit that information. So we're transmitting information when there's um, when there's an opportunity for there to be uh, a public health action. We're transmitting uh, information in a very confidential mm -hmm. way. But exactly the sorts of things that you're describing, those are a part of our routine practice. So I'm hoping because what often happens on panels is what's being reported on panel when you ask your constituents or residents, they're unaware of it. So what's very important to me in the remedy of this situation is that we inform NYCHA, and NYCHA does a complete testing anytime in any of their buildings a child tests positive. Identity of the child does not have to be known. Daycare, the same thing. Identity of the child does not have to be known, but a, a thorough investigation of that particular facility is important. So I just want to add two things. Um, we share information with NYCHA about elevated le levels in children only when lead has been found through the XRF, right? Because yep. Only in those situations. The other thing I want to assure you about is in daycare settings, in order to be licensed, uh, daycare providers need to uh, show certification that they are lead free. And on every inspection that we do, we check for intact paint. So let me ask you this question. What are the symptoms, particularly for people that are watching, because this was new to me as well, what we understand is that the symptoms of lead poisoning are irreversible. So what are the symptoms that actually occur when a child has been diagnosed with elevated lead paint levels, because uh, lead levels? Because I, going to the doctor, and no parent in New York City should even have to deal with this. I don't know if Steve or others dealt with this, but it's one of those things where you go there, you're terrified of what the results are going to be. And you shouldn't be terrified, but I run the water in my house. It's mustard colored for the first 30 seconds. So when you're going for the test, you're kind of like, did I let the water run long enough for a whole entire year so that I'm positively sure that my child's not going to have elevated whatever? I don't know. I have no idea until that test happens. So that's like scary on top of all these immunizations, on top of all these other things you have to worry about. What I want to know in this instance is what are, what, what are the symptoms of lead paint or, or lead testing and blood levels? What happens to a child's brain and their development? So Councilwoman, as, as a pediatrician who has uh, treated hundreds if not thousands of kids and dozens if not hundreds of kids who have elevated blood lead levels, um, I want to assure you, and you know, being in those intimate settings in the clinical exam room, our job as, as clinicians is to make that encounter as least stressful as possible. So um, I know where you're coming from, and, and we've tried to, to work on that. But the, the important thing here is we talk about transparency and data, but I think your point is very important in terms of transparency about what the implications are, right? Right. And are so, we talking about intellectual disabilities, yeah, mild, and, moderate, severe mental retardation, so what physical seen, disabilities, what happens? What we've seen in, succinctly. in the reduction since uh, introduction of Local Law 1 is not only a 90% uh, reduction in the number of children, but we have seen a significant decline in the actual levels. And so, for example, previously we used to see levels, you know, 45 and higher, and thankfully that's really a rarity now and in those very 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 high levels is when you would see the kinds of things that you talk about now now what we're talking about at the lower levels the fives and the tens are primarily related to 
behavioral issues, related to um, developmental issues. Potential. Describe what a developmental issue would be. Um, you know, it, it's, it's hard to predict. I don't know. No, no, I'm saying it's hard to predict, and every child is different. Um, so it may be, you know, mild delays in language development. It may that they be, ever recover from, or no? Because well, delays is a tricky word, and I've learned a lot about this. Delays is tricky. Delays can make you feel like eventually you'll catch up, but delays can also be permanent. And so again, it. It's challenging to make broad statements when we're talking about how individuals might be affected. Because I'm going to pretend that I'm a parent in a waiting room and you said my child has tested positive and you're explaining to me what could be the ramifications. Absolutely. And that's why it's so critical for us to ensure that the especially young children are connected to medical care because um, every parent should have the opportunity to talk one-on-one -on -one with their medical provider about what then, okay. in their particular situation, are the, the potential referral sources. Um, and there are programs through the health department, such as the Early Intervention Program, that families can be referred to in terms of supports for developmental uh, supports. So it's challenging, again. Um, but again, I, I want to go back to you know being a pediatrician and working with families. This is a scary thing, and, and at the health department, we see our responsibility to make it as less scary as possible, to share information, make ourselves available to any group who wants us to go out and do more outreach. So let me just ask you, because I've been told I've got to wrap up. What is the year that we're planning to get to zero um, our vision zero of this in terms of uh, elevated uh, lead levels. When are, we, when, are we, when are we scheduled to get to zero? Um, you know, that's a really good question. And I think that ultimately... Um, it's just a year. <laughs> <laughs> I think it'll depend to the, the degree to which we're best able to leverage the tools that we have. I think the answer is actually we will get to zero when we actually believe that this is a critical priority and that when children of color in particular are seen as a priority and it's not just some sort of it's okay for some children to walk around with developmental delays and disabilities and other children not. So let me ask you this is my final so, question. Council this is my final question on this. As, as someone if we threw the kitchen sink at this issue, is this is this an issue of money? If we threw everything we had at this particular issue, if we made this a, a critical priority, what would stand in the way of us reaching that zero level? Is it money? Is it resources? What is it? Because for me, I want to see this number come down to zero. And we have to strategize, what, do we, what would it take? What are the resources? Is money the issue? Is this a, is this a financial issue? Basically, that's my question. Is this a financial issue that we have said it's not a, a priority to us, and that's why this issue will languish throughout our communities? Is it a budget issue? So, Councilwoman, as a pediatrician and as someone who has spent her entire clinical professional career advocating for children, in no way, shape, or form do I want you to leave here thinking that we think it's okay for black and brown children to be disproportionately affected. I want to just make that clear. And I want to further emphasize that as city agencies, we're working collaboratively, and we know that there's still work to be done, right? And we're not going to stop. And that's why we're here, and we're open, and we want to figure out what are the ways in which we can get more momentum around this. This sounds good, but is this a budget issue? Yes. Councilwoman, I would say that this is a uh, an issue that is complex. It's not just about resources. You know, we haven't yet talked about different ways in which lead can get introduced through foreign products. This is, you know, not, we haven't talked yet about children who may come in from other countries that have less stringent requirements that protective laws that w than we do. So I think it's a much more complex issue. Okay, I'm going to close there and turn it over to my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Levin, followed by Councilmember Torres. Thank you, Speaker. Um, so I have uh, five areas I'd like to cover 
Um, and I'm we're putting get... council members on a clock for five minutes. Okay. Because we have right. a five o'clock hard stop here, okay. and we want to let every member of the public who's here testify. Okay. Today. So with five minutes, I'd like to move through this quickly, please. So. Um, uh, so first question uh, to you, Commissioner Torres Springer, regarding HPD. So the NILPI report says that not a single violation has been issued since the uh, enactment of Local Law 1 in 2004 for the failure of a, of a landlord to conduct an annual inspection. I just want to make sure, is that report correct? Has, there, has, has HPD not issued a single violation for failure to, uh, to conduct an annual inspection? And I, it's a yes or no question because I got to get through five topics here. So in five minutes, I'm already 30 seconds in. Um, the number of violations we've done is likely very small, but I think it's important. With all due respect, Council Member, I, I that, heard the first part. I got that when but you talked. That the the. The, the question is about violations. specifically violations of annual inspection. So that number will be small if um, zero. Be, is it one or zero? It's it's so we'll zero. We'll, is it, we'll clarify. But the, the annual inspections. Once, I understand. Zero, right. I understand. It's just a report. I just said because I got to get to five five topics right. here. Right. So, I will, we will confirm exactly what that number is. But it's low because we have focused our violation, our um, enforcement efforts, and therefore violations on making sure we are correcting but it is the repairs in the units to protect children. Okay. But if a if a if a landlord didn't conduct a uh, an annual inspection, that is indeed a violation of local law one. Is that right? It's within the within the, the parameters okay. of okay. local law one. Um, with lead tests, okay. So you're saying that 20% of kids, children, are not getting lead tests. Is that right? On, on when they're mandated to get lead tests uh, by New York State law. Is that right? That's, that's our best approximation. Okay. Is that is that because pediatricians are not are not? I mean, I can't imagine that 20% of children in New York City are not connected to a pediatrician, right? That can't be true. It's not exclusively, but it's, we think, a, a large uh, component. A one in five children in New York City is not connected to care? No, I'm not saying that at all. One, one in five children is not going to a pediatrician on their first birthday? I'm not saying that at all. Okay, so then, so then okay, but then, then, but then, but one in five children is not receiving not a, a lead tested. test They're at not their, at their first birthday? They're not getting, well, because the pediatrician is, is not giving, because the pediatrician is not complying with the age. New York State law, is that right? I'm sorry? Because the pediatrician is not complying with New York State law? What I'm saying is that, and what we've been saying, is that children under the age of three, roughly 20% of them have not been tested. Okay, and that's against the law. So somebody's not, so either, either the children are not connected to care, I can, th I can think of two reasons. Children are not connected to care, therefore they're not visiting a pediatrician, or they're visiting a pediatrician and the pediatrician is not complying with the law. I would also add that maybe they're getting their care in New Jersey, Connecticut, elsewhere. Okay. Okay. And I would also add that perhaps they're coming to the city um, from other countries, having they're gotten their care there. Okay. So there could be if, more than two reasons. Okay. I think New York City Department of Health needs to redouble their efforts on ensuring that every pediatrician in New York City knows that they need to issue or conduct a lead test for every child when they're mandated to by New York State law? Yeah, we, we do extensive outreach to a number of different uh, constituencies, okay. and we would, inc we would be happy to partner with you on okay. the pediatricians in your community. Okay. Does, is New York City conducting full inspections in private apartments and, and NYCHA, but NYCHA in private apartments, for children that show up with an uh, elevated lead level of 6 to 10, 6 to 9, under, under 10? So since 2009, New York City has been actually ahead of CDC recommendations. See, I'm sorry, it's a yes or no question because I have to get to another two topics here. So I are, are they current today conducting lead inspect in full-on inspections in apartments, actual inspections with an XRF, conducting the, you know, doing the paint test, um, paint inspection for children that show up with elevated lead levels between 6 and 10? Because 14 years ago, I went to a lead conference at SUNY Purchase and sat in a panel where they presented evidence that children have a, have a lower IQ when they have exposure that results in a blood lead level of 6 to 10. I remember that very clearly, and that was in 2005 or 2006. So, so we have evidence was there. 
I am not disputing that. So what I uh, want to share with you is the scheme that we have used for the last several years in terms of testing children based on risk. And all the way down to 16 months, we had been doing inspections for children with levels of eight and nine. Okay, how many, yeah, wanna, how many more I wanna, inspectors? I wanna, I wanna give Councilmember Levin uh, uh, two additional minutes. Thank you, thank you, Speaker. How many inspectors would it take, hired by the Department of Health, to conduct full inspections on every child that has an elevated level of five or above? And how many children annually are coming in with five or above, f between five and 10? Yes. Um, so uh, as uh, was announced on July 1st, we are actually uh, going to begin doing uh, home investigations for children with a blood lead level of five and above, uh, all the way up to uh, children under age 18. To do that, we, are, we have hired uh, since July 1st, we have hired 35 new inspectors. 35. Our first group of inspectors, uh, we did a really active outreach recruitment. We hired them uh, within three weeks, and we are starting our training program for our first group the week after next. Okay. Next topic. Um, so I started working on this issue in 2004 when I ran a lead safe house program in Bushwick. I see Matt Shashare here. Matt ran the program in northern Manhattan. Mm -hmm. um, are there still existing safe houses in New York City for children and families uh, who have been lead poisoned? You know, I'm not aware of any. I'm going to defer to Deputy Commissioner Schiff to see if she's... Um... And if not, where are, where are families going it, during the remediation process? Because I was operating under a state contract. That contract has since closed. I think there was a city contract at one point that other organizations had? So there is one uh, facility in New York City operated by Montefiore. Okay. And that's a city, that, I meant Montefiore had a, they were funded I think privately, right? They are funded by, by Montefiore, I remember. You've, you've, you've exceeded right. my knowledge. Okay. We can try to find that out for you. Okay, so, but the city's not funding it and as far as I, I remember they, that, that was a privately funded one. Not as far as. Okay. Not as far as we know. But you bring up a really important point. Where that, are they going? That children, you know, we don't, uh, from a clinical point of view, we don't uh, discharge kids to a, a site that we know is going to be ongoing exposure. And, you know, our, our team works to identify perhaps if there are other family members that can provide, um, you know, uh, a place for them to stay while it's done. Uh, there are different ways in which we work with families. Okay. By the way, I just want to give a shout out. She's just retired, but Deborah Nagin was, that's where I got my referrals Phenomenal. when I did my program back in 2005 and 6. But, um, thank she, you for just retired. So, yes, I want to. Yes. Thank you, Councilmember Levin. Thanks. Council and thank Mator you for your work. Councilmember Torres. Thank you. I just want to build on some of the line of questioning that's been pursued. What, what are the number of children who are among the 20% that have been tested at ages one or two? that have not been tested, never been tested at ages one or two? Do we know the exact number of children? Council member, if I understand your question, you're asking how many one and two year olds have not been tested? Exactly right. That's a, that's a number that we truthfully struggle to, to so get. So we know the accurate. percentage, but we don't know the actual number. It's our, it's our best approximation because it's- Do we have an approxim a numerical approximation? Do we know if it's tens of thousands of children, hundreds a, of thousands of children? It's about 20,000 children. 20,000 children, okay. Do we know the identities of those children? Uh, we don't, but what we will be doing um, is doing a match against our birth registry for those children where they have gotten their tests. And so we'll then know who hasn't. We're gonna do a mailing to them. It's one of the new but, initiatives. But historically, you've been unaware of the identities of the children who have gone untested, which means Not that you, you're in no position to conduct individualized outreach to those families in Not order to have those children tested. Right. Okay. Not that, individualized, but we do work with various communities to try and leverage uh, community-based okay. organizations that have a deeper reach. So, so once, you, once you establish that a child has lead poisoning and that the lead poisoning is connected to lead paint in an apartment, you pointed out earlier that you test all the babies in the building. Is that, did I hear you correctly? So we don't test the babies. 
but we go to their homes. We, go, we match against our birth records, and s as part of a preventive work, we go into that building and we do, um, we do an inspection in that apartment to look for lead paint hazards in, as a way to prevent exposure for those young children. So we're using our birth record data to do some preventive work in that building, but we're not do we do not do lead testing. But you don't see to it that the babies are tested? So there is information. Or Part of our work in, in making sure that providers and families know about uh, blood lead testing and when, that, when it's appropriate for that to happen, information goes out with the birth certificate to parents. So for those babies, we have, uh, you know, we have provided information um, along with the birth certificate, which the health department issues, about that blood lead testing. So from a developmental perspective, um, it's only until the baby, the toddlers, the children start crawling or start having hand-mouth behaviors that put them at risk. And so we're trying to take as protective approach as possible to minimize any unnecessary exposures. I, or any I guess, exposures. I, and I worry that the approach that the Department of Health takes feels reactive because you wait for a child to be poisoned by lead and then you expect why not proactively inspect buildings that have a risk of lead poisoning, right? If we know that a building is built before 1978 and it's run by a known slumlord and has a high ratio of violations per unit, like there are risk factors that we can identify to proactively inspect buildings that have a high, why do we wait for a child to be lead poisoned before intervening? So Councilman, I, I would um, review the fact that the city's approach to uh, lead poisoning prevention is a twofold approach. One is very much as what you're saying, prevention, and, and the best tool that we have is local law one. Um, but recognizing that there are situations when we have to respond, uh, we take a very vigorous approach in terms of the, the way in which we follow children. And then we try to identify opportunities where we can go even beyond those measures to try and uh, redouble our efforts at prevention because you're absolutely right. The best way for us to finish the mission that was started under Local Law 1 back in 2005 is to really push as much as possible on the prevention. I, I see my, my time is about to expire, but... Council Member, but, if I could... If, if uh, I, could I, just, I just want to... Uh, Council Member, we'll put an additional... When the clock yeah. expires, we'll put an additional two minutes on the clock for you. But... But just to respond, yeah. if, if I may, be, the, your specific question, yes, we do um, in, uh, take proactive measures for all of the special enforcement programs that we've worked with the council on, whether it's AEP or underlying conditions to... Yeah, but, but none of those are specific to lead, all right? I think when it comes to lead, you, DOH waits for a child to be poisoned by lead, and only then will you inspect the building. What I'm suggesting is we should proactively inspect before and a child is poisoned by lead. And that's what we're doing for many of these programs. And even before we get a lead complaint through 311, we are, if we are in a unit, looking for, um, um, looking for the potential presence of lead. And I just, again, I want to, if you're a child and you have a blood lead level of five micrograms per deciliter, you have more lead in your blood than what percentage of the population? citywide and nationally? I'm sorry, is that a question? That is a question, yes. Um, so uh, CDC has established five as a reference point. And as I'm asking about the percentage. So if I have a blood lead level of five micrograms per deciliter, if I'm a child and I have that level of lead in my blood, I have more lead in my blood than what percentage of the population citywide and nationally? I think the percentage is actually 2.5, but I'm not certain. Okay. So I actually know... 2.5? Yeah, 2.5. Okay. So I actually think it's 1.5 citywide and 2.5 nationally. And I guess my frustration with the health department is that if you knew there were thousands of children who had more lead in their blood than 98.5% of the population nationwide, and 98.5% of the population citywide, why did it take the administration five years to lower the threshold for public health intervention? So council members, since uh, 2009, we have been conducting risk assessments at the level of five. There were no home investigations at level five. So I could be a child and I could have more lead in my blood 
than nearly every single child in this country, and there were no home investigations from your health department. So we were conducting risk assessments since 2009. I'm not talking about, I'm talking about home investigations, where you're actually going into these apartments, you're interviewing the families, you're inspecting the conditions. Okay. Were there home investigations or not at level five? So at a blood lead level of five micrograms per deciliter, we've, we are launching those home investigations uh, as of July 1st. I'm just asking why did it take so long? It's an, it's it an, seems like a no-brainer to me that if, I, if I'm a child and I have more lead in my bl blood than 98.5% of the population, why were those children not a priority for home investigations? So we've been, as Dr. Barbeau said, we have been in ahead of the CDC in all of our public health interventions, including when we've conducted uh, home investigations. The city now, with this new intervention, is well ahead of CDC and ahead of really almost any jurisdiction in the country. I, I just feel like there's no apology, even though the department was clearly in the wrong. Can I ask one more question? H yes. Uh, HPD grants exemptions under Local Law 1. That's right. Is that correct? That's right. Before. We know that NYCHA had employees conduct lead abatements without proper training and certification. Before granting an exemption under Local Law 1, did HPD inquire if there was proper certification and training among those who conducted the abatement? Because if HPD had done so, the Housing Authority would not have gone as long as it did in conducting abatements without proper training and certification. Yeah. Um, what I do know, and if the Deputy Commissioner um, would like to go into more detail that I think could be helpful to the conversation. But the process that NYCHA um, follows as it relates to, the, to exemptions is the same process that any landlord who is seeking an exemption um, follows. And it's, it's quite rigorous. Um, and we have... Is it so rigorous that you ask whether it was done by a professional who was properly trained and certified. Absolutely. You asked that question. The documentation is required to be provided with the exemption form. So, so you inquire about the certification as, and training? As part of the application, XRF testing has to be provided. I'm not talking well about as, the testing. I'm talking about the well training and certification of the professionals who are conducting the abatement. As well as documentation regarding the XRF who took that test, as well as if an abatement was performed, documentation about that abatement, including the certification and an affidavit from the person who did that, that abatement. But if that's the that case, then, required. then if that's the case, if you were inquiring about the certification and training of the people conducting the abatement, how could it be that NYCHA went years without conducting abatements without proper certification and training? Something, I, someone that's either was NYCHA submitting false certifications to HPD as well, or did HPD not ask the question? I, I can't speak to, can't to speak any to that. specifics, so there has sir, but all of the documents are required as part of the exemption application. Clearly something went wrong. Um, that's the extent of my questioning. Uh, Vito, if you want to respond to Council Mayor Torres, you can. Sure, I just want to um, respond to that. Sorry, I think what we're confusing are that um, the issues in the past had to do with the um, proper training for visual assessments and for, for RRP training. Not only, I'm sorry, it was not only, it was visual assessments, remediation, and abatement. There was a period of time when employees at NYCHA were conducting visual assessments, remediation, and abatement without proper certification and training. It was not only visual assessments, it was all of them. Okay. All right. So I, I think we need to, to do some further research and, and, and get back to you on that. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Barron. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the panel for being here. Uh, my questions are for Commissioner Barbo. In your testimony, you indicated that um, because of the protections in our water system and existing state law and health code provisions related to testing of water in schools and childcare settings, uh, lead in the water does not present a meaningful risk to New Yorkers, and we do not consider water a significant source of exposure for children. Um, so if we have water system that in testing showed that 83% of the 1,544 buildings and indicating 33,000 faucets 
were a source of lead. Do you think that that's something that we should be concerned about? So Councilwoman, um, our water comes to us virtually lead free. And there are situations- I'm just talking about the specifics, the particulars that 83% of the pipes in the building, the 1,544 buildings representing 33 faucets that were identified as exceeding the level of 15 parts per billion to have lead that's what I'm, I'm not, I, I know the system is great and the water, I'm talking about those faucets that have lead. So in, I believe you're referring to the school system, correct? Correct. Yes, Schools. so um, in those situations, um, and I would ask my DOE colleague to, to join me. Yes. Um, there, the Department of Education has taken an extraordinarily protective approach. And the important thing to note here is that in many of these faucets, um, they are faucets that are in parts of the building that may not even be in contact where children are. And when they are found in, uh, let's say, bubblers or in kitchen faucets, they're taken offline until they're remediated. And we want to okay. ensure My time that is our short. children uh, know that water is the most preferred okay. beverage. So they're taken offline. That's not a solution. Okay. Well, it's, That's just it's, closing it's, it down. It's protective. So what are we going to do? What are we going to do? What's the plan, DOE? What's the plan? for the water so that good, has led. good afternoon, Councilwoman. Yes. Were, you, were, you, were you sworn in? No, I wasn't. Okay, the council will swear in. <clears throat> Raise your right hand. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank you. So first I want and to- And your name, please? Uh, Bill Estelle, I'm sorry. I'm the Executive Director of Thank School you. Facilities. So I want to start off saying that the uh, health and the safety of our children in New York City public schools is the utmost importance. Now. If you'd like, I'd go over the process of how we do our testing. So No, uh, we heard about the flushing, and then we knew we had to go back, and it was a much different result without the flushing. My question is, what's the plan? So I'll start with our testing, because what I'm going to describe is our plan. So we have a very aggressive and uh, comprehensive testing program. We test all the fixtures in all of our buildings, excluding the hot water fixtures. We have a very uh, aggressive, uh, what do you call, remediation program that involves removing the fixture. The remediation program involves fixtures that have been found to have an exceedance, over 15 parts per billion. So our remediation process includes the removal of the fixture and the piping to the wall. Any fixture that is found to have an exceedance is immediately taken offline. We have 104. We have 142,000 fixtures throughout our school. 99% of those fixtures currently have readings below the action level of 15 parts per okay. million. Okay, my time is running quickly. How many have you removed and replaced that we, were indicating that they had levels above the, uh, lead con contamination above the level? So we had approximately a little over 12,000 fixtures that had exceedance that. Okay. Now we're getting particulars. And how many have you replaced? We changed the fixture and the piping. So we changed them all. All of them. So all of those fountains are now open and being used. And you're saying that all of those fountains that had excessive levels no longer have excessive levels. So 99% of these fixtures have found to be below the action level, which means there's 1% out there currently that still have exceedances. That equates to approximately 1,100 fixtures, 434 of those being bubblers and fixtures that are used for cooking purposes. Those fixtures are shut off and are not shut off with a hand valve. They're shut off with a key and a yellow tag. Okay. Bill. Uh, two additional minutes Thank for Councilman Barron. The bill that uh, I'm introducing says that we should establish the lead levels that uh, are consistent with EPA, that there should be annual testing, parents should be given the results, and where there is an indication that uh, a system has still been contaminated, there should be an installation of a water filtration system or other measures to address that. What is your position? 
So I just want to touch, you mentioned that the parents aren't being notified. We are totally transparent in the Department of Education. All our results are po uh, posted online on the DOE website and also the school website. We send backpack letters home to the parents for every school, whether it is all clear or whether it has an exceedance with very detailed information. Matter of fact, the exact- So have the letters been sent to the parents to tell them that your child's uh, school's pipes have been corrected? Have they received that letter? Yes. If a school is all clear, we absolutely send that No, letter. no, no. Not if it's all clear. The ones that you said you replaced, were the parents notified via a letter? Yes. Okay. When I say all clear, that means all the remediation work is done, and we explain that. Okay. And so what is your position on the bill that I just described? Is this on annual testing? Correct. I would um, so, Councilwoman, um, specifically regarding the issue of the filtration, I think that we um, need to be mindful of uh, potential unintended consequences. These uh, filters... What might they be? These filters would require maintenance, and um, they may actually introduce... So it's uh, a matter of money to maintain them? Uh, no, it's not necessarily that. I think it's a matter of matching the intervention to the risk, and I think that... Well, you know, 1% risk is a little bit, but it's too much, because that means one child, perhaps, and that's too much. When we have the capacity and the ability to put systems in place that prevent it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, Councilmember Barron. Uh, Councilmember Levine, did you have anything uh, else you wanted to ask? Yes. Okay. okay. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. You know, um, other cities are starting to use um, data science to predict high-risk uh, locations. Um, based in part on the history of lead poisonings reported and age of buildings and other risk factors. Chicago is doing this, Minneapolis, now Flint. And um, some are communicating that information to OBGYN practitioners uh, so that they can communicate to expectant mothers and, and parents of newborns. Um, we also know that lead poisoning can be transmitted from a pregnant mother to a child and um, one of the bills is sponsored by Councilmember Rivera actually uh, seeks to codify a practice which um, we think is extremely important that when a mother, t uh, a, a pregnant uh, person, uh, tests uh, at elevated blood levels that an intervention is triggered as if it were a child, that we go to the home and other places where uh, the pregnant person frequents. Um, can you comment on the current practice about whether we are or could alert um, the OBGYN practitioner based on knowledge that the mother lives in a high-risk zip code and whether you support the bill that seeks to address this? Uh, thank you, Council. Thank you, Council Member. I'll, I'll begin and then I'll turn it over to Deputy Commissioner Schiff. Um, we are in support of this bill, and uh, it gives us an opportunity, to, as we did talking about the focus being on children, our focus being on safe work practices. I think this gives us an opportunity to also talk about the importance of focusing on women who are pregnant. Um, the, the risk factors in this population are different than they would be for children. and. Um, Primarily can be sometimes during pregnancy, women can develop something called pica, where they eat food that's not, or they eat materials that is not food, um, typically things like clay and, and whatnot. Additionally, there may be imported products that may put them at risk. And so um, we uh, are very much uh, in support of uh, doing more for, the, for these women, and I'm gonna turn it over to Deputy Commissioner Schiff. Uh, we haven't had much of a chance to talk about the work that we do for uh, pregnant women and uh, to reduce their exposure to, um, to lead and, and reduce their elevated blood lead levels. As we've, we've described that we get blood lead test results um, for children, we also get those for adults, and uh, prenatal screening for lead is, is part of that visit, and so we get those 
test results when we identify, we don't, we don't know from the blood lead test that it is a pregnant woman. Um, so we do, uh, what we, we um, reach out to all, uh, to adults. And when we learn that the woman is pregnant, we do um, follow up with her and her provider, her doctor, to reduce those sources of exposure. We've been using a threshold of 10 micrograms per deciliter, but as part of our program expansion, we'll be reducing that as well um, to a blood lead level of five micrograms per deciliter. The, as Dr. Barbeau has said, the exposures for, uh, for women, for pregnant women, are different from the exposures for children. So we would like, we, we are su in support of the bill to the extent that it would codify and have us do work for pregnant women. Uh, the, in the home inspection that we do for children is not one that we would need to do for pregnant women. We're not really concerned with with peeling paint. Um, what we do, we have uh, nurses in our program who are the ones who work with pregnant women and the providers. As Dr. Barbeau said, it's, we typically see things, it can be these pica behaviors or it can be products. There are, um, in, in some cultures, there, there are uh, traditional remedies that are specifically for pregnancy that actually contain lead. So we do a lot of um, education around that. We help women eliminate those sources of exposure. We continue to track um, her follow-up blood lead testing, we will track um, that, that newborn as well. It's a really important part of our, um, of our program, and we're happy to have our work codified. We want to make sure that the codification matches the, the science of, of how we should be doing these inspections. Thank you. And are we able to alert these uh, medical practitioners when the, the child appears to be born into a high-risk environment? Is this to your for the data matching? Is that your? That's that's very interesting. I'd like to. We're going to take that back and think about how we might be able to do some of those analytics. It's a, it's an interesting point. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Speaker. Um, I had a question on the the bills we're discussing today. Do we have a cost estimate that the agencies have uh, put together on what you believe the cost would be if we pass these bills? Uh, we're still putting those together. Give an estimate. I don't. I don't think we have that yet. How quickly do you think you'd be able to put that together? Uh, all the agencies are are working on estimates and working with OMB. I, I'm not sure how long we'll have. To, we can get back to you even with a timeline. <clears throat> I want to thank you uh, for uh, testifying today. Uh, did you want to say something, Vito? Yes, I'm sorry, Mr. Speaker. It was brought to my attention that I misspoke earlier. Um, we have five XRF machines, not two. So I just want to be clear on record. Thank you. Vito. I want to thank you all uh, for testifying today. I want to <clears throat> uh, say again, uh, Dr. Barbeau, I, I know uh, you have committed uh, your life to public health work. You were a health commissioner in Baltimore. You did work, as you mentioned, in Washington, D.C. You were the first deputy commissioner under Dr. Bassett for uh, her four years as our health commissioner, you're now acting commissioner. As you said, you're a pediatrician and someone that has uh, dedicated your life to helping improve uh, public health outcomes uh, for children. And, and that's extraordinarily meaningful. Um, uh, but but I, I wanna just say that uh, I still believe that what is happening in New York City today and what this hearing I think really illuminated is that there's still a, a lot of unacceptable things and outcomes occurring in our city. And we need to acknowledge that. We need to talk about that. I think one of the things that uh, there were many good things that I think Dr. Bassett did, but I think one of the good things that Dr. Bassett talked about so openly was uh, environmental uh, racism and environmental justice and racism as it related to public health and ensuring that 
we made sure that vulnerable, marginalized uh, populations with greater disparities got what they needed from our city, and we talked about that in an open and honest way. And that is why I think it's, in, it's incumbent upon us at all levels of government, whether it be elected officials or people that are working in uh, extraordinarily important city agencies, that we recognize that 4,200 children is totally unacceptable. Completely and totally unacceptable. We can talk about 89%, we can talk about a reduction, we can talk, that's great. When you still have 4,200 brains that are permanently damaged potentially for the rest of their lives, that is unacceptable. It is a failure, it is a tragedy, and we need to get to zero. We were supposed to get to zero by 2010. We are eight years past 2010 and we're at 4,200. Uh, I mean, I. I I would love to kind of know what you would say to a, a mother or a father of a child who walked up to you and said, my child is permanently damaged because of a failure of New York City government. What would the response be? My response would be, we screwed up. I'm sorry. I want to do better. And I would love to understand what your response would be as someone who's dedicated your life to public health. What would your response to be, to be to that parent? So council member, I, I appreciate your leadership in this and I am uh, hopeful that uh, going to the threshold of five will help us finish the mission. And by no means are we resting on our laurels of that 89% reduction. And we know that there's more to be done and we are committed to working with council to finish the mission. What would your response be to a parent who walked up to you and said that my child's permanently damaged? You know, every situation is different and I would um, treat every situation differently. And um, I would just leave it at that. I, I don't feel like there's a level of contrition today related to the gravity and seriousness of the number of children who have been uh, permanently damaged. I think we, we can all acknowledge that we don't want any more New York City children exposed to lead. And I think we can acknowledge that there have been uh, mistakes in the past by multiple layers of government that have allowed this to happen. I thank you all for testifying today, and we're going to call up the advocates next. Thank you very much. Okay, our first panel is uh, uh, Brandon uh, Kilbasa. I apologize if I get your name incorrectly. From the Cooper Square Committee, the second uh, panelist is going to be Nikki Ledger. Third panelist is Edward Rudick from Lead Dust Free NYC. Christine Rucci from the Cooper Square Committee, James Markowitz from Tenants Taking Control, and Ann Daly. That is the first panel. Okay, do we still have the other folks here who were slated to testify? Okay, great, great. Thank you very much, I apologize. Thank you for your patience, each and every one of you. We know it was a very long questioning period of the administration, but there was a lot we wanted to get on the record uh, that was important for us in negotiating these bills and, and getting as much information as possible. Are there still uh, folks here uh, from uh, the health department? Are there still folks here from HPD? And what other city agencies are still represented here today? NYCHA? City Hall and Department of Education still here? Okay. Uh, sit down.
Yes, we can. Uh, sorry, we have two more folks, and we'll get an, we'll get one chair on this side and another chair on that side. So if uh, if. And if we could uh, remove the poster boards uh, behind uh, these folks. Okay, you may begin in whatever order you'd like, and we're going to put uh, three minutes on the clock uh, for each one of you, and there may be questions as well. Let's start in whatever order you'd like. Make sure the mic is on, the red light has to be on. Okay, I'll start, thank you. Um, I'm very glad to be here to talk about this topic today. My name is Brandon Kilbasa, and I'm the Director of Organizing at the Cooper Square Committee. I'm also one of the co-coordinators for the Lead Dust Free NYC Coalition. Uh, Cooper Square Committee is a long-standing tenants' rights organization on the Lower East Side. Uh, we specialize in tenant organizing. The Lead Dust Free uh, NYC Coalition is a coalition of tenants that have come together to combat this lead dust issue that we've been talking about today. Um, it's an issue that's been plaguing the Lower East Side. Uh, when reckless construction is done and landlords don't follow the safe work practices, buildings have been flooded with up to thousands of times the legal limits of dust. Council Member Chin referenced one of the buildings we were working with back in 2014. The testament. That building had a pregnant woman and a child under the age of six living in it. Um, that same landlord was found to have polluted four, three other buildings around the same time. Um, it's not uncommon for us to have these issues. It's really reached a chronic, um, to the point where it's a chronic contamination in the Lower East Side due to this construction. And virtually every landlord that's doing renovations and luxury rehab work, taking out rent-stabilized tenants and replacing them with market rate tenants are not following the safe work practices. Um, so I'm here to testify in favor of all the legislation that's being put forward. I think it's all uh, wonderful and going to strengthen um, the lead laws that are in place for New Yorkers. Um, I'm in, in particular favor of um, intros 864, 873, and 874 because they deal more with dust, construction, and safe work practices. Uh, while I'm in favor of the legislation, I'd like to say that I think um, that the city do does need to do a lot more to improve enforcement and to utilize local law one. Um, some of the stuff that came up today was fantastic. We're glad to hear people calling out um, the issue of no pre-notification for large jobs that as far as we can tell, that virtually never happens. Um, and checking between vacancies and when there are children under the age of six during, during tenancies is, is, could really eliminate this problem. Um, those violations are really the prevention I think the city needs to carry out. And we're really glad to hear the council members um, asking those questions today. Um, so in the, in the end, the lead dust issue that we're dealing with is really a um, kind of an extension of the construction as harassment issue that the city's been taking on in the last two or three years. The Stanford Tenant Safety Package of legislation was a huge step in that direction. So we're really hopeful that this um, suite of 23 bills, especially the three that I mentioned, will really doggedly go into the, the, you know, the lead contamination issue and the lead dust contamination issue. And as advocates and organizers, uh, we're here to really uh, collaborate with the council and do you know, the good work on the ground that's necessary. Thank you so much for your time today, and thank you for calling the hearing. Thank you very much. Hi, um, my name is Nikki Ledger. I'm a member of Cooper Square Committee and Lynn Dust Free New York. I have a background in mathematics and statistics. I opted not to have repairs done to my bedroom because I was afraid of lead dust contamination. So there are cracks in peeling paint which remain. The building was built in the 20s. Steve Keane, the Australian economist, recently observed that a federal regulatory agency, if not permitted to enforce the law, becomes a handmaiden of industry. Similarly, when the city's lead laws are violated right and left, especially safe work practices, this makes the city the handmaiden of the lead-polluting, life-threatening landlords. Lead law one of 2004 might have sufficed, but due to lagging enforcement and lack of oversight, many new, much-needed pieces of legislation have been induced by our <coughs> city council members. This is much appreciated. We applaud the introduction of 864, 873, 874, which address lead dust contamination via interagency cooperation, stop work orders, and the owner's responsibility to completely remediate lead upon vacancy. The real estate bullies of New York will work to weaken the proposed legislation. 
Don't let this happen. The city's decisions and actions must be based on a complete consideration of all the data with the interests of the citizens and its children in the fore and squarely targeting the causes of lead poisoning. Don't be intimidated by the power of the real estate lobby, as I suspect some of our agency heads have been. Thank you. No one here is making any decisions based off of that, but I appreciate you saying it. Hi, my name is Ed Rudick, and I'm a member of the Lead Dust Free uh, NYC. I'm here in support of the new proposed lead laws. And I'm also concerned that many components of New York City's Local Law 1 of 2004 have not been enforced. And since lead is the most studied neurotoxin, and any exposure to lead particles can alter a child's developmental trajectory throughout their life. These are the practices that landlords must follow in adherence to 2004 law. Hire firms certified by US EPA when disturbing more than 100 square feet of lead paint, replacing windows, or fixing violations issued by the New York City HPD. Use lead safe work practices and trained workers when fixing uh, lead paint hazards and when doing general repair work that disturbs lead paint. Seal floors, doors, and other openings with plastic waterproof tape in the work areas. Clean the work areas with wet uh, mops and HEPA vacuums every day and after work is done. Post warning signs around the work area. Have a professional check lead dust levels after cleanup is completed. In too many cases, the aforementioned is not being done. Is it because of dysfunction of city agencies in failure to ensure that the 2004 law is adhered to? or the failure of previous and present administrations to, to ensure that our children are protected by this law, or both. A mother in Flint, Michigan, was voicing concern about her child's elevated blood level, and a nurse employed by a state agency told her, it's not the end of the world, your child will only lose a few IQ points. The injury suffered by our children is the end of the world that they are entitled to live in we are morally obligated to protect all children. Thank you very much for the hearing, and I hope these laws, are, the landlords adhere uh, to them. Thank you, Mr. Rudick. Thank you. Uh, hello, my name's Christine Rucci. I'm part of, um, excuse me, I'm a little nervous. Uh, Don't be Led nervous, Dust, take your time. Lead Dust Free New York, I'm also a resident of the East Village. In spring 2017, without my knowledge, lead dust was seeping into my apartment. Construction was taking place in the neighboring apartment, but with the approval of the building's management, it had been taken place without proper permits or proper protection plan in place. They did not cover walls or safeguard my apartment as according to the standard practices required by the Tenants Protection Plan and Local Law 1. All that separated my apartment from the neighboring apartment was a quarter inch of wood paneling. Lead dust became trapped in the walls and floors and seeped into all of the cloth furnishings. My son and I have spent a year consistently sick with unexplained symptoms, and a spot showed up on my biannual breast cancer test. I am a survivor, and I safeguard my health every day. It became so bad that my son, who has asthma, could no longer live in the home for an extended period. And I suspect the ex that exposure to lead from construction dust caused these symptoms. The Department of Health and HBD inspectors visited the apartment for over a five-month period and declared it tested for high levels, almost double the legal limit inside a residential apartment. Both my son and I suffered with rashes, and even our pets became ill. Sadly, one died, and the veterinarians believe that exposure from toxins released during construction was a contributing factor. The only way to rectify this crisis was to take my landlord to housing court. It took court orders, fines, major cleanups and repairs to seal up the toxic walls and floors so my son and I could return home to a normal life. They did not follow court orders. I had to seek the help of a state senator. By telling my story, I hope others will be able to know their rights, know how to report these issues, and to highlight issues with the enforcement of Local Law 1. 
I support all of the laws in the package, and it is my hope that the Department of Health, HPD, and Department of Buildings streamline communication and actually hold these contractors, landlords, and management companies legally accountable so this never happens to anyone. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rucci. I'm very sorry to hear what's happened to you and your son and your pets. And uh, I can tell how emotional and painful it is to... And just so you know, at one point they told us not to even walk on our floors or sit on our floors. And people that are cancer survivors fight every day not to have toxicity in their life. And your home is your dojo, and it should be safe. I agree thank with you. you. Thank you. I want to thank you for being here and for being patient and spending all day here to testify in front of us. We really, really it's appreciate important. it. It's important. If I, if one other person gets helped from this, that's all that matters. I, I, I don't. That's why I came. Thank, thank you. you. Hello, my name is James Markowitz. I'm a rent stabilized tenant in Manhattan. I'm associated with. Uh, the TTC, which now stands for Tenants Taking Control. We used to be the Toledano Tenants Coalition. I'm also associated with the Cooper Square Committee. Now, as a tenant, I have experienced um, lead dust related problems. So I'm also an active participant in LDF NYC, working toward a lead, a lead dust free New York City. In that regard, I'd like to address an existing practice in New York City that actually actively promotes the release of lead dust. It's something known as predatory equity. Banks and developers have created a speculative environment in which buildings that include rent-regulated tenants are targeted and overvalued based on the assumption that those tenants can be induced into leaving. Madison Realty Capital my corporate landlord, values the 15 buildings in their portfolio at almost four times the value placed on those buildings by the New York City Department of Finance. This disparity creates tremendous pressure on affected tenants. One of the methods by which unethical landlords try to remove such tenants is known as construction as harassment. Empty departments are taken down to the lathing in slipshod, haphazard manner, and that endangers the welfare of the people who live in those buildings and the workers who are doing that. When this happened in my building in March of, 20, in March of 2016, it resulted in lead dust levels 16 times the EPA safe level limit. Two toddlers lived in our building then. That family has since fled. I should mention this is a 10-unit building Eight of those units have now been emptied of tenants. When I go home at night, it's dark. The city is currently lacking in oversight of demolition practices like this, which in this current climate of hyper-gentrification is making this place difficult, if not impossible, for middle and lower class or lower income people to live. We need immediate increased awareness on the part of the city wherever these predatory equity practitioners are renovating existing housing stock and immediate enforcement of Local Law 1 in every case. With regard to the upcoming bills, I'm generally in support of all of them. I really like intro number 874, which talks about um, the Department of Buildings and the Department of Health working together. That would be especially helpful. Um, these Landlords have to apply for building permits with the Department of Buildings. They get them. Um, that should be an indication that uh, the Department of Health should be notified. I want to thank the City Council for thinking along these lines. Tenants need legal protection to counterbalance the money and the undue influence of organizations such as the Real Estate Board of New York. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Markowitz. Ms. Daly. I'm a member of the Lead Dust Free New York group, the campaign, and happy to be here to testify. I'll focus my comments on how the city currently conducts enforcement around lead dust contamination and on the pending, pending legislation regarding lead safety. 
To begin with, I'll briefly de describe the situation that my neighbors and myself are currently dealing with. Um, I'm a rent-stabilized tenant, and our very old East Village building has eight tiny apartments. Because it was built before 1960, I mean 100 years before that, there's a presumed presence of lead paint. Much, is, um, much of it is visible, peeling, inside and out. Since the building was sold three years ago to an LLC, whose name I still don't know, the new owners have sent those who reside in this building, the annual, have, have not sent us the annual notice to tenant or occupant of building with over three or more apartments, protect your child from window falls and lead poisoning. They haven't sent us that form. Since they took over a great deal of demolition, gut renovation, extreme harassment through dust has occurred, and not one construction permit has been posted. Although neighbors have called 311, no stop work orders have been issued, and safe work practices and local lead laws have not been enforced. Each renovation has caused huge amounts of dust actually wafting through the air. No floors, doors, windows, hallways, or openings have been sealed with plastic, um, as work areas are supposed to be. Because of the age of the building, I believe the dust we are being exposed to is full of lead. These hazardous conditions are left for days. My neighbors believe workers employed are unlicensed and not certified in lead abatement or re remediation. No work areas have been cleaned with wet mops or HEPA vacuums after work is completed. No dust wipe samples have been taken. No warning signs to tenants have been posted on any of the work areas throughout the building. I'm excited to see all of the pending lead legislation enacted, especially intros 864, 873, and 874. But Local Law 1 of 2004 has taught us that legislation is empty without enforcement, and that's why I'm here. It's crucial that legislation is enforced so that no one, not one more New York tenant is lead poisoned or exposed to lead dust, and I believe I have been. The effects are well studied, devastating, and uh, seemingly long lasting. In a city as bold and progressive as New York, we cannot afford to have one more lead poisoned child or adult. So please act quickly to reform the enforcement of existing lead laws and enact this much needed packet, package of new legislation to further strengthen the laws that protect New Yorkers from lead. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Daly. So HPD is here. So I, I assume that you're going to get the addresses of the folks who are testifying here today and saying that there has not been a level of responsiveness or enforcement in their buildings where they continue to be exposed to this. I hope that happens as quickly as possible because we'll be following up as well. Uh, uh, Councilmember Levine. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Just a very brief, brief comment. This was such an important panel because for most of the four hours we were speaking to the administration, we were focused on the ingestion of lead through uh, eating paint chips or drinking water uh, or through the soil, and, and that's a real threat. But science has now established that you can have the same negative impacts from breathing in lead, and the cutting edge of science has also shown that adults who breathe in lead dust are also vulnerable. Uh, there can be cardiovascular damage, um, and we really didn't elicit that in the discussion with the administration, so it's incredibly important that you're here to speak on the record. 
um, and the, the, the crisis that you have identified um, ha is what has motivated some of the bills in this package. Um, and we're happy now that you have um, given human stories to express the profound impact that um, our failure to rein in negligent landlords is having on New Yorkers. Thank you for speaking out. Thank you all very much. Our next panel is Jackson Fisher Ward from Assemblymember Harvey Epstein's office, Daniel Huber from the IBO, Matthew Shasher, <clears throat> Adriana Espinoza from the New York League of Conservation Voters, Corey Stern, and Jan Munn. Is everyone here that I called? Are we missing anyone? I'm Matthew Shashir. Yes. Adriana. One, two, three, four, five. There's six people listed. Adrian Espinoza? Yes. Jan Munn? Yes. Dindy Huber? Yes. Corey Stern, Jackson Fisher Ward. Okay, we'll do these five panelists. Uh, you may begin uh, and whatever. Matthew, you want to start? Sure, thank you. My name's Matthew Shasher. I've been working in this field for over 25 years, both representing individual tenants in real life who've been poisoned by, by the failures of the system and as counsel to the New York City Coalition to End Lead Poisoning, which is a class action against the city for failure to enforce the law. And I was one of the people closely involved in drafting Local Law 1. So I want to give a little bit of a history lesson here. Um, uh, because I have a lot of comments about the bills, but I've already given them to your staff, and we have specific recommendations in my testimony and also in this report. Basically, in the 1990s, the courts established three main points. Number one, that the old lead paint law required full abatement of every molecule of lead paint in every single dwelling in New York City. That's what the old local law, one of 1982, required. Number two, the courts declared that landlords are an, under an obligation to make sh inspect their own dwellings and make sure they're safe. Number three, the court imposed a requirement that there be safe work practices. We didn't get that until we had the city held in contempt of court. The city eventually did write those regulations. So in drafting Local Law 1 of 2004, um, which, by the way, Mr. Speaker, was not signed into law by the mayor. It was vetoed by the mayor. It was passed by the city council. Uh, uh, the current mayor was one of the sponsors of the bill was enacted over his veto. There was a much stronger proposal called Intro 101, which I'll give you a copy of and an explanation of it. It had a lot of other provisions that were bargained away to avoid a veto, which we got anyway, including targeting in certain neighborhoods, data uh, that would have answered all the questions you've raised here. But we baked into Local Law 1 these three principles that I just discussed. Number one, that landlords have to inspect their own dwellings if we're not going to take all the lead paint out. That was the bargain. Okay, you don't have to take it all out because my friends from real estate were here, coming here all the time and saying, don't make us take it all out. We can manage it. So we said, fine, built it in the law. You have to inspect at least annually. Do it in writing. And it was made the most serious part of this law. It said it's a misdemeanor if you don't. Okay? And... Um, it also required that landlords give a pamphlet to tenants so that they understand what their rights are. Landlords don't do that. So when the city comes in here and says, well, the tenants call about dust problems. If landlords don't, if tenants don't know that, then they're never going to do so, okay? And our research and our analysis has disclosed, as you pointed out, that not once has the city ever ever placed a violation against a landlord for doing this. And this is crucial. You heard the city testify today. They have 57 inspectors. 
There are over 300,000 units of pre-60 rental housing with kids under the age of six. Clearly, the city can't inspect them, so therefore, landlords have to do so. If we don't do that, we're still in a reactive mode and we're never going to deal with the problem. Number two, that you have to abate the lead paint at vacancy. And actually, the original proposal in Local Law 1 was we were going to abate all the lead paint on the high-risk friction surfaces by July 1, 2007. The administration pushed back and said, no, but we'll do it at vacancy. The only violation I know the city has ever placed out of the 200, 320, 14,000 violations involved a client of mine in Council Member Levine's district where the city took a homeless family from a shelter, placed them into a private rental dwelling, and by chance the tenant called up HPD because there were lots of other problems, and we discovered that the place was full of lead paint. Homeless services had certified this is an appropriate home for the family to move into. Um, and uh, when we discovered this problem, she tried to go back to the shelter because she said, I can't live here. And in fact, the Ch Agency for Children's Services threatened to remove her children from her because they said she was being neglectful for living in a home that the city had just placed her in. That was the only time we ever had a violation written in the last 14 years for failure to do the, the vacancy abatement. So that part's not being done either. The third piece, and this is all covered in this report and in my testimony, was the use of safe work practices. And, um, you know, it's been discussed. There's basically no compliance with vast aspects of that. You asked earlier, the, the health department, how many of these pre-filings? We actually asked that at a meeting a couple of years ago at, at then uh, Senator Perkins' office, now Council Member Perkins' office, with DOB, and they blurted out, it's under 100 a year. So clearly something's not working here. And when the city comes here and tells you, oh, we're really interested in these ideas in this report, we've been talking to the city about this for years, years. They know all about these issues. It's no surprise. Vito Muscacciolo has been part of these meetings. We've told him, you guys are not doing any enforcement of the self-inspection against landlords, and they've admitted it. So then they moved him over to, to NYCHA to make sure that NYCHA self-inspected. Um, but they're not doing it. We've talked about remedies for the Department of Buildings, like, for example, the PW1 form, which is a construction permit form. You could have a box to check off. Did you notify the health department so that they know about it? They could send those to the health department. It doesn't happen. In my testimony, I talk about some of the families we've represented over the years in, in here, in, in housing court, where there's been all of these violations, and even when we've taken HPD to court with the landlord to get them to enforce the law, HPD refuses to place violations for the failure to inspect and the failure to do the turnover. And I've said to people like Vito Muscacciolo, how hard can it be? If you found lead paint on a door frame or a window frame, which should have been abated at vacancy, you, all you have to ask the tenant is, when did you move in? If you moved in after August 2nd of 2004, when that law went into effect, bingo, we've got a violation. You know, ask the landlord, we just found all this peeling paint in February in your apartment, we've just cited it. So then you ask the landlord, where's your annual inspection report? You don't have it? They will not do it. I've taken them to court, housing court, they've only agreed to sign on to stipulations where we've asked for the fines to impose, be imposed on the landlord because HPD absolutely, 100% unconditionally refuses to place a violation for either 2056.4, which is the annual inspection, or 2056.8, which is the uh, turnover requirements. Matt, we're going to have some questions for you, so sure. I'm going to move on to the next panelist, but we'll come back and you'll have uh, the opportunity to take some questions for us and continue Thank to you. expand upon your comments. Yes. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Adriana Espinosa. I'm the director of the New York City program at the New York League of Conservation Voters. I'd like to thank the chairs of the committees here, Cornegie, Levine, and Constantinus, and you, Speaker Johnson, for the opportunity to testify today. Um, while the number of children with very high blood lead levels has dropped significantly since 2004, we have been unable to eliminate childhood lead poisoning. Earlier this week, NYLCV, along with advocates from NILPI, Master Chair from um, NMIC, and Cooper Square, released um, this report. 
um, about how lax enforcement of local law one has prevented the most ambitious lead poisoning prevention law in the country from eliminating this public health issue by the city's then stated goal of 2010. Local law one des was designed to hold landlords accountable for proactively finding and abating lead hazards before children became poisoned and to eventually remove all hazards from rental apartments throughout the city. Uh, yet data from DHMH and HPD show that the city is not enforcing the primary prevention measures of local law one. Specifically, um, as Matt and others have, have covered today, landlords are not being held accountable for failing to regularly inspect apartments where children reside, abate lead paint hazards before a new tenant moves into an apartment, and use safe work practices. Um, in fact, HPD enforcement data indicates that New York City has never taken any enforcement action against a landlord for failing to conduct a mandated annual inspection since the law went into effect, and as a result, rather than a proactive regime envisioned by Local Law 1, the city's response remains complaint-driven, which is too late for many flat families. Um, our report um, includes um, recommendations, which I won't go into here, um, but although some of the bills being heard today can move the needle uh, to protect children from lead exposure, and, and components of 864 and 865, are, I think, are good examples of that, far better to make sure that the existing law in the books is being maximized. If landlords are not penalized for failing to inspect and abate lead, simply put, we will continue to have lead poisoned children in the city. Um, so regarding some of the bills, the proposed bills regarding soil, uh, lead paint and dust on the interior surfaces of children's, uh, children's homes and other buildings where they since spend time remains the primary cause of childhood lead poisoning. This is entirely preventable, and in order to tackle it, we should be focusing our energy and resources on this primary exposure pathway. While we recognize the need to ensure healthy soil quality, especially in places like community gardens, for example, broad requirements on, on the city agencies to test all bare soil areas in parks, private dwellings, and other places brings up questions of feasibility and prioritization of city resources, and more analysis is needed on this issue. Um, NYLCV supports a intro 91A requirement for childcare facilities to annually test water used for drinking, um, cooking, and provide those results to parents and guardians um, of each child. Um, however, leaving it to DHMH to set the action level standards should be, um, instead of baking them into the law, should be looked at. Um, in addition, just to close here, um, we cannot keep functioning on a complete driven system and must instead be proactive. What's clear to everyone here is that action is needed on lead. Uh, the bills being heard today represent some ambitious strategies and we look forward to working uh, with you continuously to, to make these better. Thank you. Thank you very much for being here, Adriana. Yes. Mike. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Corey Stern. I'm an attorney as well, uh, like Mr. Shashir. I represent uh, 2,500 children in Flint, Michigan individually who were lead poisoned by consuming water. Uh, here in New York City, I represent uh, close to 200 individual children who had lead levels in New York City uh, in NYCHA housing. Um, in Flint, Michigan, I was appointed to be lead counsel for all of the litigation on behalf of plaintiffs in that litigation. And I think everything that everyone has said so far on this panel and, and the questions that were targeted at the, the, um, the heads of the departments were, were, were strong. I'm going to try not to rehash anything that anybody's said. I, I just want to say to you all, you know, sort of off the cuff, you have my testimony and I'm not going to read it because it's long and I hope it goes in the record. Everything that you're doing in this legislation is awesome. The proposals are great. Every single one of them is fantastic. But the biggest issue that you have is you are, in order to effectuate the purpose of each of these pieces of legislation, required to have partners that are enforcing it in a meaningful way. And you presently have, from what I heard you know, from the folks who testified today, and it's not an indictment on any of them individually, but systematically as agencies, there is literally no contrition on the part of anyone that sat up here, not that they had to be contrite about their personal roles in it, but on behalf of the departments that they represent. And so, for instance, you had um, somebody ask, I think it was Councilman Torres, ask about how does NYCHA get a waiver through HPD for a unit that it's previously inspected when in fact NYCHA's already admitted that the inspections that were done in order to procure the waiver were done by folks who weren't licensed or qualified. There was no answer for that. That's fine that there's no answer for it, but the reality is is you're depending on that same agency, HPD, to help effectuate each of some of these 25 bills that you're proposing today. 
So where I come in and where Mr. Shashir comes in in some instances is what happens once a kid is lead poisoned? And here's another issue that y'all have not addressed or really probably even know exists. If a kid, God forbid, gets hit by a bus, a city bus on you know, Atlantic Avenue, his parents are required to provide a notice of claim to the city of New York based on the injury within 90 days of being hurt. If somebody falls through the floor in a NYCHA building and breaks their back, they're required within 90 days pursuant to statute to provide notice to NYCHA that they've been injured. When a kid is lead poisoned, when a child is lead poisoned and injured through lead poisoning, his parents are required, if it's a NYCHA house, to provide notice to the city and to NYCHA within 90 days. It's impossible for a child to provide notice that he's been injured within 90 days of being injured when he has no idea that he's been injured, in no small part because the inspections that were required to take place in order to inform his family whether there's lead present were even being conducted. And so what happens in those situations, and I'll, I'll conclude with this, is Folks like me and folks like Mr. Shashir, we file a motion to provide a late notice of claim to NYCHA into New York City on behalf of a child, a minor child. Most instances, if not all instances, the courts grant those motions because A, it's a child, and B, you know, you don't want to waive the rights of somebody who was a minor at the time it had occurred. The interesting and compelling part of this that you should think about, because these are your partners in this going forward, in each and every instance where we file a motion for late notice for a child that was poisoned in NYCHA housing, NYCHA and the city come in and contest the late notice and blame the parents for not providing notice sooner to, the court, to, to their entities because the statute says 90 days. And so the very folks who by way of their actions are poisoning in some small part these children are saying that the parents aren't letting, letting them know fast enough that their kids have been harmed. So you've asked all these questions about, well, what happens to the 4,200? Unfortunately, the 4,200 come to us, and so we try and file lawsuits on their, on their behalf to, to help compensate them. But it, it becomes this unnecessary hurdle for lawyers, and more, more importantly for the kids and their parents, to have to bring a lawsuit by getting permission from a court to provide notice to an entity that they're suing, and the entity turns around and says, sorry, you're out of luck, you weren't in time. So it's, it's just an issue for y'all to put in sort of your wheelhouse when it comes to folks post-poisoning this is all about prevention, but what about the folks who are already poisoned? Thank you, Mr. Stern. Good afternoon, Chairman Constantinides, Cornegie, uh, and Levine, as well as Speaker Johnson and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. I am Daniel Huber, IBO's environmental analyst. Recent news reports about the city's public housing developments have brought lead, specifically the hazards of lead paint, to the attention of New Yorkers. While the lead paint is the predominant source of lead in city residences, tap water can also be a source. It is notable that among the intros being discussed in today's hearing, several, several concern lead in city water. Earlier this week, IBO published a report on the prevalence of lead in drinking water. New York City water is virtually lead free when it flows out of the city's distribution systems. However, numerous privately owned, older, smaller residential buildings in New York have plumbing that contains a much higher level of lead than is currently allowed in new construction. This lead can leach into water flowing out of city taps. Among the findings from our study, overall IBO found that the city is in compliance with federal and state regulations for at the tap monitoring in residents and has been since 2010. While the EPA has determined that there is no safe level of exposure to lead, it has set its action level at a threshold of 15 ppb due to other considerations such as cost, public health benefit, and the ability of a public water system to reduce contaminant levels through corrosion control. Since 1993, residential tap water samples have had on average lower levels of lead and fewer tests have exceeded the EPA threshold uh, for lead. Smaller, older buildings that may have had lead service lines, especially those built in the 1920s and 1930s, generally have higher rates of lead water tests above the federal th threshold. And based on test data from 2006 through 2016, the highest rates of tap water uh, levels exceeding the federal threshold were in places like Ridgewood and Maspeth in Queens, uh, Bedford Side Besson in Brooklyn, Riverdale in the Bronx, and South Beach in Staten Island. While the city meets federal and state regulations regarding lead and water, it is important to note that federal rules permit 10% of residential buildings uh, to exceed the 15 part per billion threshold. There is no water lead standard for individual private residential buildings, meaning that no regulatory action is triggered for an individual building, no matter how far above the standard. 
In a city the size of New York, this means that a substantial number of homes and families may be exposed to lead from their faucets, but the scale of the problem is unclear. The city currently has no means to compel landlords or homeowners to remove lead leaching service lines or fixtures. Landlords are not required to provide lead-free water, and if running for the tap for several minutes before drinking is insufficient to lower lead levels, tenants could face a choice between buying water, using lead filters, or ignoring the problem. Landlords are also not currently required to notify tenants or prospective tenants if a building has been found to have elevated levels of lead in the water or if renovation work may cause lead levels to temporarily rise. The only notification requirement for the existence of lead pipes applies only to home buyers and is required under state law. New York City has spent substantial sums of money on drinking water filtration and on preserving the quality of the water at the source upstate. However, not every city resident has equal access to this water as lead continues to leach into the water in a small share of buildings before it gets to the tap. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Hero. Please. Hello. Um, my name is Jan Moon. I'm uh, a member of the Legacy Lead Coalition, which is a group of um, concerned residents, um, city employees, scientists, advocates. Could you try and speak a little closer to the mic? We just want to make sure we can hear you. Okay. It's did you hear, should I start from the beginning? Just a little closer to the microphone, please. Hi. So um, we're collaborating uh, to reduce the potential harm we face from lead in soils. I'm um, reading uh, some comments from, um, from Cornell University um, uh, prepared by Murray McBride, uh, Hannah Sch Schlater, Yolanda Gonzalez, and Sam Anderson. I'll leave the full text with you, but um, I just want to touch on a little bit. Um, comments regarding proposal introduction number 420A regarding uh, soil lead contamination in public areas. I want to uh, sort of just stop here and say if we're trying to get to zero for us to ignore the hazards and risks um, that we face with lead and uh, lead in, in paints as well as in water and, and soil, then we're not going to get to zero unless we look at entire <laughs> entire sort of thing. So um, Healthy Soils and Healthy Communities Partnership, led by Cornell University, the New York State Department of Health, Brooklyn College, and other partners, bring together diverse urban gardening, community, uh, gardening, community engagement, and public health interests, including scientists, um, geo, geo, biogeochemical, uh, soil, environmental, health, and behavioral extension educators, community partners, gardeners, and an uh, advisory committee incorporating insight from the government agencies and community engagement, public health, um, urban gardening and agriculture, environmental and educational perspectives. Healthy Soil aims to better understand and address health risks related to soil contamination and to develop and promote scientifically sound healthy gardening practices throughout New York State and beyond. The Healthy Soils team now works closely with the Legacy Lead Coalition to proactively and equitably address the history of lead contamination in New York City. As members of the Healthy Soil Partnership, um, the Cornell Cooperative Extension, Harvest New York, and Legacy Lead, we want to thank the City Council members um, for attending to the Legacy of Lead in the City and for holding this meeting. We strongly support um, proposed intro, intro um, for 420A, which addresses testing for and remediating lead in soil for public parks, community gardens, and privately owned public spaces accessible to children. However, as outlined in this testimony, we ask that the committee consider the need for additional discussion regarding funding for testing and remediation, testing protocols and frequency, record keeping and remediation best practices. We are glad that the council recognizes the profound risks associated with exposure to lead in soil. We have provided a summary of research-based findings and have attached this to the testimony for additional information and references. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Mann. Thank you for the panel. Um, Mr. Stern, can you clarify, have there been any awards for lead poisoning uh, for damages by, from the city of New York to date? Has the city been compelled to make any awards in lawsuits due to harm from lead poisoning to date? Absolutely. And can you estimate the 
um, scale of the payouts either cumulatively or on an sure. annual basis? Sure. Sorry to interrupt you, Councilman. Yeah. Uh, in an individual lead poisoning case, the range when successful for, for either a settlement or a trial, we've had verdicts uh, up to $8 million, and we've had settlements up to 2.7 In New York? In New York City. Yeah. Settlements up to $2.7 million for a child, um, and generally a settlement for a child who has been harmed through lead. Uh, even the smallest settlement is usually in six figures and usually over $500,000. And do you know how much the payouts annually are? There's a report actually in the New York Post uh, that was done at some point in time that indicated uh, how much the Comptroller's Office had allocated to settlements, but it didn't, um, it didn't allocate specifically to lead poisoning. It just was for all of the, I think they were doing a story for how much money in lawsuits the, the city had paid. And what is the potential liability then of the outstanding suits? Can you estimate? I mean, there's so there's I, the individual suits. I think are too too plentiful to really know because I I personally, from my experience professionally, don't necessarily believe the numbers that have been put out there today. That 97 percent of the individuals who are under the age of six who are lead poisoned in the city of New York come from private housing. There's 400,000 individuals that live in NYCHA housing, of that there's about 30,000 at any point in time that are under the age of seven, uh, you know, six years old. And to say that, you know, only 1,172 were poisoned last year with a lead level over five just seems a little bit low to me based on what I know about the, the buildings. Um, with regard to the class action lawsuit that was filed, you know, we filed a class action lawsuit against the housing authority, against the mayor, against the city, against many individuals, some of whom testified today. That's a lawsuit that, that involves um, the Fair Housing Act and, you know, for purposes of your question, more importantly, the, um, the lead paint disclosure rules. And so anytime anybody moves into an apartment or moves into a home or buys a home, they're required to be provided with a disclosure that says there is lead paint, there was lead paint, we don't know if there's lead paint. And so for each of the 175,000 units in NYCHA housing, NYCHA has been required to provide lead paint disclosures each and every year. So even upon a renewal of a lease, NYCHA is required to provide that disclosure. In the U.S. Attorney's complaint and in the consent decree, there is some contrition that NYCHA did not provide those, those disclosures. But more importantly, for our purposes, even if NYCHA was providing lead-based paint disclosures, how can anybody uh, affy that the veracity of those disclosures are accurate in light of the fact that NYCHA concedes that for at least since 2012 they haven't been conducting the proper tests? So to your question, each one of those disclosure violations carries with it a statutory $10,000 penal $10, penalty. In addition to the $10,000 penalty, each individual that was harmed as a result of not being provided with a disclosure gets their actual damages, which could be for you know, for, for one of the individuals who sat on this panel before, if it was a NYCHA home and they pay $1,200 a month for rent, if the value of their home was actually $500 a month, as an expert might testify, because had they had a lead disclosure, they wouldn't have paid as much or they wouldn't have moved in at all, you can take the 175,000 apartments and in addition to the $10,000 per unit which weren't provided, also get the actual damages. So I'd say at least $7 billion. Okay. Well, <laughs> um, we should be taking this action and pushing this legislation because of the human impact of lead poisoning, period. Yeah. But the financial exposure for the city uh, only adds to the motivation to get this right. Yeah. Um, so we appreciate you bringing that perspective. And, and, and quickly, Mr. Huber, because we do have four more panels waiting, I just want to clarify um, a very important point in your testimony, which is that there is no um, legal pen penalty to an individual landlord for elevated lead levels in their water supply. There are EPA standards that apply to us as, as a municipality, um, but not laws that would sanction an individual landlord for elevated lead in the water. Is that, is that correct? Yes. Uh, there's the, the EPA requirement uh, is that there's a sample that DEP takes of homes that are known to have lead in them, and no more than 10 percent of those samples can be above EPA's action level. But there is no individual standard for housing. 
So, you know, if a particular house had a very high uh, lead level in their water, uh, there is no regulation on that, and there is no requirement that clean water is provided. That, th th you had something to add to that quickly? Okay, thank you, Mike. Uh, Matt, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to add on to Mr. Uh, to, to Corey's um, resp response. First of all, just to clarify, I'm not a personal injury attorney, um, so I don't sue for personal injuries. I'm a legal services attorney, but I have some familiarity with what's happened in the field over the years. And generally speaking, the city is going to be held liable financially in two ways. One, we're dealing with the costs of treating and, and managing the, the special needs of kids who are poisoned. The city's liability for failure to enforce the laws in private housing, which is, by the way, where 97 percent of the poisoning happening, is not going to happen. That was established by the Court of Appeals in the Palais versus Said case. For poor enforcement doesn't make the city liable. Where the city gets nailed, of course, is where it's in housing that they had some role in actually owning. Like, for example, there was a, number, there was a case maybe a dozen years ago where the city placed a bunch of kids in a, in, a, in a homeless shelter that was full of lead paint, and that judgment was something like $20 million, which was entirely the size of the entire state um, lead poisoning prevention program budget for just one family. Um, and, and, and so, you know, my focus here is on prevention, and I think that's what we need to be looking at. And unfortunately, the tort system doesn't fully deal with the preventative aspects because a lot of the smaller landlords, or not so small ones, don't have insurance to cover this. The, the, you know, 25 years ago, they changed the insurance laws to allow most of the insurance companies to put in a lead exclusion. So even if these kids are poisoned, and they sue the landlord, they're not going to be able to recover any money, and therefore nobody takes the cases. So that's why we have to focus Got on it. stopping we, it. We, we do have to wrap up. Do you have something very, very quick? Very quick. Or, yeah. The last thing I'll say is this. Y'all sat and listened to the exact same testimony that I did. When my kids go away with their grandparents and we're not with them, my kids will ask for candy, and my gran the grandparents say yes. Then they ask for more candy. They just keep asking until the grandparents say no. If you feel at all like I did and like some of the people in the crowd did today that the enforcement part of this is never going to catch up to the progressive nature of the legislation, I suggest to you to be bold. Ask for more candy. Instead of making it a, a five, five, five micrograms per deciliter, say any micrograms per deciliter. Because if you have no confidence or if you have little confidence that they're going to do it anyway, why not, as bold, progressive as all of you are, and this legislation is that, why not just make it anything higher than zero? Because if they ain't going to do it anyway, you may as well just ask for more candy. We appreciate that. Uh, i got to hang out with your grandparents at some point. <laughs> And uh, thank you for this uh, very important panel. And we're going to call up our next panel, um, which is, um, looks like Ms. Charles from Mariners Harbor Houses, Joel Cooperman from Smith Houses, Hannah Sonelli from Concerned Parents in 11, uh, two, 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 one, one, two, two, two. Wynn Armstrong from Park West Village, Carmen Quinones from Douglas Houses. I realize some folks may have had to leave because the hour is late. Are any... Which panel? Okay, we are, we are going to move to the next panel, which I do believe includes David Carpenter. So, Mr. Carpenter can uh, join the panel. Jalissa Gilmore from New York City Environmental Justice Alliance. Uh, Igor Brons from the Urban Sales Institute. Joe Lefeski from New York City Urban Soils Institute, Francisca Landes from Columbia University, soil testing, Sarah, Pearl, Sarah Pearl Egendorf from Brooklyn College. Okay. So.
Do we have seats for everybody? Great. And we'll, we'll start with you, uh, Mr. Carpenter. Thank you, and I'm sorry that I have a train I have to catch. I'm David Carpenter. I'm a public health physician at the University of Albany. I'm the former director of the State Health Department Laboratories and the former dean of the School of Public Health at the University of Albany. I support this legislation, and I really like the comment that five micrograms per deciliter is not protective. There's lots of evidence that lower levels still reduce IQ in children and that, in fact, the, the decrement, the, the slope of the loss of IQ is steeper below five micrograms per deciliter than it is at higher levels. But what I really wanted to present today is some of my own research that focuses on this issue of dust and soil. I was a little distressed that the health department minimized that as an important route of exposure. Unfortunately, I think it is a, an important route of exposure. It, Perhaps it's not as important as lead in buildings, but uh, let me tell you my, the study I was involved in. This was with colleagues in China in a village that was close to a lead mine. There was no lead paint involved, but the children in that village had average blood lead levels of 8.6 micrograms per deciliter, well above the five micrograms per deciliter. Uh, and the soil tested uh, 760 parts per million of lead. And the study that we did used an EPA model that allows you to rate the different sources of exposure. So we analyzed food, we analyzed drinking water, we analyzed the soil outside the house and in the community, and the dust in the house. We found that 86% of the exposure of those children came from the combination of the soil outside and the dust that blew inside and was tracked inside. Now you've heard about the construction dust, an enormously important issue. But little kids, the other point I should make is the children uh, that were younger had higher levels than those that are older. Children track dust into their house. Winds blow dust in their house, so construction dust is important. And uh, these, in this family, these families, the exposure was primarily from the contaminated soil and how that soil got into the house. So I, I certainly don't mean to minimize lead-based paint. It's an important sort of exposure inside. The old lead on the outside of the houses that was scraped off stays there in that dirt, and that's also an important source of exposure. So I think we need a comprehensive approach to this issue that deals not just with indoor paint and water, but also a, a, attempts to directly attack the issue of soil and dust from the soil. And I'm sorry, but I'm just going to have to leave. No, 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 no offense taken. We're glad you were able to stay. Thank you for that important Thank testimony. You so much. Good afternoon. My name is Julissa Gilmore, and I'm here to testify on the um, on the behalf of the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance, founded in 1991. The New York City Environmental Justice Alliance, or NIJA is a nonprofit citywide membership network linking grassroots organizations from low-income neighborhoods and communities of color in their struggle for environmental justice. NIJA empowers its member organizations to advocate, to advocate for improved environmental conditions and against inequitable environmental burdens. Through our efforts, member organizations coalesce around specific common issues that threaten the ability of low-income and communities of color to thrive and coordinate campaigns designed to affect city and state policies, including toxic exposures. New York City has failed to adequately enforce lead laws to ensure the health and well-being of all New Yorkers. Lead has long been an important public health issue in environmental justice communities. This is more recently demonstrated by the exposure of hundreds of children and adults to high levels of lead in their drinking water in Flint, Michigan, a low-income community of color. Children from low-income neighborhoods and communities of color bear the highest burden of lead poisoning in New York City. 
and children led can have serious consequences on brain development, resulting in decreased intelligence, behavioral difficulties, and learning problems. At higher level, levels, lead can attack the brain and central nervous system and even result in death. Given the serious health effects of lead exposure in children, it's troubling how many New York City public schools are found to have high levels of lead from faucets and the initial attempt of New York City DOE to skew the results by performing pre-stagnation flushing. Even more disconcerting is the failure of NYCHA to perform lead inspections at their properties and falsely reporting that the inspections were completed. We would also like to highlight the importance of the New York City Department of Parks and Recreation, the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene to conduct soil testing in parks and community gardens, given that studies have found lead in soil from community gardens. Furthermore, we recommend the city prioritize the remediation of lead contaminated soil in parks and community gardens. New York City has failed to adequately uphold existing lead protections. NIJA supports the city's council intro introduction of these new proposed lead laws. We demand that the city ensure that these laws are adequately enforced and hold those, those who are required to complete inspections accountable so that the most vulnerable populations in New York City are protected from dangerous levels of lead exposure and the accompanying adverse health effects. Nija would like to thank the New York City Council for holding this oversight hearing on the city's enforcement of existing lead laws, these proposed rule changes, and for the opportunity to testify. Thank you so much, Ms. Ms. Gilmore. Thank you. you, you uh, I don't know if you timed that, uh, <laughs> but you, you, uh, you could be in politics. Well done. Thank you. Please. Good afternoon. Your microphone. Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Igor Bronze. I am the Laboratory and Operations Consultant at the Urban Soils Institute. I hold a Master's of Science in Applied Geosciences from the University of Pennsylvania. My testimony consists of two key points I wish to make about the mandate specified in Intro 422. My first point is with regard to the testing requirements for soil lead. Intro 422 mandates that a property owner send in a single sample for lead testing. A single sample cannot be characteristic of the soil that it's, test, that it's looking at. Soil is very spatially variable. Um, the Natural Resources Conservation Service, a branch of the Department of Agriculture, they're the guys who did the soil survey for New York City, they, uh, they typically test screen soil for heavy metals in a grid. Uh, and the, the resolution of this grid depends on how big the area is and any sort of time constraints they have. So uh, you know, an area about as big as this room would have a soil screen done every 10 feet. Um, if you have a house coated in lead paint, the lead reading at the base of your house is going to be a lot higher than at the edge of your yard. So, uh, and the, the difference between those two lead readings can, can you know, give you a figure that's within the threshold or beyond it. Um, so one, simply sending in one sample is never gonna be characteristic. In fact, five samples is rarely characteristic. Uh, my second point relates to the enforceability of 422. Uh, intro 422 requires that a property owner submit a soil lead test to the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. As with all environmental regulations, there are liabilities. My concern is that as 422 is currently written, certain parts of the law would uh, present difficulties with regard to enforcement. As someone who has uh, tested soil for, uh, well, screen soil for four years, there's no way for me to truly know where the customer's soil is coming from besides the customer's own admission. So um, a property owner that knows that they have high lead in their soil can just obtain a, a clean soil sample from elsewhere and send it in as their own. I have no way of knowing you know, if they did that or not. Uh, I, I believe that the testing methodology and requirements uh, need to be given a second look. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good, good afternoon. My name is George Lozevsky. I am the lab manager and field and education outreach coordinator for the New York City Urban Soils Institute. Igor is my colleague. Um, before that, I was an environmental consultant for several years, and before that, I worked as research staff at Columbia University's Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory for over 12 years. So um, I'll be speaking also to uh, intros 420 and 422. 
Uh, first, I'd like to say we, we really we appreciate the committee's hard work in, in bringing attention to lead in urban soils. Um, and although I checked off the box that says opposed, um, I want to make it clear that we're not, we're not opposed to laws and regulations uh, that are put in place to enforce mandatory testing and remediation. But, but we believe that some things need to be considered first before these bills are passed in, into law. Um, and to start with, um, we, we, because we're a soils institute, we care about soils, soils quality, soil chemistry. So if you consider behavior and function of soils with respect to, uh, I'll mention just a few things here. Igor already mentioned one thing. Um, the extreme variability of lead concentration and other contaminants in soils. Um, that makes a mandatory sampling of one sample really uh, insignificant, or it's just not going to give you any, any kind of information that's going to be useful. Um, also, you want to consider the bioavailability, the bioaccessibility of contaminants. In other words, how, what's the real risk exposure? What's the, what's the actual exposure to risk from working with soils, from using soils, or from kids playing in and around soils? And to, to the last thing to also consider is if, you, if you're going to determine threshold values, how do you t determine what the threshold values sh should be that can successfully be enforced by, by these laws? I mean, what's a good threshold value? Well, I mean, D the DEC here is 400 ppm. Other states have lower threshold values. Francisco actually just told me earlier today. 80, 80 ppm in California. Europe, Europe has lower threshold values. I mean, what's, what's the right threshold value? It's, it's soils are complex, and so looking at doing more research and collecting data on some of these questions is, is one of the missions that USI has been involved with in the past few years. And we believe that collecting that, that data and using that information and disseminating that information to the public through education and outreach, and of course, sharing that informa information with um, legislation would inf uh, be used as a, as a tool to inform how to best develop these, these bills. That would be, I think, that would be, f if you're going to try to approach, a f get a fair and equitable approach to, to, manda to mandatory remediation and testing, I think we need, we need to educate ourselves um, with respect to all these different properties. And I have too many things to talk about, but I'll just say lastly. Um, so the U.S., that's one of the things that the USI would hope to convince the, the committee is that we we are going to facilitate the, uh, the research, the collection of data, the testing. We test thousands of soils a year. Um, so we know our stuff, and we want to work with the city and the council on, 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 on getting this information to make the laws fair. And so I'd like to thank the committee. Thank you, Mr. Lefeski. If you have not already, please submit your full written testimony. Oh, I'm, and I'm sorry, I forgot we to can it out, yeah. Only for your benefit, because we want to have it in the record if right. you weren't able to cover all your points. I got like 500 copies, <laughs> 20 copies. That should, be a, that should be sufficient. Thank you, please. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you for taking the time today to talk about lead hazards in our community. My name is Francisca Landis, and I'm an environmental geochemist and a PhD candidate at Columbia University. Over the past year and a half, I've tested a lot of soils throughout our city, specifically in northern Brooklyn. And as we've heard here today, that um, lead damages child development and that soil contamination, soil contaminated with lead, can contribute to that exposure, whether it's carried indoors or the child is playing outside, it gets stuck on their hands, they're ingesting it. My research advisors and I have three main points to make today, and the first is testing is important of soils and distributing that information. Two, to also include private residences in the areas that we're testing. And finally, to look at solutions in terms of supporting bringing in clean soil to cover those areas. So as was just mentioned, soils can be highly variable in, in lead levels. It can be really difficult to, t to tell where there's been old soil that maybe has accumulated all that history of pollution where lead has been built up and it, the lead stays in that soil, right? It doesn't go away. Um, and, where nor, or, and to tell the difference between that old soil and where new soil has been brought in, it's clean. So we really need to test to find out, to highlight that 
from our testing over the last year, we tested over 60 homes in northern Brooklyn and found that 80% of those samples were above the restricted residential limit for, soil, for lead in soils and almost 50% exceeded that commercial limit of 1,000 ppm of lead in soils. And comparing that to public soils, only 16% exceeded that um, 400, the re restricted residential, and only 2% exceeded the commercial limit. So that brings me to my point two, which is looking at these residential backyards as well. A lot of, you know, brownstones, if we're thinking about them, they're hard to access, so maybe there's been no new soil brought in. Um, but when we're seeing that over 75% of those samples have, homes have at least one sample over the commercial limit of 1,000, then that's cause for concern for health and cause to test. We know New York City can do, do this because they offer free water testing already for residents through 311. So I would propose that a free soil testing kit similar to the water testing kit be um, made available to residents, anyone who lives there. Testing for soil is actually cheaper than testing for water. So in terms of resources, this really could be done with an XRF instrument as has been mentioned. And finally, to wrap things up, you know, there are great initiatives such as through the Mayor's Office of Environmental Remediation that look at um, the Pure Soil Program, that look at bringing in clean soil for excavated from construction areas, bringing it into parks and residences, and to support these programs so that we can apply it to protect our children. Thank you. Thank you, and I, I want to acknowledge that Councilmember Casa Constantinidis, who chairs the Environmental Committee, has actually been an advocate of the provision of of, of um, home soil testing kits, analogous to what we offer for water testing. Do, do you or do any of the panelists know the cost of one of those kits? Of the water, of the soil testing? Soil test? testing, yes. Well, I mean, I know USI charges $10 for a kit, but once the, the large cost is the XRF unit, and once you have that unit measuring an individual time, sample can take up to 30 seconds or a minute. But is it logistically and economically feasible to, to send the kit to a private homeowner in New York City for them to administer themselves? Well, they would collect the sample and submit, send the soil sample back, Understood. which is exactly what they okay. do with yeah. the water test. And, and so, so the collection uh, kit is fairly inexpensive and easy to use? It could be as simple as collecting soil in, your, in a plastic Ziploc bag and, and, and sending it to yeah. the city. And we hear you loud and clear that a single sample is not sufficient. Right. Um, right. Mm -hmm. But uh, at any rate, uh, it could be done by a homeowner if the city were to facilitate mm -hmm. provision of the kits. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Important point. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for providing us with this opportunity to comment on intro 420 and 422. My name is Sarah Pearl Eggendorf, and I'm a PhD student at the City University of New York's Graduate Center, Advanced Science Research Center, and Brooklyn College. Today I'm speaking on behalf of the Urban Soils Lab at Brooklyn College, led by Dr. Joshua Chang, Professor of Environmental Geochemistry and Urban Soils. Our lab has conducted extensive research on soil lead for over 10 years and has published one dozen peer-reviewed research articles, mainly on the topic of soil lead contamination in New York City. First of all, we would like to applaud the initiative by the council members to introduce legislation on soil lead. Certainly, paint and water are important exposure mechanisms, but we firmly, contest that, firmly contend that soil is also an important exposure pathway. Uh, this is a historical and positive first step in addressing many serious health hazards associated with lead in soils. This is a nationwide and global issue, and collective, concerted efforts are urgently needed to address the dangers of soil lead that put all urban residents, particularly children, and particularly people from low-income communities of color, at risk. Based on findings from our research, as well as the research of many others, soil lead contamination in New York City is pervasive. Remediating every contaminated space will be a daunting task, um, but uh, it is therefore critical to define priorities for remediation and set appropriate thresholds for different land uses. There are also programs that have already been mentioned, like the Pure Soil and Clean Soil Bank program, led by the New York City Mayor's Office of Environmental Remediation, that can provide materials to cover contaminated soils. 
Regardless of what remediation methods are selected, clear standards for these testing and remediation protocols should be developed very clearly and carefully in order to set regulations. It is also imperative to fund the Department of Parks and Recreation and the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene for testing and publishing of results. Publication of testing results should be done in ways that are accessible beyond the internet, and this can be done in many ways, such as reporting to community gardeners, community boards, council members, etc. Of utmost concern is the potential for closing public parks or community gardens if contaminants are found and resources are not available to remediate them. These spaces provide invaluable health, social, cultural, community, and environmental benefits, even in the midst of legacy contaminants. We implore the city to allocate resources for soil testing or screening with XRF, publishing results, and remediation. We want to bring your attention to another important complexity, which was mentioned previously about the heterogeneity of soil. So I'm going to skip that, and I'll submit the full testimony. And I want to end by saying that we are holding uh, we've been convening a coalition that we call the Legacy Led Coalition for over two years, meeting monthly, and we're holding a town hall meeting at Brooklyn College on October 19th. Um, so we welcome you all to join us and spread the word. We'll be uh, honoring and learning from the work of Dr. Howard Milkey from Tulane University in New Orleans, who is one of the first researchers to identify lead in soil as a risk to human health. So thank you so much, and we look forward to being in touch about this uh, proposed legislation with you. Thank you very much. Um, we have a, a question from Councilmember Kalman Yeager from Brooklyn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is for our geochemist. That's you right, one off the left. No, oh, you're all geochemists. Oh, okay, all the yeah. the one right before the last one, right there. Yeah. Okay, you said you tested uh, in northern Brooklyn, exclusively yeah. in northern Brooklyn. Yes, we started working in the backyards in northern Brooklyn. How many homes did you test in northern Brooklyn? 63. 63. And of the 63 homes in northern Brooklyn that you tested, 80% of those tested positive. So 80% of the samples. We collected five samples per home. Is it fair to say based on an 80% positive uh, report of 63 homes in one neighborhood in New York City that we should create a policy that covers the entirety of New York City? I think that's why we're proposing to expand the testing, because we can only, from our data currently, speak towards that neighborhood. But we've identified enough of a cause for concern that we think we should be looking more what broadly. Used to be, what, what, what predominant uh, uh, field of enterprise used to be in northern Brooklyn, to your knowledge? A lot. <laughs> um, we know it, it was a very highly industrial area. They had a Navy yard there where they built ships. And, As, and a lot of factories, and so it's probably different than my neighborhood, Midwood, which up until about 100 years ago was farmland, and Councilman but, Levine's neighborhood, but, but Uptown even, Manhattan, which was also farmland until about 100, 150 years ago, and Councilman Carnegie's neighborhood, which was also farmland until about 150 years ago. My, my previously farmland uh, backyard in Crown Heights has 2,000 parts per million of lead. Okay. And how many homes did you test in Crown Heights? So there have been numerous samples, I think around 1,500 sent to the lab at Brooklyn College. And there is a paper published on this. So I'd be happy to share those results with you. Do you have the percentage of those 1,500 that were tested, that tested positive? Paper? Yeah. Did you get those? So, so from the Cheng 2012, 15 soil science paper, 68% of backyard soil samples that were submitted were above this 400 residential. And that was across the. Um, across the city, and they have a nice map showing different regions and... So 68% citywide? Yes. Of those samples, of sample sent homeowners in. submitted. Mm -hmm. So that's not necessarily representative either because that's a self-selected sample. Correct. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay. All right. Just want to make sure that we understand what yeah. we're talking about mm -hmm. that when we're trying to create a policy that may involve the city of New York deciding that they're going to send home testing kits that may cost $10, and then there's obviously an additional cost involved in testing the result of those kits and who knows how much that can cost that you know before we shoot that net far and wide we'd be sure that we know exactly what we're talking about mm -hmm. yeah. right yeah. well and that's why we advocate testing to that's find what out what 
so, well, so we can you find out. a bigger study, you don't advocate necessarily sending out testing kits to every single home in the city of New York, right? More research, more data. We got to do more testing. The, the, their pop, the population study that they're talking about also is proportionally skewed towards Brooklyn because a lot of the folks who were sending it to Brooklyn College, that's, that ended up being right. most of the folks. I mean, in one but, case, proportionally but, skewed to northern Brooklyn, which yeah. I don't even know what the, uh, my definition of northern Brooklyn yeah. may be different than your definition of northern Brooklyn. Um, I'm assuming it's near where you live and thereabouts, so it's 63 yeah. homes, right? In Which is why Brooklyn. we need more testing. Okay. Right. Well, and yeah. agree that these are important. I don't want to belabor the. I don't want to belabor the point. I think I got you. I think you got me on this. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Councilman Yeager, and we are thank this panel for a very important contribution. We have our final panel, which will thank consist you. of Fran Agnon from the National Wildlife Federation, Mary Ann Rothman from the Council of New York Cooperatives and Condominiums. Arthur Clock from Local One Plumbers Union, Christine Appa, New York Lawyers for the Public Interest, aka NILPI, Benjamin Anderson from the Children's Defense Fund, oh, this is a lot of people, Jill Samuels from Montefiore Medical Center, Dr. Lenora Fulani from All Souls All Stars Project. Jackson Fisher Ward from Assemblymember Harvey Epstein's office. <laughs> okay, sure. Come on up. Okay, so do we have enough seats for everybody? One, two, three. Hello. Excellent. Please kick it off. Hello there. Um, I first want to thank the council for hearing my testimony. Um, I'm very grateful to live in a city where our local representatives are examining and setting forward really impressive groundwork for such ex expansive legislation to protect our children, contact with lead in all areas. Um, but today I'll be focusing on supporting the bill uh, for, uh, 420A regarding testing lead in soil. Um, my name is Fran Agnone and I'm a uh, a representative of and employee of the National Wildlife Federation, a national education and outreach organization with 501c3 status that encourages outdoor play and environmental stewardship activities. This means we ask our children um, to be in soil, to get dirty. So you can understand how complicated this is working as an environmental education educator in North Brooklyn in the community of Greenpoint where levels have been coming back at numbers that have been scary to families who don't know what these numbers mean. So we've been working very closely with the Legacy of Lead group and the researchers to figure out how to, um, how to shed light on this to people who want their kids to play outside. And as an employee of the National Wildlife Federation, we believe that how outdoor play is essential for healthy development of our children, especially in the city that's starved for green space. Um, so last year I worked with a coalition of parents from the elementary school. I, I work in, in PS1 10K um, to determine what kind of messaging and best practice parents need to hear to know about lead being in soil in the first place and how to take some necessary precaution. Um, I've included samples of these postcards and the language um, in my testimony, but I also have those in Polish and Spanish if anyone is interested. Um, the languages our community speaks. Um, and so I also want to add in that um, we collected samples, um, just as you're asking to, from community members, and we provide. They we all we asked was that they brought it in on a Ziploc bag. We mailed it or brought it directly to the Urban Soils Institute, and each test cost ten dollars, and it gave them at least an understanding of what was in their backyard or in their park if they wanted to collect from a park. Um, we had um, over a hundred people participate. Um, so after reviewing the bill's language, I just want to reiterate that most people know about lead in the water and in paint, but lead in soil is not as communicated or understood. Um, and so we're advocating that um, there be a public outreach um, and education campaign with this bill. So 
caregivers of young children know what to do when it comes, things like washing their hands and um, changing their clothes if they got really dirty outside. Really simple precautions, but we also want more research to know what's going on. Um, so thank you for your time, and I'm happy to help in any way from working directly with those communities if I can shed any light to share those insights with you all. Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you. Hi, my name is Arthur Clark. I'm the Director of Training for Plumbers Local 1 in New York City. Uh, I want to thank everybody here uh, from the Council for holding these hearings on uh, lead awareness, very important. Um, lead is a common metal found in uh, living areas, as we've been hearing, and it's a solid, right? But what I'm here to talk about is water, and uh, you know, this, this lead, if ingested, obviously this is the problem. Uh, solids might be ingested, but when uh, lead in drinking water, that's a different thing. It is definitely going to be ingested, okay? So the difference there is when we are talking about water, if there's lead contamination in that water, where did it come from? So it comes primarily from materials inside the building. Many old, older buildings have lead service lines or have piped throughout with lead-bearing solder. Uh, these are the most likely sources. The DEP water is not the issue. I was shocked to hear it said five times how wonderful the water is when it leaves upstate. We know that. Uh, the issue is what happens once uh, we get between the DEP and the baby formula. That's when the lead is a problem inside the building, right? Um, when there's lead in your drinking water, it's well hidden. It's an ever-present danger. Lead-contaminated drinking water does not smell, taste, or look contaminated. It looks fine. The ingestion is an everyday occurrence, and the lead builds up in the body quietly over time. So you could be drinking lead-contaminated water for 20 years or 30 years, and you don't know. Um, buildings that were constructed prior to 1986 are most likely to contain lead-bearing solders and piping. Uh, we saw how widespread this problem is when they were uh, forced by the state to do testing in schools. They found 1,165 drinking water outlets in public schools that were discharging water that was contaminated with lead. Um, advising people to run the faucet for a minute. This is something I heard here today. Run the faucet for a minute. It'll be fine. That's not scientific. How far away am I from the source? Am I on the 14th floor? Am I on the first floor? Run the water for a minute? Another gentleman, a, a city government official, said stick your hand under the faucet. If it feels cool, it's safe to drink. This is not science. This is nonsense. Um, we're in favor of all these bills. I'm going to jump ahead. Uh, filtration systems, these are temporary fixes. These are not permanent fixes. They even raise other problems. They can cause, they can be harboring for Legionella. So, Filtration is not the answer. The only permanent solution is get the lead out and install lead-free products in their place. Um, a couple of ideas. Uh, sampling and testing are different things. We recommend that all water sampling be done by a licensed master plumber following prescribed and valid sampling procedures. This will guarantee the sampling is conducted by a professional with the expertise and training required to follow a prescribed valid procedure and to act responsibly in pursuing that critical safety work. Where, where does the water go? Someone has to take it there, right? Um, second, recommended that mandating testing should cover a lot more buildings than just uh, a, a one type of building. Third, we highly recommend that annual building water testing and reporting uh, using detailed sampling procedures that would be followed uh, to determine uh, the, the problems according to a management plan that the building would have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that important testimony. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jill Samuels. I'm the program administrator for the Lead Poisoning Prevention and Treatment Program at the Children's Hospital at Montefiore Medical Center. Um, I'm very happy to be here. I'm happy that the council is trying to make the laws more effective so that children are not poisoned. We average at least three children a week newly poisoned with lead. Okay, that's an unacceptable number. Um, in your facility alone? In our in facility network. alone. Right. We also get consult consultation calls from other physicians in the city and in other areas about lead poisoning where they monitor the children. So there are a lot more children than we're looking at. Um, this is totally unacceptable, especially because this is our future generation that we're talking about that's going to be in control and they are being poisoned and their lives are being changed. So I'm in support of the council trying to do what you're doing, but we need to make sure that enforcement happens. 
because we can put all the laws on the books that we can. But if, if they're not being enforced and the kids are continuing to be poisoned, then it's not effective. Thank you. It's really helpful to hear from the perspective of a practitioner. And is it fair to say that your pediatricians, when they do perform physicals, um, we're not, I'm not a pediatrician, I'm the administrator. We do have a licensed pediatrician, that's the director of our program, and we are not a testing program. We are a referral program for treatment, but we also try to do prevention by education. We're also trying to get the testing levels of children up by talking to the healthcare providers to try to let them know that they are supposed to be testing at the ages of one and two. So, Thank you. Oh, the other thing is we have a safe house with six, six apartments for families to come to if they don't have anywhere to go while the abatement is being done. I, I appreciate that. Um, I did want to go back to Mr. Clock just for one moment, please. Um, we are looking at the water fountains and parks, um, yes. which were ma mainly installed um, decades ago and sometimes uh, in the Robert Moses era and before. Um, can you comment on your sense of the prevalence of, of lead, uh, either in the piping or the solder, in the park system? Well, it, it, you know, there are people who, who are working in these areas and certainly could comment on it who work in the parks department. But I will tell you that um, the, the reason for using lead and why so many service pipes are made of lead is because of the flexibility. So if there was a concern of, of rigidity being a problem, lead would be used because it could, it could bend without breaking. So um, in, the, in the parks, you would have areas where there would be concerns like that, so it, it would be worth looking into. Um, the other thing I would say is that, that the idea of putting filters on uh, water drinking fountains in parks is a terrible idea because of uh, what, I, what I briefly mentioned before, and this can be corroborated by others. You put a filter, it collects sediments, the sediments create a biofilm, Legionella comes to live in the biofilm. When you drink from a water fountain, there's an aspirating aspect to this. You, 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 draw, you draw it in. If Legionella gets into your lungs, that's how it happens. Also, the temperature. You put a water filter outdoors in the sun in a, in a drinking fountain, the temperature's going to really climb. That's when Legionella happens. They love that. Thank you. Very, very important clarification. Please. Yeah. Can I just add one more thing? Yes. Um, we do not see children poisoned by soil. So we have not had a case where a child has been poisoned by soil. I just wanted to add that. And have you had cases where the child's been poisoned by water? No, it's been mainly paint and also other products uh, that it, aren't regulated. Is it possible that in some cases we can't identify the source definitively? Yes. It's also possible there could be multiple sources. Yes. Thank you. Hi, greetings. Um, thank you to the members of the City Council and your staff gathered here. My name is Christine Appa, and I'm a senior staff attorney at New York Lawyers for the Public Interest. I work in the Environmental Justice Program at NILPI. And New York Lawyers for the Public Interest is a civil rights and social justice organization that was founded 40 years ago. We work around three core areas of environmental justice, health justice, and disability justice. And this issue that we're discussing here today actually touches all of our, all of our program areas. It's a public health crisis as well as a civil rights issue. And as such, we work in coalition to research and lobby for stronger laws and greater accountability for the current laws on the books. Thank you for your continued attention to this matter, and we really appreciate all the legislative proposals that have been put forward. We all understand that lead is a neurotoxin and that no level is safe, and that lead poisoning is a totally preventable disease affecting children, particularly children of color and children from homes with lower incomes. And NILPI is committed to eliminating the environmental health hazards of lead exposure. And as we review the laws, the new laws that are proposed today, we want to stress the importance of enforcing the laws that are already on the books. As the speaker stated, and as many of my colleagues and many members of the public have stated, that enforcement and remediation is the main and key effort. 
Lead paint is the primary source of lead exposure. However, lead in the body is cumulative, so even small amounts of lead from soil or water, garden soil, and consumer products can have a lasting effect. Part of the environmental justice movement, a lot of the research is focused on cumulative effects. We want to take it as um, a situation where we sometimes may not be able to pinpoint the exact source, but it's important that a lot of these issues have been raised that we can look into and continue researching. I would like to express some support, particularly for the area that I work on in Nilby, which is children's environmental health, for the daycare proposals. We support increasing testing from not testing of the water and daycares, not from every five years, but to every year annually, and to test according to the public health law 1110 from the state, which has um, given us a parameters for testing for lead in school water. We want to broaden the scope of covered facilities, particularly to include all daycares, because we don't want children who are taking, being taken care of in smaller facilities to be left out. Ultimately, we want to protect all family members and pregnant women as well. We want to refocus on proactivity. We don't want the flag to be the child's lead test. We don't want to look into the eyes of another family member and say, well, we could have helped your child, and now we're going to see what possibly was the cause. We can get proactive and not use lead results, positive lead results in the, chil in the child as, the, as the, um, the marker for action. We can, we can possibly get a lot more and save a lot more children. Thank you for your time. Thank you, and, and um, we appreciate NILPI's contribution to this uh, critical report on the enforcement issue uh, on housing, on lead paint and housing. Could you just clarify those child care centers which you feel we're not covering? Uh, sure. I, I didn't catch that. Well, the city and the state all have regulatory powers over daycares, and they segment them depending on the number of children that are enrolled and they separate them based on whether or not it's like a commercial facility or someone's home. Now, many of the proposals put forth would um, provide protections for children who are enrolled in daycares with more than seven children. And then children who have, um, children enrolled in daycares with less than seven children tend to be um, at sites that are maybe home-based daycares. Now, there are separate um, issues related to that, and there was some concern about possibly preemption issues, but under the state's, um, under the state law, the city, the uh, states are, the state is allowed to regulate for environmental hazards, and the city also in the health code, Article 47, has the power to create and, and regulate the check for environmental hazards. In, in I appreciate that clarification. We could also simultaneously work with our partners at the state level maybe on getting state legislation to, to parallel this, but very important point. Thank you. Welcome. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Ben Anderson. I am the uh, Poverty and Health Policy uh, Director at the Children's Defense Fund New York. Uh, I'm relatively new uh, in that role, so uh, it's my first time testifying before you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I've submitted written testimony that covers all of the issues that we would like you to consider uh, as you're evaluating the introduced legislation. Uh, so I'd like to focus my comments now uh, on responding to some of the testimony from the Department of Health. Um, we were pleased to hear that uh, the Department of Health will take additional steps to match birth records with blood testing records uh, to get more children tested. Uh, however, we think that this approach uh, still doesn't quite get at what is the key to uh, uh, ending lead poisoning in New York City, and, and that is prevention. Um, in order to get to Vision Zero, um, we need to improve uh, our prevention efforts, and that's why, uh, as we recommend uh, in our written testimony, uh, using the birth records to trigger uh, an inspection um, rather than uh, determining whether or not uh, children have uh, had their blood tests yet. Um, we think that uh, more parents uh, need to be aware of the testing options available uh, as soon as possible, uh, and therefore by using the birth records to uh, initiate an inspection request. Uh, hopefully you can get to those children before they're doing the hand-to-mouth activities uh, and crawling around on the floor. Um, a, a second issue I would like to uh, address uh, is the landlord-initiated uh, investigation under Local Law 1. Um, the 
problem with this process, uh, again, uh, is in certain cases it can start too late uh, as it requires the family to file a notice uh, by February 15th. Uh, as we all know, just from common sense, there are a number of children who are born after February 15th. Uh, and uh, when it comes to those children, uh, the hand to mouth activity starts uh, weeks after birth. Uh, and many of those children will begin crawling uh, within six months. So if you wait until uh, the following calendar year uh, to have the landlord send out the notices, then request the inspections, again, you'll be missing uh, some of those children and it may already be uh, too late. Uh, so what we would suggest is allowing uh, parents uh, to request those inspections uh, year round, particularly uh, if they are pregnant uh, or thinking of becoming pregnant. Um, and finally, uh, I'd like to uh, address uh, some of the responses regarding uh, predictive uh, modeling, uh, if I may, uh, briefly. Um, we think that uh, the point of uh, notifying uh, OBGYNs uh, regarding uh, high-risk areas uh, throughout the city uh, is not to uh, determine uh, whether pregnant women may be at risk, but it is to identify whether or not the newborn children who will be born and perhaps residing at those locations uh, may be moving into a, a dwelling uh, that's at risk. Uh, I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Yes, and I completely agree with you on that. Um, and thank you for raising that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Joel And your time is up. Okay. Just kidding. <laughs> Joel Kupferman, New York Environmental Law and Justice Project. Environmental Justice Committee of the National Lawyers Guild and Council to Smith Houses, which is probably the closest NYCHA houses, basically spitting distance mm -hmm. from here. We testified about the conditions at Smith Houses in 2001 after 9-11. Um, similar <laughs> setup. We basically did some testing, and there was a big fight to show how bad the World Trade Center dust was here. It was, a, 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 I would say, a learning curve and a lot of denial. I wish I had the aspiration, the, um, the optimism that a lot of people here have about this, uh, the bills that are presented. I think in some ways it's a gift to the, to, the, to the people that are controlling the lead and having the lead. I have I've litigated cases. The first thing that a bad landlord or an owner of a property does is show that there's minimal testing that was done, and all these agencies, DOH, DEC, um, DEP, basically approved that testing and didn't challenge it. Do you not leave laying enough prescriptions in terms of, of what to be tested? There's EPA standards and there's DEC, DEC standards in terms of soil testing that should be incorporated um, and, and listed. Um, at Smith Houses, we had a problem with a $56 million rebuild from Hurricane Sandy. It was federal money that went to the state to the city. By working on the roofs, which is happening all around the city, they actually opened up the roofs to the ceilings, lead and asbestos came down. We call 311, we try to bring in the health department. The health department told us they don't have jurisdiction over NYCHA housing, which is totally wrong. We made the complaint um, and then we made we decided to do testing on the outside because there's trenching going on to, to put the utility lines in post Sandy. This is federal money that's being spent. That soil is coming up and going out into the neighborhood, into the past, and into the people's homes. I think it's important to point out that soil dust doesn't just remain in the dust, it gets carried in into the, into the houses and we have proof um, of a lot of articles on that. We decided to test the soil, came up with lead, and then we sent my geologist intern in. We tested in the tree well in the daycare center and came up with 85 parts per million of arsenic. That's at least eight times higher than the one state level. It's 85 times the lower level. We went back to the health department. The health department said they won't test because it's not their jurisdiction. It's ironic that that arsenic probably comes from rat poison that the health department put down, okay? We had to push the, the daycare center to not let the kids put their hands into the tree well where that arsenic is, and they said, don't worry, we'll cover it up 
and we'll send them to the daycare, the um, playground that's, that's next door. Uh, just give me two, one more minute. Okay. That playground had a big sign that says they're putting down Roundup in that playground. So we took the kids from, from, from facing arsenic and lead and put them into, into, um, into a Roundup infested um, playground. There's no, there's no need to put that, that arsenic down. $280 million lawsuit was won in California two, three weeks ago. There's hundreds of lawyers lining up to take those cases, those toxic tort cases, and they're gonna be definitely suing the city because the city parks department refuses to stop using cryophosphate. How that comes back to lead, the New York City Health Department survey of all the pesticides that were used in 2016 states that when Roundup hits um, soils with heavy metals, including lead, it's even worse, it's more toxic. So okay. part of the problem we have is that we have this 311, the city health department does not answer 311 um, things from, from, whatever, um, from NYCHA residents. And the second thing is we should definitely institute, in terms of enforcement, the fines aren't working. In 2014, there was 531,000 ECB violations. $200 million has been uncollected by DEP and $200 million collected from the health department. And, and part of the do, problem- We do need to wrap up only because we're about to lose the room, but okay. can you quickly wrap up? Okay, what I wanna say is that we have to look at, at this, the new um, Roundup problem, okay? We definitely need more soil testing, but moreover in NYCHA, when we found this, we could not get one department to come in and do testing. And I'm, I'm also claiming that we shouldn't just test for lead. When we go out and they test for soils, it's a few dollars more from the Soil Institute to test for other metals. We have arsenic and you know, other, other materials there. And also, the city, in terms of enforcement, has the bad actor policy. We, we okay. find these we, people we, we a little bit, we, but we, uh, the city is still giving a lot of leases to those bad landowners. We understand, and we've done, and we'll do other hearings on, on other soil issues. I've done one in the Parks Committee on Roundup. It's a very serious matter, which we care a lot about. There's an evening event here that I have to start setting up for shortly. I do want to thank this panel for an outstanding contribution and for everybody who took part in this historic hearing uh, of great importance to the city. I especially want to thank my co-chair, Robert Cornegie and Costa Constantinides. Um, actually, uh, if, if either of my co-chairs would like to make a final statement, uh, okay. Mm -hmm. and, and a special shout out to Carmen Yeager, council member from Brooklyn who uh, joined us for this uh, important public testimony. Thank you very much. Yeah.